Hello, everyone. Audiobook Collection here. The upcoming audiobook is a special dedication to one of our incredible Patreon supporters. If you're interested in making your own personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. You can find the link to my Patreon account in the video description below. Your support means the world, and I'm thankful for you joining me on this thrilling audiobook journey. Chapter 26, CH3, 26, Specimen Mass Abduction. During the next two days, Mikhail spent two hours after waking up doing his psychic routine and then went downstairs to have breakfast. Afterward, he would do his stretching and body training exercises before continuing his exploration. He would return four to five hours later for lunch and spend the rest of the day with his parents. Before sleeping he would do his stretches and body training exercises once more and allocate an hour for another session of psychic training. As for the time he spent with his parents. On the first day, he asked his father how to swim, which Edward demonstrated to Mikhail using their pond and at the end of the second day, he surprised his father by being able to more or less swim slash float without aid. His father called him a natural and his mother said no one would have believed them if she had not filmed the whole thing. They were happy that they could brag, sorry, they were happy their son learned how to swim so fast. As far as his exploration was concerned, by the end of the first day, he had superficially gone over the whole northern part, creating a rough mental map. He found no noteworthy Pokemon but he did find black apricorns. He noted that the earth beneath the apricorn trees was slightly darker than that of its surroundings. Name, black apricorn. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition and a mix of energies. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical training. Can be used to produce various poke balls. It was raised to low quality like the materials before and other than that he found nothing new. Maybe he would discover things he had overlooked when he combed through it but he decided to go over all areas first before carefully combing through them. Which was why he went to the northwestern area on the second day. He managed to go over about 50% of the area. There was a stream going through the northwestern area, which hindered his exploration efforts a bit but it still was a fruitful trip. He managed to find two new materials and a new berry type. All three materials were successfully upgraded to low quality. Name, aquamarine. Type, water. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, a piece of stone that contains water energy. Can be used as a supplement to help water type Pokemon. This one was a lucky find by the stream. He was sure he could use it during future experiments on rock types as well. Name, rich earth. Type, ground. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, a batch of earth that is rich in ground type energy. Can be used as a supplement to help ground type Pokemon. This one he found in a place where the trees were especially vibrant. He was at first confused why they were so vibrant despite being nothing special but quickly found out that the earth they grew on was the reason for their vibrancy. Name, tomato berry. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition and plant energy. Can be eaten as food, causes slight feelings of closeness and lethargy. He found the berry tree of this one, all alone hidden between two big boulders. After seeing its status and noting the difference between the games and reality, he looked up more details on the berry. He found out that the reason for the feeling of slight closeness was a component that caused the body to release a bit of oxytocin, the so-called love hormone and the lethargy was caused by something causing the release of endorphins, causing the body to feel like it had a short workout session. This information surprised him with how much sense it made and he liked the real effects more than those of the games. Here the berry simply made the Pokemon wanting to rest for a slight increase in closeness, instead of weakening them like in the games. He was happy with what he had accomplished and found during these two days. Today was Kyode, meaning it was the weekend once more. After doing his morning routine Mikhail went downstairs and they had breakfast. After breakfast, they talked about where they should head for their outing. Mikhail who wanted more Magi Carp so he could breed them for his specimen production line, couldn't think of something to make that sound nicer, wanted to go to Lake Hope. His parents acceded to his request and once they were ready they drove there. Mikhail, who had not forgotten to ask his mother to bring along swimming trunks, changed into them and asked for permission to enter the water. After he received their consent, he ran into the lake. He saw how his mother's polywhirl rivers followed him into the water but kept his distance. Mikhail had already gotten used to having a tail and after what he witnessed during his solo trips he was thankful for the added security. So, ignoring his nearby guardian Mikhail swam a bit further out. He planned to use his improved berries to lure in tons of magi carp, which he would then check using his psychic skill. In case he found a worthy specimen he would abduct it into his van, sorry, into his space adding it to his pond. A single magi carp going missing amongst so many others would not stand out much. Besides, he was not touching them, so, no one would think he had anything to do with it, even if someone saw something, but he doubted anyone would notice what was happening. As for why Magi Carp kept gathering near him, maybe they were attracted by his handsome face. He planned to repeat this multiple times at different locations, which would hopefully result in a bountiful harvest at the end of their trip. After he was 15 meters out, he heard his mother shouting, Honey, don't go too far out and don't leave this section of the lake. Rivers is going to remind you if you swim too far. Don't forget to occasionally return to drink some water. Okay, mommy. Mikhail shouted back, before swimming further out until he was about 60 meters away from the shore. 
He stopped there and took out three citrus berries from his space and broke them into two to three parts, before throwing them into the water hoping its juice or movement would manage to attract some magi carp. He had waited for barely one minute before the first magi carp swam over. Seeing his plan succeed Mikhail proceeded to occasionally take out an oron berry or two amidst the growing swarm of magi carp. As long as it was within his range he could take things out, just like he took them in. After counting more than 10 magi carp he began checking them before focusing on the new arrivals. He stopped supplying new berries after about 12 minutes and roughly 3 minutes later the swarm had dispersed. He had checked around 120 magi carp during these 15 minutes, of which he was sure that some he had probably checked twice. Still, this was a pretty good number, even if he had not managed to find one he wanted to take in. He had seen one or two light yellow ones but he was determined to only accept those with yellow potential or better this time around. This was just the first round and he was optimistic about his chances. He had more than enough time and berries for his undertaking. He did not believe that he would be unable to lure out some good magi carp. There had to be some good ones amongst the tens of thousands of magi carp living in Lake Hope. Mikhail had used 3 citrus and 30 oron berries during the first attempt, which he could afford without any problems. He distanced himself from the first location by about 100 meters before repeating the process. Two minutes into the second try he hit the jackpot. The magi carp he just checked turned out to be a male with deep yellow potential. Mikhail instantly released four oron berries simultaneously, causing the magi carp that had gathered to frantically surge forward. Using this he poke napped the magi carp he had kept his telekinetic touch on. Feeling a bit of pity towards his freshly abducted breeding fish, he tossed a citrus berry towards it, after it was relocated into his pond, before focusing back on the swarm in front of him. Mikhail continued checking out the magi carp for his next victim. Twelve minutes after the start of the second round he stopped supplying berries once more. He managed to find the second lucky fish amongst the dispersing magi carp, swimming away sadly. Don't ask him how he knew that it felt sad, he just did. The magi carp was surprisingly expressive, you had to see it to believe it. Anyway, the second one was a treasure. He felt that it was his obligation to make sure the magi carp did not stay sad, especially seeing the light color of its scales indicating its young age. So out of the goodness of his heart, he helped the poor Pokemon into his space, the fact that it had light green potential had nothing to do with it, he swears by Mew. Species, Magi Carp. Gender, Female. Type, Water. Potential, Light Green. Stage, Low, Iron Stage. Genetic Variation, None. Abilities, Swift Swim, Rattled. Talents, None. Affinities, Water. He could not wait to see its upgraded potential, so he ignored the rest of the still dispersing Magi Carp and looked into his space. The male one he had put in first had its potential increased to light green bordering green. The boost was, apparently, not enough for a two-grade increase, which meant the magi carp probably had barely qualified for deep yellow potential before. Still, this was now, except for the new female magi carp, the magi carp with the best potential he currently had. He looked at the info of his new treasure. Species, magi carp. Gender, female. Type, water. Potential, deep green. Stage, low, iron stage. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, swift swim, rattled. Talents, none. Affinities, water. And what for a treasure it was. Not only had her potential increased to deep green, but there was a single thin light blue line going through it. While this did not mean her potential was bordering light blue, it showed that she had the tip of her fin in it. Just she alone had made this trip worth it. Everything after this was just the cherry on top. It would naturally be awesome if he could find another one like this or better, but he did not think he had the luck his parents possessed. Still, he did not want to sound ungrateful, seeing that he had found a gem with such good potential, lest he provokes those responsible for luck. Happy with the result he provided the female magi carp with a citrus berry or two and threw some oron berries into the pond for the others. After that, he focused back on the outside. Mikhail saw that all magi carps were gone and decided to change locations once again. The next two tries attracted no magi carp that fulfilled his requirements causing Mikhail to feel slightly disappointed. For his fifth try, he decided to return to the first location and swim in the opposite direction. After putting a bit of a distance between the first location and himself, he began the fifth round. He managed to find a total of three more magi carp with yellow potential during the fifth, sixth, and seventh rounds. One male in the fifth round. One male and female during the seventh round. The sixth round came up empty. After checking their status, after the upgrade, he saw that one of the males only achieved deep yellow and the other two had light green potential. Once he was done with the checkup Mikhail returned to his parents' side. He had spent nearly two hours for these seven rounds and he felt thirsty, as well as a bit fatigued. During all this time he had not seen a single trace of his mother's poly whirl, its ability to stay inconspicuous impressed him. He spent one hour relaxing by his parents' side before returning to the water to resume his poke napping efforts. This time he went a little further out to avoid attracting the same magi carp and began his eighth round. He was surprisingly lucky enough to find three deep yellow and two yellow potential magi carp. Mikhail honestly felt a bit dumbfounded. He had looked through more than 1,400 magi carp during his first session and only managed to find a total of five magi carp that fulfilled his requirements. But now, after having spent one hour relaxing by the side of his parents, 
he managed to find five magi carp that did this during the first round of the second session. Could luck really rub off on someone, or was someone trying to mess with him, no matter which one it was, he felt thankful. This brought him closer to his goal so he had no reason to complain. He even hoped that he kept being this lucky. Well, he didn't. He managed to find one magi carp with yellow potential during the ninth round but the 10th and 11th rounds turned out bare. He did find another deep yellow potential magi carp during the 12th round, but he was thinking about stopping for the day. In the end, he decided to do another two attempts before stopping. He began the 13th round with three citrus berries as well before deciding to add two lepa berries. His luck seemed to have returned because three minutes in he managed to find another jewel among the magi carp. Species, magi carp. Gender, male. Type, water. Potential, green. Stage, mid, iron stage. Genetic variation, abilities, talents, affinities. This time he could not see the full status screen of the magi carp meaning it was stronger than him, but that was okay. He snatched the magi carp into his space and inspected his new status. Unfortunately, its potential did not increase to light blue but deep green. It had quite a few light blue lines going through it, showing that he was bordering the light blue potential but was evidently missing the last push. He gave out another round of berries to those that were hungry and focused back outside. After he abducted this one he seemed to have used up all his remaining luck, because for the rest of the 13th round and the whole 14th round he found no other magi carp that fulfilled his requirement. Accepting the situation Mikhail returned to his parents' side once more. He was overall supremely satisfied with his haul. He had spent about 4 hours, 42 citrus berries, 5 lepa berries, as well as 520 plus oron berries, and checked more than 3000 magi carp to seize 13 magi carp that fit his requirement, including 2 with light green and green potential respectively. This was before their potential was upgraded. All in all, it could be considered a huge success and his expenditure could be seen as negligible. He spent the rest of the day, after feeding the NATO, just spending time with his parents. Before he went to sleep that night he came to a decision concerning the NATO and the ways he could use him. After making his choice, he fell asleep content with how the day went. The poll ends on Sunday evening, so those that want to participate in deciding which type is going to win please head to my Patreon to vote. You don't have to become a patron to vote, the poll is public. Patreon.com slash Israel 93, Chapter 27, CH4, 27, First Time in Space and Start of First Experiment. The first thing Mikhail did once he woke up, was to check his space to see if NATO was awake. He decided yesterday to use NATO as his lookout. Well, at least that was the plan. He still had to ask NATO if he would do it. Besides Mikhail was assuming that NATO could sense people because of his psychic type but he did not know what his sensing range was. Once he saw that NATO was already awake, Mikhail swiftly took NATO out of his space. Nato looked around confused by the sudden scenery change. Sorry, I should have warned you before taking you out. Nato, I have a few questions and a possible request for you. Mikhail said to Nato, who just conveyed to him to go on. Can you sense other people and Pokemon? If so, how big is your sensing range? N.A. Nato. Nato transmitted feelings of agreement as well as an uncertain vastness. So, you can sense others and your sensing range is big, but you're not sure how big or if it is big enough for me. Nato simply nodded. That's great. You have probably seen the size of our house while entering my room from the window. Could your senses cover the whole house? Tuesday NA NATO. NATO gave an affirmation radiating confidence. Awesome. Now here is the thing, I want to ask of you. You have seen and been to my space. I want to enter there as well, but others aren't allowed to witness me suddenly appearing or disappearing, neither should they notice that I am gone. That's where you come in. Could you stay inside my room, while I go into my space, and use your senses to keep a lookout for me? As soon as you sense someone walking towards my door you will alert me then I will come out and put you back into the space. Nato consented but transmitted confusion as well. Are you asking how to alert me if I am inside the space? Nato bobbed its head at me Kyle's question. That's no problem. I can leave a small connection open and you just have to call out Nato thrice successively as a signal. Nato indicated his understanding and me Kyle looked at the clock in his room. I still have 90 minutes until the time I normally go downstairs approaches, so I will enter my space for that duration. My mother generally does not enter my room during this time but it's better to be safe than sorry, so please keep an eye out. I will give you two oron and a lepa berry for breakfast. That way you can have your breakfast while keeping a lookout. Also, feel free to do what you want but try to not break anything, and don't make a commotion or any suspicious noises. After receiving a confirmation from Nato, Mikhail took out the berries and gave them to Nato before disappearing. Mikhail, who finally managed to enter his space for the first time, after more than 19 months, exclaimed. Whoa whoa, whoa. I finally made it in. I had started to think that I would have to wait for a few years before I would get the chance to enter my space. I'm lucky that Nato followed us home and that he is cooperative. Mikhail looked around his space. So this is how it looks like from a normal perspective. The air feels fresher, and the grass appears greener. Just kidding. Now that I am here let's take a look at the house before going over to my precious specimens. Mikhail went over to his house and checked it inside out. It still had 150 square meters and was two stories tall. The increase in the size of the space had made no difference for the size of the house yet. 
The inside of the house was fully furnished, and he had no idea where all the furniture came from, but his space could replicate all kinds of materials, so he did not care about it too much. Anyways, the first floor had a fully equipped kitchen, a cozy living room with a reading corner, and a storeroom that contained the cabinets assigned to his subspaces. The second floor contained a bedroom, an office, and a small private library that was filled with books containing the knowledge he had already gone through. This was to give him the option of experiencing the feeling of perusing slash reading books if he wanted to go over them again. Mikhail was hoping that the next upgrade to his space would add some labs with tools for pokeball smithying and berry processing to his house. He planned to use the apricorns he had planted to train his pokeball creation and wanted to turn the berries he stored into potions, lotions, salves, creams, drinks, and different forms of food. Those two were his priority right now, other kinds of laboratories were secondary. Mikhail left his house after touring it once. While walking by his garden area toward the pond, he felt that it was a bit empty with only grass and decided to plant some trees batches. He planned to use only the apricorns for this, because he felt that the subspace flora was enough for his berry trees and other plant materials, for now. The subspaces were currently 350 square meters big and this was more than enough for him to build up his stock and meet his current demand. If he felt the need for more, he would think about using the garden in his main space. Who knew maybe he would plant some flowers in the future to beautify his garden. Anyways, he currently had three kinds of apricorns, the green, blue, and black ones. Mikhail decided to plant three clusters of 15 apricorn trees distant from one another, one cluster for each kind. The growth cycle of the apricorns was two weeks and each batch had four apricots, so he would collect 120 apricots from each type every month. He chose to realize his idea and instructed his space to plant them after choosing the locations of the clusters. After that was done, he noticed the trees in Nata's area, before this he had not bothered to check them out. Now that he saw them with his eyes, he noticed that they were pine trees. There were many kinds of trees, like oak, elm, and birch but he liked evergreen trees like the pine a bit more. With that random thought, he arrived at his destination. He went over his plans for his magi carp experiments once more. He currently had 17 magi carps inside his pond, that he wanted to breed to obtain a steady supply of good quality specimens for his future experiments. Upon further deliberation, he decided to remove 5 of the magi carp, 3 females, and 2 males, from his breeding plans. These 5 magi carp were unable to attain at least light green potential even with the upgrade by the system. 4 had deep yellow and 1 even had yellow potential. Mikhail did not want them to weaken the potential pool of his future specimens, which was why he took them out. He would use them for his first round of experiments instead. They would good enough to test the waters until he obtained his first true batch of subjects, which would still take quite a while. Mikhail relocated them into his marine subspace, where they would live from now on. He did not have to worry about them eating any resources besides those he fed them, because the resources were protected by the subspace. As for the 12 magi carp that qualified as breeding stock, they could continue to stay inside the pond. Except for one of the magi carp the others were not mature enough for breeding purposes, so he had to wait for 8 to 14 months depending on the magi carp until they became mature enough. He was satisfied with their potential and wanted to see if he could add some more during future trips. The male to female ratio among the 12 magi carp was 50% and their potential was as follows. One male magi carp had deep green potential, bordering light blue. One female magi carp had deep green potential at the peak. 3. Magi carp had green potential. Of those two were female and one was male. 2. Magi carp had light green potential, bordering green. Of those one was female and one was male. 5. Magi carp had light green potential. Of those three were male and two were female. Mikhail was currently not really ready to start his experiments. Besides the non-existence of proper test subjects, the five rejects aside, he was also missing materials of a multitude of types that he would need for his tests. He currently had only materials for eight of the 18 types and even there some had only one kind of material available. Still, he wanted to start anyway and see if he could use what he had on hand to get some findings. If it didn't work out he would have only wasted some time and a few materials but if it did work out he would have a head start and he could use these findings to better his actual experiments. Either way, he could afford the losses so he went with it. He separated the magi carps in his marine subspace from each other to prevent them from interfering with each other. After that, he took 15 samples if he had that many, of one material from each type he had. He left 5 of the samples as is, 5 of them were cut slash broken into pieces and the last 5 were ground up. Once that was done, he would release the 3 different sample forms of the material near each magi carp to see if any of them reacted to the type of the material. He would repeat that process until all magi carp had been presented with all available samples once. At least that was the plan until he noticed that he only had enough material samples for 6 types. Rock, water, plant, air, fire, and poison. He did not possess enough stock of the bug and ground type material. So he proceeded with his test without them. After he had gone through all six types, none of the magi carp showed any special reaction towards any of them. The only exception was the water type material, which was to be expected since magi carp was a water type Pokemon. This showed that none of the magi carp had an affinity with any of the used material types or at least the used material was not able to rouse their attention more than they should have. That either meant that they probably had no other affinity besides water or it was to a type, for which he did not possess a material. 
Either way, the first experiment ended in a failure which disappointed Mikhail a bit even if he had expected it since it was quite rushed. He decided to gather enough materials for each type first before starting another experiment. Once Mikhail reached that decision, he fed all magi carp and left his space. His abrupt appearance startled Natu a bit and it released a dignified squawk. PFFFTTTTT. Sorry, sorry. I keep forgetting to warn you. NANA Tuesday Natu. Natu complained and seemed to say there better not be a repeat or else. Right, moving on. I finished what I wanted to do, so thank you for keeping a lookout. I will tell you when I need you to do this again. Are you ready to return to the space? Natu expressed his readiness and Mikhail took him back. Afterward, he went downstairs and had his breakfast with his parents. He spent the rest of Grau Day leisurely with his parents, but in the evening he went earlier than normal to his room saying that he was tired. He used that time to do the psychic exercise he had skipped that morning. Before Mikhail slept that night he decided to use the next week that would start tomorrow to complete his rough mental map of the 3 kilometers radius around their property. He hoped he would find some useful materials in the meantime, or he would have to wait until he carefully combed through the area to find something useful. Mikhail fell asleep while thinking about his future plans. The poll ends on Sunday evening, so those that want to participate in deciding which type is going to win please head to my Patreon to vote. You don't have to become a patron to vote, the poll is public. Patreon slash Israel 93, Chapter 28, CH5, 28, Exploration Success and Evolution. As soon as he woke up the next day Mikhail remembered that his parents had promised to show him all their Pokemon once the weekend came around, but they hadn't. While he had already seen nearly all of them, he still wanted to see the rest of the Pokemon, so he went down to complain, ahem sorry, he meant politely inquire of his mother why they had not fulfilled their promise to him. His mother told him that Crabat and Pidgeot had not come last week as they had expected, so they decided to do postpone it to this weekend instead because they believed that both would come over this time since they didn't do so the last time. Accepting her excuse Mikhail decided to focus back on his plan to complete a rough map of the 3 kilometers radius of their property. He hoped to complete it during this week. Mikhail was not able to finish his map during the week, it took him 12 days to complete his rough map. This experience raised his respect for the cartographers who had to do this by themselves for much larger areas. He had stopped the last time after mapping 50% of the northeastern area so he finished that during the first day. Unfortunately, he did not find anything he did not already have. He managed to finish the whole western part on the second day because that part was on the path to his parents' training area, so he already had some idea of what to expect. Mikhail had taken mental notes every time he had noticed something that stood out to him while accompanying his parents, so the time he had to spend was shortened. Three noteworthy things happened during his exploration of the western part. The first was that he managed to check out his father's Cedra. The stream from the northwestern area flowed through the western part as well, and his father's Cedra had made its home there. While he was checking out the vicinity of the stream Cedra came out to greet him after having recognized Mikhail. Mikhail directly used the opportunity to check its status and he was not even surprised by the potential of his parents' Pokemon anymore. Species, Cedra. Gender, male. Type, water. Potential, green. Stage, genetic variation. Abilities, talents, affinities. He was becoming desensitized. From the seven Pokemon species he and his checked out list, that had light green potential or higher as the best potential witnessed, five came from his parents. A man had to adapt and that's what he did. Mikhail simply reaffirmed his decision to ignore the oddity that his parents' luck represented. The second noteworthy thing was a Kelpsy berry that he got through Cedra. Name, Kelpsy berry. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition, water, and plant energy. Can be eaten as food, causes slight feelings of closeness and lethargy. The effect was the same as the one from the tomato berry and its quality was raised to low. The third was a nice piece of amber he found because he noticed a sparkle on the ground between the trees. It turned out that the amber could be used as a supplement but not as a plant type material as one would expect but as a bug type supplement. Name, compromised amber, bug type. Type, bug, mineraloid. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, bug type blood came into contact with the amber during its formation process enabling it to absorb and store bug type energy from the environment can be used as a supplement for bug type Pokemon. This piece of amber was a big find not only because it could be used as a supplement but also because of what he could find between the lines. If staining the tree resin with bug type blood could produce a compromised amber of the bug type, then would it be possible for Mikhail to find or better yet produce amber of many different types depending on the Pokemon the blood came from. He woke up from his unrealistic dream pretty fast. While he may indeed be able to find other compromised amber types, no matter how unlikely it was, he would not be able to produce them himself unless he could accelerate the formation process massively. Amber took 2 to 10 million years to naturally form, at least in his previous world it did, and unless he would discover that it was different on Terra or he really found a way to speed up the process he would have to shelve his idea. Nothing else of interest happened on the second day. Mikhail explored the southwestern part during the third and fourth days. He, unfortunately, found nothing new in that area. There were berries and apricorns trees that he saw but they were of the kind he already possessed. The southern part was relatively easy to go over and he finished it on the fifth day, 
The road that led to the town center was located there, so there was nearly nothing to be found. Mikhail still checked both sides of the roads but found nothing useful. The sixth and seventh days were the weekend so he paused his exploration to spend the whole day with his parents. His parents kept their word and once Krabat and Pidgeot came to their home on the sixth day, his parents brought him to their garden. They called all those staying there over and released the rest from their poke balls. Mikhail had already checked out his mother's whole team before this but apparently, his parents gave all their Pokemon nicknames and he heard some of them for the first time. Mikhail still went towards all of them one by one to greet and hugged slash touched them while checking their status. There was her starter Titania, a Nidorina with deep green potential. Emerald, a female Butterfree with light green potential. Sunny, a male Gloom with light yellow potential. Rivers, a male Poly Whirl with deep green potential, and lastly Star, a genderless Staryu with deep yellow potential. His mother, Arya, seemed like a really lucky person when one looked at the potential of her Pokemon, right? He thought so as well until he finally managed to check his father's full roster. There was his starter Titan, a Nidorino with light blue potential. Cyan, a male Butterfree, with yellow potential. He had light yellow potential when Mikhail checked him before, but it seemed like they had managed to increase it. Sky, a female Pidgeot with deep green potential. Duke, a male Crabat with light blue potential. Azure, a male Seedra with green potential. Cell, a Magneton with light green potential but it was already bordering green potential. Mikhail nearly burst out laughing when he heard its name, because of what would happen once it evolved to Magnezone, but he managed to control himself. Vibra, a female Radon with green potential, and Agni, a male Growlithe with deep green potential that was already bordering light blue. He was floored, utterly shocked, at just how lucky his father, Edward, turned out to be. Mikhail had repeatedly tried to accept it and move on but he was still shocked every time, which showed that he had failed to do so after all. But could he be blamed? He didn't think so. Mikhail had experienced firsthand how hard it was to find Pokemon with good potential. While it was not too hard to find a Pokemon with any shade of yellow potential as long as one was willing to invest enough time, any Pokemon with light green potential or higher was hard to find. Then comes along the anomaly that was his father with his team and Rex Mikhail's statistics. Two light blues with one having an easy chance to upgrade to blue once it evolves. Two deep greens with another one that could easily upgrade to light blue upon evolution. Two greens with both having the chance for promotion upon evolution as well. One light green that's about to improve with the same upgrading chance as the others. The only odd one out in this case was the yellow potential, simply unbelievable. Mikhail just thanked his parents for showing him their full roster while coming to terms with the fact that his parents, mostly his father, were statistic wreckers. Mikhail and his parents spent the rest of the weekend at home simply relaxing. They watched TV when they wanted to, played if they felt like it, and simply lazed around otherwise. He surreptitiously did some stretching and bodyweight exercises, not wanting to break his parents' sen. Once Arc Day came around again he resumed his mapping efforts. He spent the 8th and 9th days finishing the southeastern area but found nothing new except for a brown apricorn tree. He didn't even know there was a brown apricorn because there were none in the games, but he should have expected this. Mikhail had known that there were more pokeball variations on Terra than in the games or anime so it wouldn't be a stretch to find more types of apricorns as well. Name, brown apricorn. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition, some earth, and plant energy. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical training can be used to produce various poke balls. He naturally added it to his material stock after it was upgraded to low quality by the space. The eastern part was where the other houses in their vicinity were but Mikhail still used the tenth day to check the areas to make sure he didn't miss anything but as he had expected he found nothing useful. The last area left unexplored was the northeastern part and he used the eleventh and twelfth days to finish doing a once over there as well. His luck was good in the sense that he witnessed an evolution during his exploration on the eleventh day. He was watching a fight between two relatively strong Radatas, that were rather even, over a few berries when one of them suddenly started to evolve in the middle of the fight. The other Rattata stopped immediately, which was rather unusual in his opinion. He thought the Rattata would use this opportunity to attack the other one during its evolution to prevent it from becoming stronger or finish it while it was defenseless, but it simply ran away after taking one of the berries. At first, he was confused before he decided to check his knowledge store on evolution again while observing the evolution of the Rattata to Rithi Kate. What he found explained why the other Rattata ran away. There were two reasons why the Rattata did not interfere and another reason why it ran away. The first one was that the legendaries prohibited any interference during an evolution process, which actually targeted the Pokemon of the higher stages, because of the second reason. The second reason was that the evolution process used the energy inside the Pokemon's body as well as the energy in the environment to carry out the evolution. The crucial thing was that the energy from the environment not only provided the extra energy necessary to support the change the Pokemon went through but also erected a barrier that protected the evolving Pokemon from any damage or interference. The reason for the light show was the high amount of energy that was concentrated in the area at that moment. This was one of the natural's laws of Terra and only Pokemon of a really, really high stage had a chance to break that natural protection, but they knew that doing this was equal to going against the natural law and order of Terra, which would be felt across the planet. This would mean the legendaries would find out and there would be dire consequences. 
So no one on Terra tried interfering during an evolution because it was futile for nearly anyone and those that could did not really dare slash want to do it either out of respect or fear. As for the reason why it ran away only taking a single berry leaving the rest alone, instead of staying or taking everything, that should be obvious. Why bother staying when the Pokemon would most likely kick your ass once it finished evolving and taking every berry would only provoke the other party, which would cause it to either chase it or resent it. If it was chased down it would be in immediate danger, if it was resented it would be in future danger in case they came across each other coincidentally. So it just wasn't worth the risk. Anyway, once the evolution was finished and the light went out Mikhail could see a Rathikate where there previously stood a Rattata. He had to say it was incredible to witness an evolution firsthand. Once the Rathikate saw that it was alone and that only a single berry was missing, it seemed to shrug and simply started eating. Nothing else of importance happened that day. On the twelfth day, he managed to find something he found really cool, the lance of a Beedrill. Mikhail had no idea why there was a Drill's lance in that place but he assumed it broke off during a fight and was simply left there. Name, Drill's lance. Type, Bug. Quality, Lowest. Faults, None. Uses, It's a lance that broke off from a Beedrill. Contains concentrated bug type energy. Can be used as a supplement to help bug type Pokemon. Obviously, its quality was increased by his space to low quality. Other than the lance he only found more of the same, so by the end of the twelfth day, which was a dial day, he completed his superficial mapping of the southeastern area and his rough mental map was finally complete. He had coincidentally managed to complete the first part of his exploration project just before the start of the weekend. Mikhail went to bed that night satisfied with his accomplishment and happy to have experienced interesting things like an evolution during the process. Underscore 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 The time frame I set for the poll is over. The dragon type 1. This means the material that will provoke a reaction from one of the Magellarp will be of the dragon type. Chapter 29, CH6, 29, Maps and Telepathy. The next morning Mikhail woke up early like usual. He did his stretches and bodyweight training before focusing on his psychic training. Mikhail could feel that there was a paper-thin wall between him and the next class, so he could advance anytime. He stopped an hour later and thought about the things he could do at home since he was not going out exploring today or tomorrow. He recalled that he never went to his parents' office that was on the same floor as his room and decided to rectify that immediately. When he arrived in front of the door he tried to open it and was surprised to find it unlocked, shrugging at his parents, should he call it, carelessness, or carefreeness Mikhail entered the room. It looked pretty comfortable, there was a two-person couch with a coffee table, a study desk with an office chair, and two bean bags. Furthermore, there was a pretty big bookshelf that was nearly filled with books and documents. Mikhail ignored the ones that were out of his reach and focused on the lower rows that he could reach. He decided to first focus on a few maps of Kanto and a few complimentary books he found amongst the reading materials. He took out three maps, one showing the whole of Kanto, one focusing on the part between Viridian City and Pewter City, to which his parents added Hope Town, and the last one focused on Hope Town. Besides the map, he also took the book Settlements and You to help him understand the classifications on the map and to get some general knowledge of Kanto's settlement situation. The first thing he noticed when he looked at the map of Kanto was that it was huge. He objectively knew that even the size of a single Terran continent that humanity settled on was two times the Earth's surface area but only after seeing the size of Kanto and knowing that it was only a small part of the whole continent did he comprehend how big the continents and subsequently Terra really were. The Kanto region alone had a territory of 15.5 million square kilometers, which was much larger than any country on Earth except for Russia, and the difference between those two was not that big. The shape of the region did mostly resemble the one from the games, but the land outcrop around Pallet City, yes not town but city, was further towards the center of the region. Other than that they chose an island west of Pallet City as Cinnabar Island and the one from the games was designated as an unsafe volcanic island. Because of the sheer size of Kanto and because this was reality, not a game, there were naturally more cities than the ten from the games, and their distance to each other was way larger. Their position on the other hand was relatively the same just not their size and distance. The map of Kanto as a whole he was currently studying showed only the tier 7 and tier 6 major cities, which included the ones from the games but there were still 34 major cities recorded on the map. According to the scale of the map, each major city had a 10.000 square kilometers area which was considerable. That was somewhat between the size of Tokyo, 8.000 sqkm, and New York, 12.000 sqkm. Mikhail saw that each major city had a strip of land slash route connecting them to other cities and that only those were considered relatively safe areas. The strips slash routes were all 100 kilometers wide, so the safe area was not small it just looked small in comparison to the wilderness. Everything outside those strips slash routes was considered wild area slash wilderness and this was inside the Kanto region. The area outside Kanto's borders was marked red and categorized as deadly. He also noticed that the Rota Kingdom was drawn north of Pewter City and it was marked as a subordinate territory of Kanto. Mikhail saw the tier categorization of the cities again and was curious how the settlements were divided, so he put the maps aside for now and focused on the book on settlements he chose. From there he found out quite a bit of information. There were six types of settlements that were recognized by all of humanity. 
villages, towns, small cities, cities, major cities, and capital cities. The settlements were divided into parts according to their size. Towns had an inner and an outer area. Small cities had an inner, outer, and fringe area. Cities had a center, inner, outer, and fringe area. Major cities slash capitals had a core, center, inner, outer, and fringe area. Now came the part that he was the most curious about. There were seven settlement tiers. The assigned tier of a settlement depended on its size, strength, military and slash or economic, and influence on its surrounding area. Tier 0 was possible for villages and towns. Tier 1 was possible for villages, towns, and small cities. Tier 2 was possible for villages, towns, small cities, and cities. Tier 3 was possible for small cities and cities. Tier 4 was possible for small cities, cities, and major cities. Tier 5 was possible for cities and major cities. Tier 6 was possible only for major cities and Tier 7 only for capital cities. I finally know what Hope Town being a Tier 2 town means. Hope Town is better than I thought, being at the highest tier possible for a town. To rise to Tier 3 it would need to upgrade to slash qualify as a small city, were Mikhail's thoughts before he focused back on the book. Next up was the standard size of settlements and the distance between settlements. Villages were 4 plus SQKM big and had 10 plus KM between them. Towns were 25 plus SQKM big and had 50 plus KM between them. Small cities were 225 plus SQKM big and had 100 plus KM between them. Cities were 400 plus SQKM big and had 250 plus KM between them. Major cities were up to 10.000 plus SQKM big and had 500 plus KM between them. Capital cities had the same standards as major cities. As for the population, Mikhail looked that up as well and they considered the number of registered households. The big ones were 300.000 plus households for major cities and 1.000.000 plus households for capital cities. That was all Mikhail needed to know of that topic for now. If he ever decided to take over or build his own settlement, he would revisit the topic. After putting the book back from where he had taken it, Mikhail focused on the maps again, especially the one of Hope Town and how surprising it was that he actually found Hope Hill on the map. Nodding to himself Mikhail verified that he was accurate once more before directing his focus back to the map. While Mikhail was concentrating on the map of Hope Town his mother entered the room. She had decided to see what Mikhail was doing because he had not come downstairs yet. He used to come down much earlier, so his mother went up to see if something happened but couldn't find him in his room. While she was moving towards the bathroom, because that's where she thought he was, Arya heard the sound of shifting paper coming from their office. Once she entered the room she saw her son focusing on a map. She asked him amused. Mikhail, why did you enter this room, and why are you staring at the map so intently? Mikhail who nearly sprang up in surprise turned to his mother while putting on the most innocent look he could muster. Mommy, good morning. I was a bit bored. When I wanted to go downstairs I saw the door. I decided to peek. I haven't been here before. I got curious. Look I found treasure maps like in the stories. Mikhail said while pointing at the maps. Arya laughed a little before she started speaking. Honey, those aren't treasure maps, but real maps. What they show is the location of places. Sadly, there are no crosses that show the location of buried treasures on these maps. Mikhail acted disappointed. Not treasure maps. Eh, oh, I even found the hill. I thought the treasure is buried there. Are they really not treasure maps? His mother was trying not to laugh at his look. I'm sorry, honey, but those are really not treasure maps. Since you singled out Hope Hill on the map I can talk to your father and we can go there on a trip if you want to. Mikhail agreed to her suggestion because any new place was a new source for possibly useful materials. Okay, thank you, mommy. They went downstairs together and had their breakfast. Mikhail's parents talked with each other, and Arya told her husband about what happened upstairs. Edward had to laugh when he heard what his wife told him and instantly agreed once he heard about her idea of a trip to Hope Hill. They decided to go there tomorrow right after breakfast. Mikhail spent the next few hours with his parents before he told them he was tired and that he was going to take a nap. He went to his room and called out Nato after making sure his parents did not follow him. Hello, Nato. I need your help again. Mikhail explained his plan to Nato. He wanted to do his psychic training and fully focus on it, so he wanted Nato to use his senses to keep an eye on the stairs leading to his floor and warn him once his parents went upstairs. The reason Mikhail did not tell Nato to directly use his senses on Mikhail's parents was that he suspected they, specifically his father, would notice something causing him to become alert, which Mikhail did not want. The reason he wanted to fully focus and could not stay alert himself was that he wanted to invest all his energy in his training hoping to successfully advance as soon as possible. Nato. N.A. Nato agreed while expressing his hunger, not so subtly demanding a bribe in the form of berries. No problem. I will give you two citrus and two lepa berries. If you still have more space in your belly after eating those, I can give you some more. Mikhail proceeded to take out the promised berries and focused on his telekinesis exercise afterward. During the time he had done his exploration Mikhail had not forgotten about his psychic training. He had made sure to train for at least two hours per day and had managed to increase the number of stones he lifted during his telekinesis exercise to 19. While he had not increased his range of 10 meters or persistence of 10 minutes, just the increase of 9 stones was good enough progress for about 2 months of training. 
He was guessing that he would be able to break through as soon as he managed to do his exercise with 20 stones. Mikhail gave his best during his training, pushing himself to lift the 20th stone. While he already managed to lift 20 stones, he could not keep levitating them for 10 minutes. His current limit was 8 minutes, which meant he was 2 minutes short. So he kept exhausting his energy reserves using his telekinesis and then meditated to help with his recovery by actively absorbing energy. He repeated this process again and again. By the end of two hours, he had managed to increase his time to nine minutes, which made him optimistic about his chances during his evening session. He, unfortunately, had to stop right now, because any more than two hours would make his parents wonder why his nap was taking so long, which was why he put his hopes on his evening training session. Mikhail thanked Natu and put him back into his space, where he gave him another round of berries, before going downstairs. The rest of the day went normally and he was full of anticipation towards his evening session, which his parents confused with excitement for their trip to Hope Hill tomorrow. When it was finally time for him to go to his room to sleep Mikhail quickly said goodnight to his parents, who were simply laughing at his antics, before running upstairs. He took out Nato once more and told him that the deal was the same as before. Once he gave Nato his berries Mikhail fully focused on his telekinesis exercise, trying to achieve those 10 minutes. He still kept exhausting his energy reserves and then restored them wholly, repeating the process again and again. It was one hour later while Mikhail was furrowing his brows deeply focused on the exercise with sweat dripping down his cute face always trying to extend the duration that he finally managed to hold out for 10 minutes. As soon as he crossed the 10 minutes mark he felt something akin to a dam breaking ushering him forward. He had advanced to tier 1 second class psychic and unlocked his telepathy. Feeling extremely happy with his success, Mikhail decided to pull a little prank on Nato. He used his newly unlocked telepathy to send a sound to Nato. Mikhail could not manage more than that for now but for his plan, he did not need more anyway. PSSST. Nato got startled and started looking for the source of the sound before looking at Mikhail suspiciously. Did something happen, Nato? You started to hurriedly look around. Did you notice something suspicious? Are my parents coming upstairs? While he was acting concerned, posing questions Mikhail used his telepathy to send the sound once more. PSSST. But he either underestimated Nato's sensitivity or overestimated his control over his newly gotten ability, maybe both, because he got caught by Nato who was glaring at Mikhail for pranking him. Him overestimating himself was bad because it showed that he was behaving carelessly. Being caught by Nato was one thing but if he acted carelessly and got caught by other people or wild Pokemon it could lead to consequences he wasn't ready for. The endorphin and adrenaline that were released because of his excitement towards his breakthrough had made him a bit reckless, but this was a lesson that showed that he was not immune to stupid ideas. He gave his immature body partial responsibility, the body affecting the mind, and all that, but in the end, he just needed to make sure he was able to control his ability before using them for pranks. Not having fun was not a good solution, he just had to make sure he was in control and knew the risks. Sorry, sorry. I just advanced a bit and unlocked telepathy, so I wanted to try it out. Who, if not my best buddy Nato could have been the first individual with whom I should have shared my success. I just got a bit overzealous with the method. He 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 he. Mikhail apologized to Nato while buttering him up a bit to soften his attitude, which seemed to work as Nato simply expressed something along the line of good for you, don't do it again or else. Thank you again for keeping a lookout while I was training. It is thanks to you that I was able to fully focus on my training and breakthrough so swiftly. Nato puffed out his crest feathers proudly, expressing his full agreement. Well, crest feathers might be a bit inaccurate, with his body looking mostly like a head. Nato instantly glared at him as if he had heard Mikhail mocking his body. Yes, you were a great help, which is why I am going to give you a heap of berries once you are in the space again. So I am going to put you away now. See you later. Mikhail placed him back into his space as he had said and went to his bed to sleep. They were going to Hope Hill tomorrow and he wanted to be well rested for their trip. Advertising plugin. A self-drawn map of the Kanto region depicted in my story can be found on my Patreon. Patreon slash Israel 93. Chapter 30, CH7, 30, Resources Galore, and Voluntary Newcomer. Mikhail woke up early the next morning and instantly took out Nato after confirming that he was awake as well. He used his telepathy to communicate with Nato training his ability this way. The area in which he could use his telepathy was obviously the same as the one he could sense things and use his telekinesis in, which was a 10 meters radius around himself. He understandably did not make any visible progress during the hour he spent using his telepathy on Nato but diligence was the key to success. Progress would show itself as long as he kept training. After thanking Nato and giving him some berries for breakfast Mikhail started doing his stretching and bodyweight exercises. Three sets later he felt that it had become too easy and that he was completely accustomed to five repetitions now, so decided to increase the number of repetitions to ten starting tomorrow. Once he was done with his exercises Mikhail went downstairs, where he had breakfast with his parents. After breakfast, they got ready and drove towards Hope Hill, which was a 20-minute drive away. When Mikhail saw Hope Hill for the first time he was impressed. From what he learned from his parents, Hope Hill was about 350 meters tall and covered an area of nearly 5 sqkm. It was perfect for relaxing hikes and had enough open areas for picnics and the like. 
They got down their car and his parents each took their bag of holdings, sorry, their Silfco bags, where everything they would need was stored and they wandered up the hill. His parents, who seemed to know the hill like their back pocket started talking to each other. We will walk to our spot first and set up our things. Afterward, we can decide what to do, or do you want to us stroll around first and go to our spot later on? Edward asked Arya. No, you're right. It would be better if we went to our spot first. Once we settle our stuff there, those that want to walk around can do so and those, like me, that simply want to relax can stay there and do whatever. Arya expressed her agreement. All right, that's what we will do then. They walked for 15 minutes before they arrived at the spot his parents wanted to stay at. It turned out both his parents wanted to simply relax, for now, so they decided that Mikhail would be allowed to roam around to his heart's content, obviously one of their Pokemon would be tailing him but that was not a problem. While Mikhail would be wandering his parents were planning to lie around, they told him to return in 4 hours at the latest for lunch. They would decide what to do afterward, after lunch. So it was with both Butterfreeze tailing him that Mikhail left their picnic area and started his walk. He planned to look around for useful materials while checking all Pokemon he could. Two minutes into his search Mikhail had a brilliant idea. He immediately focused on his space and reached out to Natu. Hey, Natu. The poor Pokemon was startled by the sudden sound and fell from the tree it was lounging on. It managed to stop itself and flew back to the branch before glaring upwards. It conveyed something along the lines of what the hell do you want? Sorry, my bad. Natu relaxed his glare after Mikhail apologized and expressed something like get on with it. Mikhail noticed that Nata seemed to be becoming more and more expressive and seemed to start to understand his sentence nearly completely. He knew that psychic types achieved sentience relatively early and Nata seemed to be on the verge of full sentience. Mikhail liked to think that the acceleration was thanks to the contact with him. Anyway, I am currently on a trip with my parents and we went to Hope Hill. I am planning to release you on a tree near me so that you can approach me afterward. We are going to act as if we met for the first time. You will behave as if you feel drawn to me and follow me around. Then I will take you with me and introduce you to my parents telling them that you approached me and that I want to take you home. Nata who listened nodded before he conveyed his confusion. You want to know why we didn't do that while I was out exploring the area around my house. Nata nodded again. Easy. Meeting you near our house would have been suspicious because no Natus are living in the area and my parents' Pokemon keep an eye on the surroundings so you suddenly appearing while I am there would be weird, but they can't do that here. I believe that they would either think you traveled here on your own or that someone released you here. Meeting you on a trip to Hope Hill seems more like a coincidence than near our home. Besides, enough time has passed that I don't think my parents would recognize you as the Nato from the petting zoo. They would at most think I have an affinity with the Nato species. Nato showed his understanding and agreement. Okay get ready I am going to take you out now. Mikhail released Nato from his space, depositing him on the branch of a tree 4 meters to his right. Nato immediately flew down and landed in front of Mikhail. They acted out their meeting script and for anyone watching it looked as if they were meeting for the first time. A short while later Nato flapped his wings and landed on Mikhail's head. A few moments later Emerald flew over to ask if everything was alright. Mikhail told her that Nato found him interesting and that Nato had wanted to accompany him to which he had agreed. Emerald accepted Mikhail's explanation and left after staring at Nato for a bit as well as instructing it to behave or else. Happy with the show they put on for his tail and the result Mikhail resumed his stroll. He would occasionally talk with Nato while checking out Pokemon they came across and controlling anything that stood out to him. He had been walking around for nearly an hour now, but the things he checked all turned out to be duds. Neither had any Pokemon with noteworthy potential popped up yet nor had he seen any new Pokemon species. So he was understandably a little bit disappointed. It wasn't that he found nothing useful because he did see quite a few berry and apricorn trees but he already had each variety he encountered, so they were not really useful even if Nata disagreed with him. The little bird would occasionally pluck a berry and eat it when it felt a bit peckish and they saw a berry. Anyway, he had been walking to the west slash left since he left his parents' side and decided to change his direction. Mikhail started walking north slash upwards, he planned to keep walking this way for another hour before changing directions once more, this time to the east slash right. Yes, he had planned his route in the form of a square, that would lead him back to his starting point, his parents, at least that was the plan. In case he deviated a bit from his target he still could ask the Butterfree following him to lead him back. It seemed he had made the right decision with changing directions because only 5 minutes later he found 3 useful materials at once. A white apricorn, a float stone, and a piece of raw normal gem, stone. Name, White Apricorn. Type, Plant. Quality, Lowest. Faults, None. Uses, Contains nutrition and a mix of energies. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical training. Can be used to produce various poke balls. Name, Float Stone. Type, Air Slash Flying. Quality, Lowest. Faults, None. Uses, It's a stone that has been influenced by the energy it stores. It covers those that stay in contact with it in air energy, seemingly reducing their weight. Absorbs and stores a bit of air type energy can be used as a supplement to help air type pokemon name raw normal gem type normal slash neutral quality lowest faults none uses it's a piece of raw gemstone that can absorb and store neutral energy contains some compressed neutral type energy increasing its purity 
can be used as a supplement to help normal type Pokemon. The area he found seemed to have a higher than normal concentration of neutral and air energy floating around, because not only did he found those items there but there were also Pokemon of those types in that area. He had not been attacked thanks to the smell on him as well as his escort that made itself known when they saw so many Pokemons gathered around. On a side note, the energy typing of the other materials and the area allowed him to conclude that the mix of energy mentioned in the use column of the white apricorn most likely consisted of neutral, air, and plant energy. Regardless, Mikhail left as soon as he took what he needed. He had not as much luck for the next 30 minutes. He kept checking the potential of the Pokemons he came across but the best he found until now was a light yellow Pidgey and a yellow Oddish. He did not take the Pidgey because even upgraded it wouldn't attain light green potential and the Oddish was ignored by him because he had no interest in it. It was not because he didn't dare to abduct it, really. The gloom he couldn't see the strength of and the four other Oddish at its side really had nothing to do with it. Anyway, he couldn't find anything useful since his last find 30 minutes ago but just now he stumbled upon a raspberry tree. Name, raspberry. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition and plant energy. Can be eaten as food, causes the eater to relax. Mikhail's next find happened just before he decided to change his walking direction. He found a stone that gave of a gloomy vibe, so he naturally had to take a look. Name, eerie stone. Type, ghost. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, it's a stone that has been influenced by the energy it stores. Gives off a gloomy aura and may cause depressive feelings to surface if exposed to it for long durations, it can also cause nightmares. Absorbs and stores a bit of ghost-type energy. Can be used as a supplement to help ghost-type Pokemon. He kept the material obviously but decided to not take it out until he had a use for it. His walk to the east was not as fruitful as the one northwards, but he still got some good things. First of all, he abducted his first non-magic or Pokemon, Natu did not count, which was a Caterpie. He found her leisurely eating an Oron berry and checked her out. As soon as he saw her status screen he kidnapped her, berry and all. Species, Caterpie. Gender, female. Type, bug. Potential, deep green. Stage, stageless. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, shield dust, run away. Talents, quick start. Affinities, bug slash growth, psychic slash shinic, budding. Jackpot. I hit the jackpot. I have proven that I am my parents' son. Ha 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 ha. Mikhail started dancing and laughing maniacally until he was hit on the back of his head by Nato who was glaring at him for shaking him so much and making so much noise. Mikhail calmed down and simply smiled. Sorry for shaking you so much Nato, but I just found someone that is really talented, so I was too happy. Nato, send a good for you and Mikhail looked into his space to check up on Caterpie. Analyzing, Caterpie analyzed. Start improving potential, potential successfully improved. Start optimizing genes, genetic optimization failed. Unlocking extra abilities, unlocking extra ability failed. Unlocking talents, unlocking talents failed. Detected existing talent, attempting to improve talent, talent successfully improved. Checking energy storage, energy storage can support activity. Generating tailored habitat, habitat successfully generated. Add habitat to main space, similar habitat found, adjoining habitats, main space successfully expanded. Relocate caterpillar to habitat, relocation successful. Energy storage at 15%. Process finished. He checked her status and just couldn't control himself. He started laughing again. Species, Caterpie. Gender, female. Type, bug. Potential, light blue. Stage, stageless. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, shield dust, run away. Talents, quick start B2. Affinities, bug slash growth, psychic slash shinic, budding. This time he caught himself pretty fast, not giving Nato the chance to whack him again. Mikhail checked what the talent of Caterpie did and it was awesome. Quick start V2, shortens the time it takes to learn new moves. This is great. She has light blue potential that is bordering blue and she has an incredible talent. This Caterpie is simply a genius. Even among geniuses, it can be considered gifted and now she's mine. Mwahahaha. Once he was calm and done with checking out Caterpie's status, he focused on Caterpie herself, who had first finished eating her berry before looking around confused. He quickly released a heap of berries, that contained some of all berry types he possessed. As soon as Caterpie saw the berries appearing she looked around, then stared at the berries before shrugging and moving towards the berries. Seeing Caterpie seemingly accepting her new situation, Mikhail continued walking. The next thing he found while walking east was another apricorn species. Name, purple apricorn. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition, poison, and plant type energies. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical training. Can be used to produce various poke balls. He saw some Weedle, Oddish, Gloom, and a cans around the area the purple apricorn tree grew. Fortunately, there were no Beedrill. Other than those two he found nothing else that was useful to him during his walk eastwards. After around one hour had passed he changed his direction for the last time. This time to the south slash downwards. Mikhail seemed to be especially lucky today because he managed to get another two things before he returned to their picnic area. The first one was another berry species. Name, Magostberry. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. 
faults, none, uses, contains nutrition and plant type energy, can be eaten as food, can raise the eater's attractiveness slightly. The second one was a tiny mushroom. Name, tiny mushroom. Type, plant, bug. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition, bug, and plant type energy. Can be eaten as food. Can be used as a supplement to help bug and grass type Pokemon. Mikhail had no idea if that mushroom fell from Aparas and simply continued to grow afterward or if some killed Aparas and simply ignored the mushroom, but it was useful to him and that was all he cared about in the end. After those two he found nothing else but he was content. Naturally, all materials were upgraded by his space to low quality. The trip had resulted in a huge haul for him. When Mikhail noticed that he should be nearing their picnic space, he warned Nato. Nato we are nearly at the place where my parents are, so act cute and make sure my parents like you. We, well mostly me, will have to convince them to allow me to take you home. That way you can openly stay with me. Okay. Nato conveyed his readiness and Mikhail who could see his parents a bit further out walked towards them. He made sure he was ready one last time before he greeted his parents. Chapter 31, CH8, 31, North Cleared and Bonds. As soon as Mikhail entered the picnic area his parents noticed him, so when he greeted them, they were looking at the Nato on his head. Mikhail, honey, why is there a Nato on your head? You did notice the Pokemon on your head, right? Came the question from his mother. Yes, mommy, I was walking around. Then Nato landed in front of me. Nato said he thinks I am interesting. I think he is great. Nato wanted to follow me. I said okay. He flew up and landed on my head. Then Emerald came and talked with Nato. After that, I continued walking. His parents listened to his explanation and threw a look towards their butterfreeze after Mikhail was done. Emerald nodded to confirm Mikhail's answer and his parents looked at each other before his father started talking. So Nato came to you and said that he finds you interesting. Both of you talked and Nato said he wants to follow you. You agreed because you like Pokemon and think Nato is great. Afterward, you continued to walk around with Nato on your head. Did I get that right? Mikhail nodded. Nato said he likes me. I like him too. He wants to go home with me. He put on a hopeful face, activated his puppy eyes, and continued with an upward look. Can he please? Please? He can play with me. I like Nato. Please. Let's take Nato home. His parents looked at each other before debating whether to accept Mikhail's plea or not. This is the second time and Nato has taken an interest in our boy. Mikhail seems to have an affinity with Natus. Arya began and Edward continued. Yes, that seems to be the case, but I want to know how a Nato of all things turned up at Hope Hill. There were no Natus living here before and I haven't heard of any Nato migration happening. So there are a few possible reasons but three are the most likely. Edward turned towards Nato who had been acting cute until now and had been quietly listening. Did you run away from the petting zoo? Nato simply acted confused when he heard the question. Conveying confusion and seemingly saying petting zoo, what's that? Mikhail's father nodded when he saw Nato's reaction. So, you are not from the petting zoo. I thought so as well but I had to make sure. I believe we would have heard something if the petting zoo was missing a Pokemon. Mikhail after hearing his father's conclusion gave Nato a mental thumbs up before he listened to the continuation of the exchange. Did a trainer release you here, or any other human? Nato who heard the question shook his head. Okay, I believe Nato would have been a bit more cautious towards humans in that case, but it was one of the options that made the most sense. My next idea is the one I believe to be the most likely reason for Nato's presence here. Did you get separated from your family or flock while traveling slash flying through here? Nato shook his head once more after Mikhail's father had finished speaking. Arya interjected after seeing Nato denying Edward's options. How did you get here then? Nato expressed that it was an accident. Accidentally? How can one accidentally turn up at some place? Did you get lost? Nato once again shook his head, conveying that he wasn't the cause. Not done by you? Wait a moment. No way. Did you startle another psychic and got randomly teleported away? Nato acted bashfully and shyly nodded. Mikhail's parents couldn't control themselves and started laughing after hearing the true reason. Mikhail was impressed by Nato's acting skills. Edward seemed to get curious and asked. Was it an Abra? Nata simply nodded. Did you touch it while it was sleeping? Nata nodded once again. Edward and Arya relaxed a bit after finding out the reason for Nata's presence, concluding that they would not have to deal with others coming for Nata. Arya addressed Nata once more. Are you sure that you want to follow us home? If you do, you will have to listen to us, and you aren't allowed to create any ruckus. Besides, you will be Mikhail's Pokemon not ours so we won't train you, that will be Mikhail's job in the future. We will simply provide you a safe place to stay and enough food to eat, getting stronger will depend on you and Mikhail. Knowing all of this, do you still want to come home with us? Is your interested in Mikhail enough to make such a decision? Nato pretended to consider before nodding his head and exclaiming, N.A. Nato, conveying his acceptance and expressing something like no problem. Arya and Edward looked at each other seemingly having a silent conversation, before nodding. Edward then said, Okay in that case you are allowed to stay with us. Mikhail felt elated hearing his parents agree to his request. He did what everyone, especially children, would have done in such a situation, he celebrated. Mikhail took Nato down from his head, he hugged Nato and started dancing while exclaiming, Yes, ha ha ha, Nato you can come home with me, that's great, you can be my friend, my first Pokemon, ha ha ha. 
Mikhail's parents were happy that their son was happy and Arya did not forget to film this important moment. A bit later Arya told them that it was time to eat their lunch and they did exactly that. After their lunch, they went on a short stroll through the hill together, his parents telling a few stories while they were walking. After their walk, they returned to their resting place and relaxed there. They played some outdoor games before they returned home for dinner. His parents made a small provisional bed in Mikhail's room beside Mikhail's own bed with blankets and cushions for Nato to sleep in. They said they were going to buy a genuine bed for Nato later. Mikhail and Nato went to sleep after his parents had left. Mikhail was happy with how the day had gone and that he could keep Nato around without having to hide him. Two weeks went by since that day. Mikhail had accomplished quite a few things in that time. During these two weeks, Mikhail and his loyal sidekick Nato had thoroughly combed through the northern part of Mikhail's mental map. He had found three new materials that he had not discovered before and the Pokemon living in that area had gotten used to the little kid that kept coming back. He managed to interact with many Pokemon from most Pokemon species that were inhabiting the place except for the Spearow. It was not because he didn't want to but because the Spearow seemed to prefer to stay away from him. He had no idea why that was the case but he hoped that it would get better in the future or that at least Spearow in other places would not react like that. Anyways he had fed most Pokemon he came across at least once and many Pokemon had no problem with him stroking them as long as he bribed them with berries. He had not come across any lone Pokemon with yellow potential, though he did find two accompanied by a group. One was a Rattata and the other was a Weedle. He did not want to provoke the group by making one of their members vanish before their eyes. No matter how much they had gotten used to him, that would have provoked an attack. Species, Rattata. Gender, male. Type, normal slash neutral. Potential, yellow. Stage, low, iron stage. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, run away. Talents, none. Affinities, neutral. And Species, Weedle. Gender, male. Type, bug, poison. Potential, yellow. Stage, stageless. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, shield dust. Talents, none. Affinities, bug slash growth, poison. Other than those two he found a few Pokemon with light yellow potential but ignored them because of his high standards. That he could afford those high standards only thanks to the upgrade function of his space did not escape Mikhail and he felt happy once again with his choice back then. Mikhail still noticed the occasional fight for survival but he had already accepted that this was part of the natural cycle and had gotten used to it. He would sometimes watch the fights when he thought the matchup or the fight itself seemed interesting but most of the time he simply ignored them. Like they said out of sight, out of mind. The materials he found during his combing of the north area were a white stone that Nata noticed, a Firo's beak that he found while checking an area where a big fight seemed to have happened a some time ago, and an energy root that definitely did not cause him to stumble. Name, white stone. Type, rock. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, it's a piece of limestone that has been compressed until it became smooth. Contains some compressed rock type energy, increasing its purity. Can be used as a supplement to help rock and ground type Pokemon. Name, Firo's beak. Type, flying slash air. Quality, low. Faults, none. Uses, it's the beak of a Firo, that has been thoroughly steeped in Firo's energy. Contains a bit of air and neutral energy. Can be used as a supplement to help flying slash air and neutral type Pokemon. Name, energy root. Type, grass slash flora. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, it's a root that has contains a large amount of nutrition as well as energy but has an extremely bitter taste. Can be used as food, but may cause all Pokemon besides those liking bitter food to feel discontent because of its bitter taste. Can be used to relieve fatigue and accelerate the natural healing process. Except for the beak, the quality of the other two materials was raised to low quality and Mikhail stored them inside his space. But he had not spent these two weeks only combing through the north. No Mikhail had also used that time to interact with Nato and Caterpie to bond with them. He used 90 minutes every day to enter his space twice while Nato kept a lookout. Once, in the morning for 45 minutes and once in the evening for 45 minutes. Mikhail would use that time to not only personally feed Caterpie but also to caress and play with her. He asked her to show him her current moves. Surprisingly or should he say, as expected considering what her talent was, Caterpie knew quite a few moves. Tackle, string shot, which could be considered normal, as well as bug bite which was impressive for her young age. That was not all she could do and not really electro -abe, which looked more like a string shot with the occasional spark, but this was already enough to massively impress Mikhail. Nevertheless, this was still not all Caterpie had to show. No, this gem somehow had managed to use her budding shinnik affinity to start learning something those in her species line could only learn after becoming a butterfree. She could do what amounted to a sad attempt at a confusion, but the fact that Caterpie managed even that was mind-blowing. After she had shown him her moves, he decided to focus on String Shot and electro -Abe for now, because confusion would need a higher amount of Shinnik energy than she had access to. Mikhail would spend 15 minutes daily with Caterpie to work on mostly String Shot but sometimes electro -Abe as well. Naturally, he did not forget Nato in all this. Mikhail would speak with Nato about many things, and involve him in his psychic training, be it telekinesis or telepathy. He also asked Nato to demonstrate the moves he knew and found out that Nato had 5. Leer, Peck, Nightshade, Stored Power, and Surprisingly Gust. 
This showed that Pokemon on Terra were indeed not limited by the moves they could learn in the games. For Nato, they decided to focus on stored power and gust for now. They also went on his exploration trips together which Mikhail used to bond with Nato by involving Nato in his search. They did not start any real or mock fights yet, because they did not believe themselves to be ready and they had no need to do so. Let's not forget the tasty berries he kept feeding him and the occasional petting that Nato seemed to like. Mikhail would sometimes give them some of the supplements he had gathered. Caterpie got some silver powder from him, so that she could absorb the bug-type energy from it and Nato got the Pidgeotto Crest Feather to do the same. Those were unfortunately the only bug and flying-slash-air-type materials that he had enough of a stock of. Caterpie managed to use three portions during this time and Nato used two Crest Feathers. Anyway, by the end of the two weeks, he had managed to literally bond with both, turning Nato and Caterpie into his first official Pokémon. He had could finally see their status screen in the format that was reserved for his own Pokémon instead of the one for Wild Pokémon. A big thank you to G0LB0R for becoming a patron. A big thank you to Christopher Peterson for becoming a patron. Advertising plugin. I started a poll on my Patreon to decide if I should give nicknames to Mikhail's Pokemon or not and if yes, then to whom. This poll is only for patrons and goes on until the end of tomorrow, so those that plan to become patrons can still participate until then. Chapter 32, CH9, 32, Status Check and Another One. Mikhail was curious what he would learn upon seeing the full status screen of Nadu and Caterpie. He decided to start with Caterpie's status. Name, none. Species, Caterpie. Gender, female. Age, 3 months. Type, bug. Potential, light blue, 99.5%. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, shield dust, run away. Talents, quick start B2. Affinities, bug slash growth, psychic slash cynic, budding, grass slash flora, trace. Bond, Mikhail, weak. Quirks, likes to eat, curious. Parameters, stage, stageless, 80%. Condition, healthy, content. Masteries, bug e-manipulation, novice. Techniques, tackle, novice, string shot, beginner, bug bite, novice, electroabe, initial, confusion, none. The screen Mikhail saw was a bit different from what he had expected. Let's start from the top. The name section is empty, which is normal. I don't know if I want to give my Pokemon a nickname or not because I will have so many of them. Maybe, for those with the highest potential and only if they want to? Caterpie fits that category. I'll think about it. What else is new? Age. Wow, I knew Caterpie was young but to think she only recently stopped being a newborn. No wonder she was so easy to coax. Potential seems to have a new addition, brackets that show a percentage. Let's see, so once the percentage reaches 100% the potential increases. That's nice, especially seeing that Caterpie is only 0.5% away from blue potential. Until the affinity line, everything seems to be the same, but the affinity line here shows all affinities over a certain threshold that the Pokemon possess. All Pokemon possess a neutral affinity so that is not shown unless it is a normal type Pokemon. The bond line shows Caterpie's bond with me and the brackets show the level of the bond. Weak, shows that our bond was just established, this is also the one that the artificial bond the Pokeballs create is at. The strength and lifespan boost is minimal at this level. Then there is strong, which is the one that can be established at the silver stage by the Pokemon. This is the bond that allows trainers to really get stronger and live much longer. After strong comes solid slash deep, which is one of the requirements for a mega evolution. The next section quirks shows things that stand out and currently depict Caterpie perfectly. After the bonds section follows the parameter section. This one really surprised me. It currently only showed Caterpie's stage and a percentage. There were none of the parameters he expected. After a quick check, he learned that the reason for this was that stageless Pokemon reach the iron stage through normal development. Good nourishment, experience, and supplements could accelerate the process but work on the body and energy was not recommended. Nature itself seemed to say don't overwork and train them, they are just babies, let them mature slash grow first. The bracket was only available during the stageless phase and once it reached 100% the Pokemon would reach the, low, iron stage. Next up was condition which showed just that. Masteries seemed like passives but only showed important ones. Techniques showed active skills, like the moves from the games, combos, or self-made techniques. The bracket showed the mastery the Pokemon had over the technique. Mastery was divided into novice, beginner, proficient, advanced, mastered, and transcended, but the status showed initial when the Pokemon managed something resembling the objective and none when the first step is taken but the result sucks. Mikhail went over Caterpie's status once more after understanding the new information. Nodding to himself satisfied with Caterpie's status he focuses on Natu's status next. Name, none. Species, Natu. Gender, male. Age, 1 plus year, 43 months. Type, psychic, flying slash air. Potential, light green. 47.3%. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, keen eye, synchronize, early bird. Talents, moderately increased energy sensitivity. Affinities, psychic slash cynic, flying slash air, ghost slash spectral, trace. Bond, Mikhail, weak. Quirks, curious. Parameters, stage, iron stage, low. Vitality, H. Strength, G. Endurance, H. 
Agility, G. Energy capacity, G. Energy density, H. Resistance, grass slash flora, minor, shinnik, minor, fighting, major. Condition, healthy, content. Masteries, air element manipulation, novice, shinnik e manipulation, beginner. Techniques, leer, novice, peck, novice, nightshade, novice. Stored power, beginner, gust, beginner. Mikhail saw that this time the parameter section was like he had expected it to be. Let's focus on the new information, from the top to the bottom. Natu is relatively young but I knew that. He is not even halfway to green potential and has a trace of a ghost affinity. Now to the part that was missing for Caterpie, the parameters. Vitality, strength, endurance, agility, energy capacity, energy density, and resistance were the parameters that were added. I already knew that all parameter values are ranked from I to SSS. I looked up how the grades are decided, if the values always start at I or if different Pokemon have different starting points, and what happens when one advances to the next stage. Turns out that the BS makes itself known once again. The grades for the first four stages are divided into four categories. From I to G is low grade, F to D is mid grade, C to A is high grade and S to SSS is limit break. As for the starting parameter, it is influenced by the BS the Pokemon species possesses. Also every time a Pokemon advances to the next stage its parameter value goes back to its starting value if no negative or positive modifier has been added during the advancement. I knew the advancement requirements for the first four stages. An upgrade during these stages requires a minimum average of B value, but this is only the minimum requirement. Here the previously mentioned negative and positive modifiers appear. If the value of a parameter is B during the advancement, then the starting value of the following stage is lowered by 1. If the value of a parameter is lower than B during the advancement, then the starting value of the following stage is reduced by 1 for every lower value, C equals minus 2, D equals minus 3, etc. In case the value of a parameter during the advancement is A, then the starting value of the following stage stays the same. If the value of a parameter during the advancement is S, then the starting value of the following stage is increased by 1. For SS the starting value of the following stage is increased by 1.5 and for SSS the starting value of the following stage is increased by 2. For example, if my Pokemon starts with a G in strength during the iron stage and advances to bronze with a B in strength, then the starting value at the bronze stage is H. Now if this same Pokemon advances from bronze to silver with B in strength again, then its strength starting value for the silver stage is H once more despite of the starting value it had at the bronze stage. That's the mechanism for advancement but the parameter average has another important aspect, at least for me. If the average score during the advancement is S the potential gauge is raised by 40% regardless of its stage. If the average score is SS then the boost is 80% and for SSS the boost in potential is 160%. So Pokemon can increase their potential through sheer hard work, postponing the theoretical stage limit. As long as their starting point is not too low and their luck not too bad they can get pretty strong this way. Naturally, the use of supplements can increase the potential as well, especially during an evolution. Mikhail was deep in thought going over everything that he learned just now and looking over the status of his Pokemon once again with this knowledge in mind. Depending on how hard it is and how long it takes to reach a parameter average of SSS I could boost the potential of my Caterpie to Aurora, which is normally only available to legendaries and their descendants, without the aid of supplements or further boost from my space when its capabilities increase. This is really beneficial because, besides the fact that supplements are only useful until certain stages depending on their quality, repeated use diminishes the effectiveness of a supplement. Having the option to upgrade their potential even without outside help is great and I can't wait to see what I can achieve using both. I can already see my future monster of a Butterfree with deep aurora potential. Wait a minute, I know the perfect name for Caterpie should I decide to give her a name. Mothra, Queen of Monsters, or in this case Bug Types. Caterpie is only missing 0.5% to reach blue potential, so she should manage to do so in a few days at the latest with the help of the silver powder. As for Nata that was going to take a while longer. Tomorrow starts the new week and I will start combing through the northwestern area. I should go to sleep, I have much to do, and will need to be well rested. Mikhail spent the next three days combing through the northwestern area and in the middle of his exploration on the third day, it finally happened. Caterpie, who had been absorbing the energy from the silver powder, managed to upgrade her potential from light blue to blue. During this time her stage had progressed by 10% and she was only another 10% away from reaching the, low, iron stage. Mikhail had told Caterpie to not evolve and postpone it even if she could. Evolution happened only while Pokemon were conscious. Pokemon could delay their evolution without any outside help, but they had to allocate a bit of their energy and focus on it, so they could not go all out during fights without risking an accidental evolution. He wanted to wait until she had increased the mastery of her moves a bit and to use the evolution to boost her potential to deep blue. For that, he needed a bug-type material of a higher quality. He had already covered 15% of the area, unfortunately, he had found nothing useful during the last two days but he hoped that Caterpie's advancement brought him some luck helping him discover something new. Mikhail was presently checking one side of the stream hoping to find some water type material or anything really. Nata was sitting on his head, helping him look for things from there. It appeared his luck had really improved because just 10 minutes later Nata saw something shiny in the stream. 
Mikhail tried to see if he could reach it using his telekinesis thankfully it was inside his range. He pulled it up enough to separate it from the ground and checked it. It turned out to be marble. Name, Azure Marble. Type, Water. Quality, Lowest. Faults, None. Uses, it's a piece of marble that has been smoothed by flowing water. Contains some compressed water type energy, increasing its purity. Can be used as a supplement to help water type Pokemon. He put it into his space, where its quality was boosted, without raising it from the stream. Good job noticing it, Nato. It's turned out to be something useful. Nato preened. N.A. Tuesday. He conveyed that it was obvious. Mikhail chuckled before he continued his search. He spent another two hours searching before he decided to stop for the day and return home. He kept checking the Pokemon he encountered on his way home. Just as he was about to reach the area of their property he surprisingly found a Pokemon with good potential. It was another Caterpie. Species, Caterpie. Gender, Male. Type, Bug. Potential, Deep Yellow. Stage, Stageless. Genetic Variation, None. Abilities, Shield Dust. Talents, None. Affinities, Bug. The Caterpie happened to crawl from one tree to another when he saw it. Mikhail told Nato to discreetly look if their tail was focusing on them at the moment. When he received a negative answer Mikhail immediately pulled the Caterpie into his space. The space upgraded his potential and he was deposited in the first Caterpie's habitat because they were of the same species and the area was deemed large enough for both of them. Mikhail observed how the male Caterpie reacted to his abduction, ahem, abrupt location change, and had to chuckle. It was looking around and he could positively see his confusion. The female Caterpie had noticed the newcomer and went over to check him out. When she reached the male Mikhail put a few berries near them and allowed her to do an early introduction to his new situation while he finished his walk back home. Advertising plugin. I started a poll on my Patreon to decide if I should give nicknames to Mikhail's Pokemon or not and if yes, then to whom. This poll is only for patrons and goes on until the end of today, so those that plan to become patrons can still participate until then. Chapter 33, CH 10, 33, Pokemon Training and Second Area Cleared. During the next five days, he did not find anything new during his search. Besides combing through the area Mikhail did not forget to train himself as well as Nato and to give the Pokemon their supplements. Nato had gone through four crest feathers in total until now, two of which were absorbed after his first status check. This meant Nato took on average four days to absorb a single feather, which was much less than it took him before and he seemed to be getting faster. Unfortunately, each successive feather seemed to increase his potential by 0.3% less than the one before. The third feather increased Nato's potential from 47.3% to 51.3% and the fourth one from 51.3% to 55%. It was both better and worse for his female Caterpie simply because her high potential seemed to allow her to consume the supplement much faster but materials of the low quality seemed to be overall less effective on her. Caterpie managed to finish absorbing her silver powder in two days meaning she had absorbed four portions since he checked her status bringing the total amount of consumed portions to seven. The fourth one had increased her potential by 2%, the fifth by 1.8%, the sixth by 1.6%, and the seventh by 1.4%. The degree of the lessening in the effectiveness of the supplement was smaller than the one of the feathers showing that the silver powder he got from his parents' Butterfreeze was better despite both being low-quality materials. This should be because they were stronger than the Pidgeotto the feather came from. The reason Mikhail believed that supplements of certain qualities lose their effectiveness when consumed by Pokemon with higher potential was that the increase in potential caused by the silver powder was different for both Caterpie. While the female Caterpie only had an increase of 2% after her fourth portion, the male one had an increase of 7% after his first, meaning it was nearly thrice as effective on the male. On the other hand, it took him a whole five days to consume a single portion. Mikhail attributed this to the difference in their potential. It was easier to increase green potential than it was to increase blue potential and it was easier for someone with blue potential to absorb the supplement than someone with green potential. He had to wait for the Caterpie to reach the, low, iron stage before he could train their bodies but he still went over their techniques with them. Since he had no bond with the male Caterpie yet and couldn't check his full status, Mikhail simply asked him to demonstrate the moves he knew which were Tackle and String Shot. Mikhail told both Caterpie to focus on their String Shot for now. The female Caterpie had reduced the time it took to aim and fire the move to 2 seconds thanks to her previous training. How often she hit her target was a topic for another time. The male Caterpie needed 5 seconds to do the same. His short-term goal for them was to reduce the time it took them to prepare the move to one second, before focusing on other aspects of the move like length, hardness, stickiness, elasticity, sharpness, and so on. Training like this together with nutritious food and the supplements they consumed should hasten their progress to the, low, iron stage, at least it did so according to the status he saw of the female Caterpie. She had progressed to stageless, 94%, during these five days. As for Nato, he was training both his parameters as well as moves. Since Mikhail felt that training his moves would help increase his energy capacity and density, he focused on the other parameters while training them. Nato would have to rotate between flying for as long as he could, flying as fast as he could, hopping slash running for as long as he could, and hopping slash running as fast as he could. This was to train his vitality, endurance, and agility. For his strength training, he had to lift weights. 
After Nada got used to this Mikhail planned to make him fly and hop slash run around while carrying weights, training all physical parameters at once. To make sure that Nada did not injure himself because it became too much, Mikhail accessed the knowledge of Pokemon groomers to look up massage techniques and used them to help Nada relax his muscles, reducing the stress of his body. Mikhail used the knowledge he had from the Potiwanar occupation to make lotions that were useful for Nato according to the groomer knowledge. Fortunately, the starting knowledge he had on both professions was enough to help his Nato or he would have increased his access rank first, which would have taken some time. He used some of the materials he had to make a lotion that he used during the massages he gave Nato. Firo's beak and float stone for their air energy. Azure kelp for its water energy to help to spread and to soothe all the energy contained in the lotion. Citrus dash, lepa and lum berries were added to rejuvenate the body and restore his energy. Thanks to its ingredients the lotion helped increase Nato's potential. The berries Nato ate as food made sure he received enough nutrition and that he had enough energy for his training. While according to his status screen neither Nato's parameter nor his potential had improved yet, Mikhail did not think that it would take much longer to do so, especially his potential. Until now Mikhail had given Nato 8 massages and they had helped increase his potential by around 15%. While the effectiveness of the lotion was decreasing as well the rate was lower than directly absorbing the unprocessed material and it took less time as well. Nato's potential had currently reached light green, 70%, and he believed that he could upgrade it within 10 days if they kept their pace. Mikhail made Nato alternate his focus between two of his moves, Gust and Stored Power when training his techniques. For Gust he had Nato try to reduce the time needed to perform the move and two different breadths that he aimed for, one with a narrow range that focused the move into a small area and another with a wider range to target the whole area in front of him. The goal for Stored Power was to reduce the time needed to perform the move and in the future when he had stat boosting moves increase the amount of energy stored and released by the move. Two more days passed before he finally found something new. It was getting harder to find things he did not already have while being limited by where he could go, but he already knew that there would be limitations like this when he decided to start at such a young age. He did not regret his decision one bit and to be truthful he had more independence than he had expected to have. Who knew what he would be allowed to do after he finished his second maturity when he was eight. Anyway, the material he had found was something that should not exist anywhere near the area. Mikhail was mentally rambling because he could not believe he had found something like this. Name, Dragon Lily. Type, Dragon. Quality, Lowest. Faults, None. Uses, it's a lily that has absorbed a drop of dragon blood and mutated. Generally grows in areas where dragon-type Pokemon live or used to live. Absorbs draconic energy from its surroundings when available, otherwise absorbs energy and slowly converts it to draconic energy. Contains a small amount of dragon-type energy. Can be used as a supplement to help dragon-type Pokemon. Wow. Just wow. How the heck did something like this turn up around here? The only Pokemon around here that somewhat qualifies as a dragon would be his father Cedra and Mikhail doubted he could cause a lily to mutate into this unless he evolves to Kingdra and even then it would be uncertain. Had some pretty strong wounded dragon-type flown over the area causing some of its blood to fall on a field of lilies? Seeing that there was only a single dragon lily among the field of lilies, all other lilies that the blood dropped on probably died and only this one managed to survive, mutating in the process. To think he managed to gain his first dragon type material like this felt unreal. Even if it was just a low quality material that stored small amounts of dragon type energy, which he questioned the pureness and concentration of, something like this was supposed to be rare. Was it his luck making itself known or was he benefiting from his parents luck somehow? Mikhail had reached a point where he thought his father's luck could be responsible for anything. He put the dragon lily into his space and observed how its quality was increased from lowest to low. Afterward, he continued his search eager to discover another hidden gem that he would not have found if he didn't comb through everywhere. Unfortunately, he did not find another useful material even after he had checked the whole northwestern area, which took him another five days. He had luckily managed to find a pidgey with green potential during the third day, and tried to poke a nap it but it had the gall to resist. From its status, the pidgey was at the, mid, iron stage and seemed to approach the, high, iron stage because it managed to resist my poke napping efforts. It used its energy to shake off his stopping him from abducting it, then it had the nerve to fly away from the area escaping his grasp. He may be a bit salty right now but he liked Pidgeot and that was a prime candidate that he let slip from his hands. Anyway, except for the bird that flew away, he found no other Pokemon that he wanted to invite into his exclusive club. While his exploration ended a bit lackluster his Pokemon displayed the opposite. His female Caterpie reached the, low, iron stage on the fourth day which allowed him to finally see her parameters. Species, Caterpie. Gender, female. Type, bug. Potential, blue, 10.4%. Parameters. Stage, iron stage, low. Vitality, H. Strength, H. Endurance, H. Agility, H. Energy capacity, I. Energy density, I. Resistance, grass, minor, fighting, minor, ground, minor. Weaknesses, fire, minor, air, minor, rock, minor. Condition, healthy, content. Masteries, neutral energy manipulation, initial, bug e manipulation, novice. Techniques, tackle, novice, string shot, proficient, bug bite, novice, electroabe, initial, confusion, none. 
I hid most of the upper part because except for the potential everything stayed the same. The parameters are visible now and they are as low as I expected them to be, at least not all of them are eyes. I managed to find a weakness section under the resistance category and made that visible. The resistances and weaknesses are the same as those in the game. Minor is two times or half as effective and major is four times or one fourth as effective. As for her moves, I made her focus on string shot and it upgraded to proficient. Caterpie managed to reduce the time it takes her to execute the move to 1.5 seconds, which is probably the reason for the upgrade. Mikhail was happy with what he saw that day and now that he had combed through the northwestern area as well he decided to temporarily stop the combing of the other parts. The Pokemon in the north and northwestern area had gotten accustomed to his presence, he believed that he could persuade slash bribe some Pokemon to listen to him and perform some mock fights. He wanted to use Natu and his female Caterpie during a few mock battles as well as some of the wild Pokemon. This way the two would gain some form of fighting experience and he would feel what it is like to preside over a Pokemon battle, as well as gain experience with many different Pokemon. The plan was to go over the do's and do nots during a fight for a few days before starting but he would have to see how long it took for him to feel ready. Not only that, he was thinking about starting a second Magi Carp experiment, now that he had a few more materials, and believed that doing those two things together with his own training as well as the time he had to reserve for his family left him with no time for any further exploration at the moment. He would think about resuming his combing efforts in a few weeks at the earliest. A big thank you to Crepusculum for becoming a patron. A big thank you to Araga underscore N for becoming a patron. Info plugin. The poll on my Patreon concerning nicknames is over. The result is that some Pokemon may get nicknames to stand out from the rest or if they are particularly great. I repeat, this does not mean that every one of his Pokemon is going to get a nickname. Chapter 34, CH 11, 34, Sparring Preparations The morning after Mikhail had decided to temporarily stop his exploration he went to a clear area of their garden with Nata once they were done with breakfast. Nata we are not going out today. We will practice fighting. Nata flew down from his head and landed in front of him. Mikhail sat down and started explaining once he thought they were alone. His parents' Pokemon did not keep a constant eye on him while he stayed on their property, so they were semi-private. Nata simply nodded to express his understanding. Mikhail lowered his volume before he continued to talk. We are going over everything I want you to do during a fight. Our strategies are limited by the moves you currently know however there are still things we can do with what you have. Let's begin with the start of a fight. While he was doing his explanation, he took two small pebbles that he placed on the ground between them and indicated that the one on the right depicts an opponent and the one on the left depicts Natu. This will be most likely only effective against non-airborne opponents but unless I tell you otherwise I want you to use our wide range gust and create a breeze that stirs up the sand, dust, grass, twigs, and so on to obscure the view as well as distract the opponent at the start of every fight. The aim of this opening move is a distraction so you don't have to perform a full powered gust for now. Execution speed is the key so until you can perform a full power gust in a second or less, a low powered but fast one is enough. When you master gust or a more suitable move we can think about adjusting the opening move until then this is how we will do it. After you have done that or in case that you can't, you will have to start moving. A moving object slash individual is harder to hit so unless I tell you otherwise your second action is to start moving around. It doesn't have to be at your fastest speed, a relatively fast speed that keeps you from staying at a location for too long while not costing too much energy is enough. Mikhail demonstrated what he meant by lightly blowing air at the faux pebble while shifting around the Nata pebble. Did you understand everything so far? Nata nodded at his question indicating his understanding. Good, then let's continue. While you start moving I will give you one of three main instructions, front seat, back seat, and passenger. These are going to be the fighting styles you will use until I tell you to change to another one. When I say front seat I want you to move towards the opponent. While moving towards the enemy, I want you to use leer on him before using peck once you reach him. You should have enough time to execute both but if you don't then ignore Leer and only use Peck. If you feel that you have the opportunity to use either Leer or Peck more than once you may do so. If I need to amend something I will give an instruction otherwise you will have to retreat and start moving around again in case the foe counters. You will keep moving around until you or I see an opportunity to attack. If that is the case, then you have to approach the foe again and repeat the attack chain. So front seat means to approach, attack, retreat, dodge, and repeat until told otherwise. Mikhail lifted the Nata pebble while he was talking and moved it towards the other pebble when talking about approaching, hit the other pebble when he said to attack the foe, as well as moving the pebble away and around when he mentioned retreat and dodge. He demonstrated the pattern a few times after he told Nata that he should repeat it until told otherwise before he stopped. Did you understand what I meant with the front seat command? Mikhail asked to make sure Nata was following his explanation. Nata seriously nodded hearing Mikhail's no-nonsense tone. That's good we are going to run through all instructions either way but you understanding my explanation is going to make it easier for us. Next is the backseat command. The backseat command has four patterns, backseat open, backseat empty, backseat free, and backseat full. For all four patterns, you have to move away from your opponent after performing the opening move to open up the distance between your foe and yourself. The difference between them starts here. Backseat open means you should perform gust while moving around trying to maintain the distance and to dodge any attacks from the foe. Repeatedly execute gust while moving until told otherwise. 
Backseat empty means you should perform nightshade while moving around trying to maintain the distance and to dodge any attacks from the foe. Repeat executing nightshade while moving until told otherwise as well. For backseat free, you should perform stored power while doing the same and for backseat full, you can choose to swap between all moves if you want to. In cases where two moves are okay, I will combine two patterns for example backseat open and empty, meaning you can choose between gust and nightshade. You should not forget to try to evade any attacks and to keep your distance. Mikhail shifted the Nato pebble further away from the faux pebble while he kept moving it around. When he talked about gust he blew air at the faux pebble. Once he came to the part about nightshade he seemed a bit confused, because he was not sure how to illustrate nightshade before he decided to simply slap the faux pebble with his free hand signifying the move hitting the foe. Nato snickered when he saw his confused look and subsequent solution to his predicament. Mikhail glared at Nato before he simply continued with his explanation and repeated the slap for stored power causing Nato to snicker again. Mikhail briefly thought about using his telekinesis to hurl the pebble at Nato but decided against it at the end. He did not use his telekinesis during his explanation in case his mother or one of the Pokemon decided to check up on them so he wouldn't use it now to hit Nato no matter how tempting it was. It was one thing to speak softly in complete sentences because he wouldn't be heard from a distance and another to levitate pebbles and throw them at others. Haha, <laughs> really funny. Did you understand me or was laughing too much of a distraction bird head? Now it was Nato that was glaring at Mikhail, who simply chuckled seeing his glare. Nato grudgingly tolerating Mikhail's retort before expressing that he understood. N.A. Tuesday. All right, then I will continue with the third command. Passenger means you should allow the opponent to approach you and use the time he is moving towards you to attack him. Until he reaches you use long range attacks and when he reaches you start using short range attacks. While you are attacking, you can't forget to move around to dodge as many attacks from the foe as possible. We will mostly use this strategy when I think that the opponent is way faster than you and is a close range fighter that definitely will be able to catch up to you. So you will have to dodge whatever you can, negate any attacks if possible, and endure the rest while dishing out as much damage as you can. Nato had an unimpressed look on his face when he heard what the third command entailed, especially at the part where he had to take the rest of the attacks. Mikhail who saw Nato's look could only shrug. That's all we can do with the moves you have right now. After you learn more moves, especially teleport, we can adjust and change the strategy but for now, this is our modus operandi. I will naturally give direct and assisting directions if I say the need to do live adjustments but otherwise, this is how we will conduct most of our fights. Nato nodded accepting Mikhail's argument since he knew that it was true. Mikhail who saw Nato agreeing with him smiled. Once we slash you have more experience you can sometimes try to fight more autonomously and I will only interfere if it becomes necessary. We will go over the fights afterward and see what was well done and what could have been better. This way we can prepare for cases where I can't take command and you have to fight on your own. Nato approved. N.A. Tuesday Nato. N.A. He expressed that he thought it was a good idea as well. Mikhail planned to focus on Nato during the next two weeks before including Caterpie because he did not deem her ready yet even though she had as many moves as Nato. Mikhail wanted her to raise her parameters first and train her moves some more. They spent the next five days repeatedly performing fight drills where Mikhail would issue the commands and Nato would follow them. Mikhail would sometimes throw in other instructions to prevent Nato from being unable to react to sudden commands and preventing him from blindly executing the patterns. They also did their normal training routine, to not neglect Nata's parameter training and to better his move usage. Mikhail naturally could not neglect the cater pies because of this, so he allotted some time for them as well. Thanks to all the training, combined with the supplements and the massage with his specially prepared lotion Nata's potential upgraded to green on the fifth day. When he checked Nata's status screen, he saw that some of his parameters as well as the mastery of some of his moves had increased due to their training. Species, Nato. Gender, Male. Type, Psychic, Flying Slash Air. Potential, Green, 0.1%. Parameters. Stage, Iron Stage, Low. Vitality, H. Strength, G. Endurance, H-G. Agility, G-F. Energy Capacity, G. Energy Density, H. Resistance, Grass Slash Flora, Minor, Psychic Slash Shinic, Minor. Fighting, Major. Weaknesses, Electricity, Minor, Ice, Minor, Rock, Minor, Ghost, Minor, Dark, Minor. Condition, Healthy, Content. Masteries, Air Element Manipulation, Novice, Shiniki Manipulation, Beginner. Techniques, Leer, Novice, Peck, Novice, Dash, Beginner, Nightshade, Novice, Stored Power, Beginner, Gust, Beginner, Dash, Proficient. Mikhail was happy about Nata's progress and he felt that they were as ready as they could be. Not only did Nata's potential increase to green but his progress with his moves and the increase in his parameters were enough for Mikhail to have confidence in Nato. He was planning to have their first mock battle tomorrow. Nato executed his commands as well as he could without testing them during a fight and he saw no reason to delay it any longer now. On a side note, the effectiveness of the Pidgeotto Crest Feather was reduced so much that it was not worth the effort as long as he had a substitute, which he fortunately did. He could use the Fero's Beak and the Float Stone but he was already using them for the lotion so he was debating if he should use them. Was the increase in potential worth the decrease in effectiveness that was going to affect the lotion as well? He did not really think so. In the worst case, he would use white apricorns or one of those two until he found a substitute. 
The next day Mikhail went to the northern area to find a suitable Pokemon that he could fight. He had to find someone that was neither too weak nor too strong. Someone that recently advanced to the low iron stage would be the best. He would prefer it if their first opponent was a Rattata but anyone that fit his requirements would do. Mikhail had found and asked four Pokemon that fit until now but none of them had agreed. It seemed that being used to him was not enough to participate in a mock battle where they could get injured or caught. It looked like they were not sure if Mikhail would really heal them after the fight and not catch them while they were weakened. Not to mention if he would really give them the promised reward. After asking another two Pokemon and receiving rejections the third finally agreed. Mikhail was happy because it was a young Rattata that was at the low iron stage, meaning it should have recently advanced. He would think about recruiting Rattata after the fight if it agreed because it had yellow potential. Its potential was not high enough for him to think that he definitely wanted that Rattata but he would take it if it accepted his offer. Chapter 35, CH 12, 35, Mock Fight and Lessons Begin. Nato and Rattata stood opposite each other, waiting for the starting signal. Mikhail picked up a stone from the ground and addressed them both. I am going to throw this into the air, its landing on the ground is the start signal. Are both of you ready? Both Pokemon nodded and Mikhail threw the stone upwards somewhere between the two. As soon as the stone fell to the ground both Pokemon burst into motion. Rattata began running towards Nato trying to get into close range. On the other side, Nato began with his opening move stirring up the dust and dirt around the place to obscure Rattata's vision and distract it. Rattata was forced to slow down and squint its eyes to avoid tripping, running against something, or getting something into its eyes. Mikhail, who saw that Nata's opening move went without a hitch decided to use the backseat command. What he saw from Rattata's initial burst told him that Nata should be able to more or less maintain the distance between them once he opened it up. Backseat open. Nata who heard Mikhail's instruction directly started widening the gap between his foe and himself. Once he felt that he had retreated enough he started a full power gust. While Nata was initiating his gust the dust cloud he had caused settled and Rattata had gotten back its unobstructed vision once more. Rattata resumed its run towards Nato who was already performing his gust. Because of its momentum, it had no chance to evade the attack. It was hit by the move and not only was it damaged by the move, but it could no longer run forward. Rattata was doing its best to maintain a grip on the ground to avoid getting blown backward. Once Nato witnessed his attack successfully hitting the opponent and that the Rattata was trying to not get blown away, he squeezed as much power as it could into his gust. Just as Nato could no longer maintain his gust and had to stop flapping his wings the Rattata lost its grip and tumbled backward. Nato happy with his success adjusted his position and aim a bit before initiating another gust hitting his foe while it was down, causing the Rattata to roll around the ground some more before it was lifted off the ground by the current caused by his gust. The current finally blew it towards a tree that stood behind it and it slammed into the tree. Bang! Mikhail, who heard the volume of the collision knew that Rattata would be unable to recover fast enough to dodge the next attack and gave Nato a new command. Nato, front seat. Nato flew towards the downed Rattata as fast as he could and used leer at his fallen foe that was currently trying to stand up and shake off its dizziness. After his successful leer, he flew above the Rattata and performed peck aimed at Rattata's head. The poor Pokemon was hit on the head before it could shake off the dizziness and damage from its earlier intimate moment with the tree and collapsed. It was knocked out. Nata saw that his adversary could no longer fight and stopped preparing the second peck he had initiated. Mikhail, who saw the Rattata slumping over made hooping sounds before he rushed over to Nato and hugged him while congratulating him. Good job, Nato. You won and you performed perfectly. You beat the Rattata without allowing it to reach you and without taking any damage. This was great for our first battle and hopefully just the first of many more, but no matter how great this victory was we can't let it get to our heads. We are still weak and our opponent was a bit weaker than us. There will be a day when we will be one of the strong but we have to stay humble. Understood. Nata nodded his head indicating he understood but that did not stop him from feeling happy with his first win. After showering the happy Nato with praises and giving a small warning Mikhail focused on their downed opponent. Mikhail saw that the Rattata was still out and went over to check up on it. He saw that it was not seriously injured and only had small nicks here and there either from the gust, or from the tumble on the floor as well as a bruise at its back from the collision with the tree. Otherwise, it was okay when you ignored the fact that it was knocked out. He had prepared a few salves and he wouldn't call them potions but mixed berry juices that would help the Rattata recover to peak condition in a few moments. He took out one of the salves and one of the liquids and started applying the salve on the nicks and the bruise on Rattata's body. After he was sure that all injuries were covered he carefully fed the fluid to the downed Pokemon. The Rattata started coming to after drinking the liquid and instantly became alert. Feeling itself recovering and seeing that it had not been captured, it relaxed slightly before focusing on Mikhail and Nato. Mikhail, who had silently observed Rattata from the side after noticing it regaining consciousness addressed it after seeing it focused on them. I have helped you recover as I said I would and in a minute or two at the latest you should be fully healed. Now before I give you the berries I promised you as a reward I have a question for you. Rattata nodded when it heard the first part but gained a vigilant look as soon as Mikhail said the second part. Mikhail who saw Rattata's reaction tried to pacify the Pokemon. Relax, you will get your reward either way. That is something you have earned yourself and I am a man of my word. The Rattata relaxed its vigilance slightly after Mikhail said that but Nata started to snicker when Mikhail called himself a man. He chose to ignore Nata's snickering and continued. 
My question is simple, I want to ask you if you would like to join me? You would get more than enough to eat, a place to sleep and we would help you get stronger. What do you think? Would you be willing to join us? Ratata seemed to ponder when it heard his offer. If it was really considering his offer, or if it was speculating if Mikhail would go back on his word in case it refused him, he didn't know but in the end, it shook its head in denial. Arata, Rata. After expressing its rejection Ratata asked for its berries, moving its paws towards its mouth. Seeing and hearing its request Mikhail took out the berries he had promised the Ratata for its participation. Four Oran berries, three citrus berries, and one Lepa berry. He did not plan to force the issue because of two reasons. One, there currently were a few Pokemon, that he had previously asked to participate, watching them and he did not want to make a bad impression. He would have an easier time finding a willing opponent the next time if they saw him standing by his words. Two, the potential of the Rattata was yellow, which was not good enough to really arouse his greed. If it had light green potential he would have maybe hesitated but yellow isn't enough to even consider bending his word, which he didn't plan to do anyway, ever. For real. Okay, I can only accept your choice. Here is your reward. It was nice to collaborate with you and I hope we can repeat this another time against my Caterpie. That is if you want to of course. Have a good day. After saying his piece Mikhail observed how the Rattata planned to transport so many berries at once and if it was going to ask for his help. It couldn't transport all of them at once and if it tried to transfer a few before returning for the rest it couldn't guarantee that its berries won't get robbed by others while it was away. To his amusement, Rattata solved the problem in a way he had not considered. It called over two of their spectators, another two Rattata. The first Rattata seemed to know the others because they were communicating with each other. They had apparently come to an agreement because the two Rattata ate an Oran berry each before they helped the first Rattata carry two berries each. Each of the two took one of the remaining Oran berries and a citrus berry while the first Rattata took the leftover citrus berry and the Lepa berry before walking away. Mikhail laughed a little at the Rattata's clever solution. The smart way it had solved its problem showed him to not underestimate others. He nearly regretted not insisting a bit more on it joining him but only nearly. Mikhail addressed the Pokemon that had followed the happenings. I will return the day after tomorrow for another mock fight and I hope that some of you agree to participate if I ask you to do so. He waved them goodbye before turning to Natu. Let's go home. They returned home, where they briefly went over the fight again. Afterward, they relaxed until dinner spending some time with Mikhail's mother. After dinner, Mikhail's parents brought over some exercise books to the coffee table. Mikhail we think that it is time for you to start learning how to read and write. Began his father before his mother continued. We will start with the alphabet. We will first go through the whole alphabet once and after that, we will add an example to every letter. After that, you will learn how to write each letter legible in lower case as well as in capital letters. The exercise books have some pages reserved for each letter so you have enough space to practice. Every time you start writing a new letter you will have to vocalize the letter so that we know that you understand what each letter sounds like. Besides that, if you need some more paper just ask us and we will give you some. His mother paused here and his father resumed talking. Did you keep up with what we said until now? Edward asked Mikhail who nodded at his father's inquiry. Natus snickered when he heard the question thinking how the tables had turned. Mikhail's father began talking again after receiving an assurance. Good now listen closely. I will go over the alphabet once. A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z. There are quite a few, right? Now I will go over the alphabet once again, but I will add an example to each letter. A like in Arcanine. B like in Butterfree. C like in Caterpie. K like in Krabby. L like in Lapras. R like in Radon. S like in Stryu. X like in Zetu. Y like in Yanma, Z like in Zubat. Mikhail had a smile while he was listening to his father. It is funny how they had to add Pokemon from Gen 2 to complete the list. Simply because there are no Pokemon starting with some of the letters in Gen 1. There were no Gen 1 Pokemon starting with Q for example. So they used Quileva. Well, there is no differentiation between the generations here because this is not a game. They divide them according to the population distribution. So Beldum is seen as a Hone Pokemon because the biggest known population is here. Finding Hon or Johto Pokemon in Kanto is not unbelievable simply because they are part of the same continent. Arya seeing her son smiling while listening to her husband was feeling content. She was happy that she could experience these moments. After Edward was done, she addressed her son. Now that your daddy has gone through the alphabet again, we will go through it together, okay? I will say a line and you will repeat after me, alright? Mikhail nodded at his mother, who promptly began. A like an Arcanine, Arya would say. A like an Arcanine, Mikhail would repeat. They went through the whole alphabet thrice before his parents seemed to be satisfied. Now that we have gone through the alphabet, you will start your writing exercises. You only have to write the letter A today. This exercise book has a few pages that alternate between capital A and lower case A. We don't want to force you to write too much if you don't want to but it would make us happy if you manage to fill a page for each. We will do the first line together and then you can do the rest on your own. His father said to him. When you want to stop because you think you have written enough or don't feel like it anymore, come to us and we will look over it to make sure everything is fine. Alright, honey. His mother added once he was done. Yes, mommy, I will. Mikhail answered his mother. Afterward, they began his writing exercise. 
Even though Mikhail already knew all of this, he still did the writing exercises as his parents wanted him to. He simply took it as a chance to beautify his handwriting and to train his dexterity. He filled a page for each form of a and gave the exercise book to his parents so they could look over it. They praised him and they did a group hug. His mother showered his cheeks with kisses. Mikhail was happy with the affectionate atmosphere in his family. The rest of the time before Mikhail went to bed, they played memory and his parents read to him some stories from one of the children's books they had. Good night, son. Good night, darling. Sweet dreams. Came from his parents before they left his room. Mikhail felt that everything was great and that even the writing lessons were not too bad with the right motivation. With these positive thoughts, he fell asleep. Chapter 36, CH 13, 36, Sapiens and Space Upgrade. It had been a week since Mikhail had his first mock fight and started his lessons with his parents. Since then they had participated in three more fights. They had held them every two days and his opponents were a Caterpie, a Pidgey, and the same Rattata from their first fight. The fight with the Caterpie went nearly identical to their first one and NATO won it without any problems. The mock fight against the Pidgey was way more difficult. Due to Pidgey's ability, their opening move as it currently was, could not distract it, and NATO couldn't use a gust that was fast and strong enough for his opening move yet, so they were unable to hamper it while it was in the air. Because of this Mikhail told NATO to forego the opening move and they started with the passenger command instead. NATO managed to land a gust before Pidgey reached him but after that, the fight turned more into a boxing match than a Pokemon fight. NATO tried to hit Pidgey with his peck while Pidgey did the same with tackle. Both tried to dodge as well as they could but neither allowed their foe to retreat in case the other tried to use a long-range attack. The training they did to raise NATO's parameters showed its fruits during this slugfest. The Pidgey tired out faster than NATO and Mikhail instructed NATO to retreat and use Gust if he saw a chance to do so. After a successful peck, NATO utilized Pidgey flinching backward to retreat a bit and hit it with a Gust. While they won the fight it was a hard-earned victory and it showed that they needed to expand NATO's move pool. Not only did they have to add new moves but they had to train his old ones some more because NATO took too long to perform them and they had to fall back to Gust too often when they needed a long-range attack. The revenge fight with Rattata ended with NATO winning once more but it was not as easy as their last fight. The Rattata seemed to have trained for this and had managed to learn quick attack, which allowed it to catch up to NATO a few times. It succeeded in landing a few hits but NATO managed to open up the distance every time and at the end, the Rattata fell to NATO's gust. What was great was that just yesterday NATO seemed to have achieved full sapiens. NATO was nearly there before but it seemed these two weeks gave him the last boost he needed. Mikhail did not know if it was because of their strategy and training sessions, their mock fights, or the lessons that Mikhail had to go through that he witnessed but whatever it was NATO went from communicating with emotions and impressions to words. The first word NATO said to Mikhail with his telepathy was idiot. Just as Mikhail was about to smack him NATO added thank you and Mikhail decided to postpone NATO's smackdown. He answered with your welcome bird head. They told his parents the good news but his parents were not as surprised as he predicted them to be. Seeing the look on Mikhail's face his father said. We had expected NATO to reach this point sometime soon because of how much he had progressed since he had come to our house. He was practically able to understand everything we said lately and only him being able to express himself in his own words instead of feelings was missing. They turned to NATO and congratulated him. Congratulations NATO. You managed to achieve that last small but significant step, and we are happy for you. Aside from the mock fights and NATO's sapiens, there were his daily writing lessons. Mikhail decided to use two days as the period it took him to succeed in writing pleasant-looking letters and each writing session took about two hours. He had currently finished with the letter D and would start with A the next time. All this writing practice had helped him to increase the steadiness of his hands, which would be useful for many of the production occupations he was planning to learn later on. He was currently eating his breakfast and the Oran berry he was currently eating was really delicious. Did my parents buy low-quality Oran berries instead of the lowest-quality berries? That did not sound how I intended it to sound like. When I use it like this, it gives the impression that the berries are bad, which they aren't. Let's see. Mikhail used his observability on the berry. Name, Oran berry. Type, plant. Quality, lowest. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition and plant energy. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical recovery. Well, it looks like it was not a low quality berry after all. Damn, now that I had that thought with the quality being misunderstood as bad, I cannot get rid of it. Let's see if I can change the names a bit. I hope that's possible. I mean I can fold and unfold my screen and in the end, it is just a cosmetic change. The meaning stays the same just the wording changes. Mikhail tried to see if he could change the wording of the lines or not. Great it seems it is possible. So what should I change it into? Let's see, instead of quality, I am going to use class. I should change the grades as well, lowest and low make me give off a bad impression to me now. I will use letters to categorize the materials instead. Lowest to F, low to E, mid to D, and so on. Now, let me see how the new status screen looks. Mikhail observed the Oran berry once more. Name, Oran berry. Type, plant. Class, F. Faults, none. Uses, contains nutrition and plant energy. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical recovery. That's much better. Should I change uses to description while I am already at it? Nah, that's okay for now. Mikhail felt satisfied with the result of the change. 
The days went by while Mikhail continued with the mock fights and his writing lesson. He naturally did not forget his own training, be it physical or psychic during this time. Neither did he forget the Caterpie inside his space. He continued to invest some time in them as well even if his main focus was elsewhere for now. It happened during his telekinesis exercise on the sixth day. Mikhail had already increased the number of stones he could levitate to 20 before and he managed to increase the range of his telekinesis to 20 meters thanks to his efforts as well. His current objective was to increase his time to 20 minutes too. His best time, for now, was 19 minutes and 20 seconds and he was really close to his goal. Mikhail knew that this milestone would not help him advance to first class tier 1 psychic because he had felt no inkling of any kind concerning this but he thought his combat capacity would be equal, mid, or, high, iron stage Pokemon and hoped that it would expand the size of his space. Normally, he would train for 90 to 120 minutes, but today he kept going. He tried to reach the 20 minutes until he was exhausted, after which he would try to recover as fast as he could. Finally, nearly 3 hours later he succeeded. He did not hear any breaking or storm sounds after his success, but he did see how his space grew confirming that his strength had taken a step forward. To find out how strong he really was, would require him to challenge either a, mid, or, high, iron stage Pokemon and he did not feel ready yet. Either way, it helped increase the size of his space so that was great. When his space stopped growing it had gone from 2000 SQM to 10.000 SQM in size and this was only his area without adding the habitats of the Pokemon. If he added the 900 SQM from Nato, 1600 SQM from Magikarp and the 600 SQM from Caterpa to the total then the final size was 13.100 SQM. This was not bad and Nato was not far from upgrading his strength as well, so it would increase once more as soon as that happened. Aside from the increase in size, the production rate for non-floral materials increased from 3 to 4. That was not all, the most important change that happened was to the house. Its area increased from 150 SQM to 200 SQM. It looked a bit classier and went from two stories to three stories. The first two stories were still the same just bigger but the third story was another story. There was only a single room on the new third floor, a working space. A working space to make pokeballs to be specific. The room had two working tables as well as all the tools necessary for the production of handmade pokeballs. A drying station for apricorns, a sawing station, an area with brushes and pens of all sizes, an area with all kinds of containers, one for storage, and many other things he needed to produce pokeballs. After he saw the new working space he could barely stop himself from directly trying to make his first pokeball. He had already spent quite some time on his telekinesis and it was time for his father to come home. Mikhail shelved the idea until some time after dinner and went downstairs. Shortly after his father came home and they had dinner. After dinner, Mikhail did his writing exercise and spent some time relaxing with his parents. When it was time for him to sleep, he told Nato to keep an eye out for his parents and entered his space. He looked around the first two floors to see if anything had changed but saw that aside from the size of the rooms everything stayed the same. After confirming the situation of floors 1 and 2, Mikhail went up to the third floor. His eyes started to sparkle as soon as he saw all the tools and working stations. He immediately started going over every single tool and station to see what exactly was available and to see where everything was. He tested everything to check if there were any problems. It wasn't that he didn't trust his space to provide adequate equipment, he just wanted to make sure. Safety first like they say. Once he had been to all stations, seen what was available and where everything was positioned Mikhail decided to check up on the knowledge he had for pokeball making. He knew that all occupations had a starting knowledge pack that he had access to and that he needed to unlock the rest of the knowledge through his efforts. Let's see, there is the sea of knowledge. There is the occupation area and here is the section for pokeball production. Now let me go over the knowledge I already have access to. That's not as much as I expected. Well, it is a large amount of information but most of it is basic and general knowledge that I will need as a foundation, which is why I don't feel too disappointed despite only having the instructions for an equivalent to the standard poke ball. If I had tried to learn all that basic and general knowledge on my own, it would have taken me 3 to 4 years to remember everything and that's if I spend 10 to 12 hours daily on it. Assuming I had access to all that knowledge. So this saved me quite some time because while I haven't internalized the knowledge I have it inside my head and I don't have to be afraid of forgetting anything. Mikhail nodded to himself. He continued talking to himself, like every self-respecting mad scientist and since he was a fake one for now he decided to respect the classic. Let's go over every material I will need for the production of the equivalent to the standard poke ball. Hmm, that's a mouthful. I am going to call it common ball from now on. So first are the apricorns, to make a common ball one needs either white or grey apricorns. It would be better if one used both. The class required of the apricorns is E. F class apricorns cannot be made into poke balls of any kind. The higher the class of the apricorn the higher the class of the produced poke ball. This is important because Pokemon of higher stages can only be captured by Pokeballs of higher classes. Otherwise, they simply break out of the ball even if it manages to absorb them. Most of the time they can't even do that. For example, stage 5 Pokemon would need at least a C-class Pokeballs or better. This is naturally only for new captures, so capturing a weak Pokemon and training it didn't mean the old Pokeball won't work anymore when it reached stage 5. Mikhail nodded happily at this point. 
While I don't have grey apricorns, I do have white apricorns and they are E-class so that's no problem as well. He continued going over what else was needed for the production of poke balls. Chapter 37, CH 14, 37, Preparing for them balls. I have my apricorn, now to be able to turn them into poke balls they have to be dried first. For this, the apricorn has to be cleanly cut in half and then hollowed out. The pulp of the apricorn has to be kept because it is needed during a later process. I have containers just for this purpose. After hollowing the apricorn it has to be dried at a constant temperature and humidity. The drying station in my working space is perfectly suitable for this. After it has dried, it has to be smoothed. Next up comes the blood. Modern poke balls use technology to create the space inside the ball and all its functions but handcrafted poke balls achieve the effect through the materials used during its production and formation slash patterns and symbols painted with a mixture of blood and other substances into its inner walls as well as its surface. I don't know why those patterns and symbols do what they do, yet. Those are the work slash product of another occupation. I only know that ball crafters use them for their effects and that they don't seem to care about why it works, just that it does. As long as they create and maintain the space as well as its other functions most poke ball crafters ignore the why. They only know that they have to be able to apply them cleanly and precisely without any mistakes, the rest is not important for them. Mikhail became contemplative after he went over this. Seems interesting. It appears to be something like the rune casters slash artificers from western fantasy and the formation slash array masters from eastern fantasy stories. I will have to look up that occupation sometime but for now, I have other things to focus on. Mikhail nods to himself. Where was I? Right, the blood. The source of the blood differs depending on what type of ball you are trying to create. Whether the desired class of the ball is possible, depends on the stage of the blood source and the class of the substance used for the mixture. The lowest class a successful ball should have is identical to that of the apricorn used for its production. So, if the apricorn used is E-class, then the resulting poke ball should not be worse than E-class. Producing F-class poke balls is considered as much a failure as being unable to produce a poke ball at all. For E-class poke balls iron stage blood is the minimum requirement but bronze stage blood would be better. For D-class poke balls bronze stage blood is the minimum and silver stage blood would be better. C and B-class balls seem to follow that trend as well but I do not know if it is the same for A-class and higher. For the common ball, the blood of a pure normal type Pokemon is ideal. Dual normal type Pokemon blood is no problem as well and pure water type or pure grass type Pokemon blood can be, reluctantly, used as well, but in that case the failure rate and difficulty increase. Mikhail paused here for a bit. Well, shit. It seems I have to get myself some radatas if I want to practice my ball crafting without making it even harder for myself than it already is. This time I will use some Magi Carp blood. Some of the sidelined ones are at the iron stage, so their blood should do. Now moving on. The mixture also contains materials. Let's see what I need to produce a common ball. If I use pure normal type blood, then adding a single portion of a normal type material together with lepaberry juice is enough. For dual normal type blood two or more portions are needed and for pure grass or water type blood four or more portions are needed. It would be better if varied materials were used instead of a single one. Mikhail nodded at this. Makes sense to me. Okay, that was for the mixture that I needed for the inner walls, and also for the outer surface. The patterns and symbols at the outer surface are what allows the handmade balls to open and close as well as to shrink and expand. Afterward, it needs to be treated, and the apricorn pulp that was kept aside for this. You take the pulp and mix it with oron and lepa berry juice as well as one normal type substance. After mixing them you slowly heat the mixture and use it to glaze the outside of the dried apricorn. This is done to assist the absorption of energy by the poke ball to maintain its functions. The poke ball has to be left to dry again after the treatment. Mikhail looked thoughtful after going through all steps. It actually sounds pretty easy if you simply go over the steps like this, when in actuality it isn't. If you are not careful you can fail at every single step. It takes a great amount of practice and precision to successfully produce a poke ball and the common ball is the simplest of them. I am not afraid of wasting time or materials due to failure but there are warnings inside my knowledge that some of the balls can have dangerous reactions in case of failure. Luckily the common ball simply does not work in case of failure instead of exploding or something like that. Mikhail contemplated his next step. It is not possible to try to craft a common ball today, because the drying of the white apricorn takes between 30 to 36 hours and without the dried apricorn I cannot start. What I can do is preparing all components for the crafting process. The first step is to perform an even cut right at the middle of the apricorn. Mikhail went to a cabinet that had access to the stored berries and apricorn and took out 20 white apricorns that he levitated behind him while walking towards the sawing station. He put them on the table, took out measuring instruments, and started marking all of them in the middle. After he was done with that he levitated the instrument back to their spot. Keeping the working space neat was important after all. He started the saw blade, took one of the apricorns, and began moving the apricorn aiming the marked line at the rotating blade. He fully focused on this task. Keeping his hands steady Mikhail rotated the apricorn completely once while making sure the saw only touched the marked line. He checked to see if the segment was even and to make sure there were no cracks along the cut. Once he saw that he had done a good job he sighed in relief. That took more concentration than I expected but it's a good start. 
It would be awesome if I managed to cut all 20 apricorns like this, but 15 would be considered a job well done already. He put the two halves on a tray for successful cuts and took the next apricorn. Mikhail did not manage to succeed with all 20 apricorns. Hell, he did not even manage to succeed with 15. He ended up with 9 successful cuts and it took him more than an hour to finish with all apricorns. His first failure was because he couldn't keep his hands steady any longer, so he started taking short breaks between cuts to relax his hands and mind. Of the 11 failures, 2 were because his hands twitched and completely ruined the cut. 4 were turned out uneven and 5 of them had small cracks along the cut, which probably happened due to him trembling a bit at some point or something like that. The failures were put on a separate tray as well, Mikhail did not plan to throw them away. No, he was going to use them as fodder. There was no reason to waste them when they were still perfectly edible. Since he felt that 9 wasn't enough, he decided to keep going until he had 12 successful pieces. Another 2 apricorns were wasted but he achieved his goal. Mikhail put away the tray with his failures and focused on the tray with his successes. He took a specialized scooping spoon in one hand, one half of an apricorn in the other, and started to carefully hollow it out. Since the shell wasn't allowed to be damaged, he did it slowly. It took him nearly 40 minutes to finish with them all, and he only needed to replace an apricorn with a new one a single time. One of the halves got damaged and he had to replace the whole thing, so he had to cut another apricorn to use as a replacement. The pulp he removed was put in a container that was kept ready for this purpose. A high-pressure water cleaner was used to clean the scoop and he put it back to its spot. Mikhail also cleaned the saw blade before he focused back on the tray with the now hollow apricorns. Afterward, he levitated the tray to the drying station where it was put into a specialized heater. He adjusted the temperature and humidity inside the heater to the necessary setting. Now the only thing left to do with the apricorns was to wait for them to dry. He returned to the container with the pulp to begin preparing the mixture he was going to glaze the dried apricorn with. I need oran berry and leppa berry juice as well as a normal type material to create the mixture. I should start with the berries. Mikhail took out 12 oran berries as well as 12 leppa berries and squeezed out their juice into a container. The leftovers from the berries were added to the fodder tray. After that, he took out 4 portions of raw normal gemstone and ground it up. He took the apricorn pulp and mashed it before he mixed the berry juice as well as the normal gemstone powder into it. The resulting mixture was deposited into a new container, while the old ones were cleaned and returned to their places. The heating step would have to wait until the apricorns were ready to be glazed so he took the container with the mixture and placed it into a storage area where it would stay fresh. I have the pulp mixture ready so only the blood mixture is left. I currently don't have any pure or dual normal type blood, so I will have to use magi carp blood instead. According to the knowledge, I will have to use four portions of normal type material to offset this and it would be better if the portions came from different materials. Mikhail became pensive at this. I don't have so many different kinds of normal type materials, I have only one, and using so many portions to offset the usage of water type Pokemon blood seems to be a waste. I still have to wait for more than a day for the apricorns to dry. I am sure I can either politely invite a Rattata into my space or find another way to get my hands on enough Rattata blood during this time. I could try to exchange the remains of a Rattata from one of the fights that keep happening. Naturally, that is only possible if the winner doesn't want to eat it. Alternatively, I could wait until the winner left and take the carcass for free. This alternative is not only cheaper but also safer because I won't have to approach a Pokemon that just fought to the death. He nodded to himself, satisfied with his new plan. That's what I will do. Rattata blood will result in a better mixture and I won't have to waste my materials. There is nothing left I can do right now and I have already spent more than 3 hours doing all this. It is high time for me to sleep. He made sure once more that everything was clean and tidy before he left his space, thanked Nato for keeping a lookout, and went to sleep. Chapter 38, CH 15, 38, Blood Merchant and Second Experiment the next morning right after his breakfast Mikhail made his way to the northern area to collect the blood he lacked for his ball crafting. He required about 150 ml of blood per common ball, which meant that he needed 1800 ml slash 1.8 l of blood for his 12 apricorns. This meant his previous thoughts were a bit idealistic because even if he drained a ratata of its whole blood, he would only gain about 300 to 350 ml. It would take him 6 ratatas to accomplish his goal if he did it like that but if he decided to exchange the blood from living ratatas he would need much more. Mikhail guessed that he could only take 30 ml of blood per Pokemon without harming them. A 10% blood loss should be safe and in this case, he would need to trade with 60 Rattata to accomplish his goal. In the end, he elected to do both. He couldn't be sure that he would find enough Rattata carcasses that he could take or trade for, so he decided to exchange as much blood as he could while keeping an eye out for them. It would be better if he managed to gather more than the required amount, to keep some for the next batch as well. So began Mikhail's career as the blood merchant, just kidding, or was he? He spent the next three hours exchanging blood for berries and taking slash trading as many ratata bodies as he could. In the end, he had traded with 52 ratatas and gained 2075 ml of blood from them. He had started with 30 ml as he had planned to and after three trades he noticed that the ratatas felt nothing from losing 30 ml, so he increased the volume to 35 ml. Another three trades later he noted the same for 35 ml and increased the trade volume to 40 ml. 
He did not increase the blood amount even after he saw that the Rattata were still fine, because he felt that he was near the limit of what they could take. He gave all Rattata two Oran berries to eat directly to help with the blood loss as well as one citrus, lepa, and lump berries respectively for later. The tool, needle, he used to draw the blood came from his space and came with his working space. Aside from the blood, he traded for, he managed to get his hands on five Rattata carcasses that he stored for later. Three of those, he simply waited for the killer to leave, and for the other two, he traded with the killer. The cases where he traded for the corpses were when the killer was a caterpie. To prevent his tail from seeing him vanishing a corpse he used his telekinesis to take them from a distance. Mikhail now had enough blood for not only this batch of apricorns but also another batch of the same size, so he went home. Once he was home, he greeted his mother and went to his room, where he asked Nato to be his lookout before he entered his space. He wanted to prepare the blood mixture he was going to need tomorrow. He squeezed 12 lepa berries for their juices and mixed them with 12 portions of ground normal gemstone. Afterward, he added 1,800 ml ratata blood and blend the mixture once more. He put away the finished product and cleaned his working area. Now everything is ready for my first ever ball crafting session. As soon as the apricorns finish drying out tomorrow at noon I can begin. He thought about what he could do until then. It has been some time since my first magi carp experiment and I have gathered some more materials since then. I could try to see if one of the magi carp reacts to any of them. Having made up his mind he took 10 samples of all new materials. He left 5 of the samples as is, and 5 were ground up, having decided that these two forms were enough. After he was done with his preparation Mikhail went downstairs and settled on the entrance of his house, because he wanted to watch his space while doing his experiment. He separated the magi carp inside his marine subspace. Once that was done, he released the two different sample forms near each magi carp to see if any of them reacted. He repeated that process until all magi carp had been presented with all available samples once. To his utter surprise, one of the magi carp reacted to one of the materials. It was a female with deep yellow potential. The chances of him finding a magi carp that possessed a noticeable affinity to an additional element among the five magi carp he had sidelined was extremely unlikely, but it still happened. The fact that the material that triggered her reaction was the dragon lily, a dragon-type material, put the probability to another dimension. Unbelievable, right? Mikhail had done this experiment without any expectations, simply because he did not believe that he would gain any results without a respectable specimen size. Lady Luck seemed to have disagreed with his conclusion, but in this case, being mistaken did not make him feel disappointed at all. It was like he won the lottery with only the second ticket he bought. He couldn't control himself and started his duckling dance. There was no one around to witness it anyway. He had no idea that his female caterpie was resting on one of the trees near his house and had witnessed the whole thing. Once he calmed down sufficiently Mikhail began thinking about what this discovery meant for his short-term future. Now that this magi carp turned out to be useful, I can't keep her inside my subspace anymore. At least not if I want her to gain sapiens, since everything staying inside the subspace is prevented from gaining sapiens. Her okayish potential can be rectified through sufficient supplements and training. Once he reached that decision he promptly transferred her from his subspace back to his main space. He was amused by the collective reaction that followed. They all seemed surprised by her sudden appearance and she seemed surprised to once again see so many other magi carps. Now it's time to decide what I am going to do with the other four magi carp. There are still a few elements I have not tested yet but I don't know when I will find a material of that element. So I either wait for an undetermined amount of time or I use them for another experiment. Since I have found one specimen that fulfilled the requirement for my experiment I can use the others as a comparative value. I will choose four elements and feed supplements of those types to the four magi carps. Then I will observe what kind of influence they have when taken by Pokemon without a corresponding affinity and compare the results with the magi carp that has a dragon type affinity. Absorption speed, speed, and degree of change, as well as all other consequences, will be observed, documented, and compared. Mikhail began pondering on which four types to choose for his experiment. The four types I could test that I am the most interested in are fire, poison, grass, and ghost, but I don't believe that anything good will happen if one tries to use a ghost type material without a corresponding affinity. The aim of my experiment is not to simply kill or torture the specimen, so I will substitute ghost with air. Wait a minute, if I want to do a comparison it would be better if I fed one of the four magi carp with the dragon lily as well to see how a magi carp without an affinity reacts to it. How did I overlook something so obvious? So the four types are going to be fire, poison, plant, and dragon. As for why poison is okay but ghost isn't, the answer is simple. I believe I can handle the possible consequences of using poison but I have no such confidence about the ghost type. Mikhail went back inside to prepare the first dose of the supplements he was going to use for his experiment. He decided to use his working space for this because he did not want to use the kitchen outside of cooking. Simply grounding slash mashing the material and mixing it with an oron and lepa berry should be enough. I can use the remains from the squeezed berries for this, at least for the four side specimens. Let's see. For the fire type, I will use the crimson flower. He took five of the ground crimson flowers he used during the experiment and put them inside a bowl. Then he took five oron as well as five lepa berries from the container that held the squeezed berries and added them to the bowl too. Afterward, he mashed all of it before he divided the mix into five portions that he placed on a tray. 
Next is poison and for that, I am going to use the purple lily. Mikhail duplicated the previous process and placed the resulting five portions on the tray as well. He did the same with the vibrant petunia that he chose for the grass type. The portions with the dragon lily that were going to be fed to a magi carp without the related affinity were prepared like that as well. Now I am going to put the tray into the heater so that they can dry for about 30 minutes. Once they are dry I will feed one portion to a magi carp every day. If it turns out that the energy is too potent for them, I will use F-class material instead of the E-class ones I am using right now. Otherwise, I will make more of the same. He nodded satisfied with himself. This leaves, the portion for the magi carp with dragon type affinity. Hmm, that's quite a mouthful, so I'll call it Magidraco for now. Anyway, for Magidraco I am going to use fresh berries instead of squeezed ones and put them together with the dragon lily into the mixer. A dragon shake so to say. Once all supplements were ready, Mikhail sent one of the dried bits respectively to one magi carp. The one with yellow potential got the poison chip. After he saw that they had all eaten their chip he took one of the bottles with dragon shake and went down to the lake. He used his control over his space to create a current that brought Magidraco towards him. She was helped surface for a bit leaving her upper body outside the water near enough for him to reach her. He used his telepathy to transfer feelings of assurance and calmness towards her to prevent her from further panicking. Her involuntary swim having frightened her a bit. Everything is alright. You're not going to get hurt. I only want to feed you something. He showed her the bottle and she perked up seeing something to eat. Once he saw that she was calm and that he could feed her, Mikhail tipped the bottle towards Magidraco's mouth while using his telekinesis to make sure nothing got wasted. There, we're done. You can go back now. While he knew that she could not really understand what he was saying, he was sure she got the gist of it. Mikhail saw her swimming away and left his space. He spent the rest of the day at home, spending time with his parents. Naturally, he did not forget to keep an eye on the Magi Carp while he was keeping his parents company. All Magi Carp showed no visible reaction, be it positive or negative, towards the supplement except for one. Both the fact that the others showed no reaction for now and that the Magi Carp that was fed with the poison chip got poisoned was not unexpected. Mikhail gave the poisoned one a Pecha Berry after observing him for a while. He planned to use up the leftover four portions and keep giving him Pecha Berries after some time to see if he would get used to the doses. While he did not expect the Magi Carp to successfully get used to them one could never know. In case the dose was still too much after 5 days he would make the next batch of poison chips with F-class purple lilies instead of E-class ones. He just needed to plant a batch just in case it was needed, which he promptly did. They would finish growing before his current supply was used up. Compared to the 4 E-class materials that his space could currently produce per week, its production capacity for the same material at F-class was 10 per week. He went to bed that night excited to start ball crafting because pokeballs would allow him to form artificial bonds with pokemons that he did not want to invest the time it normally takes to form a real bond. This way he could still see their full status screen from the get-go. Chapter 39, CH 16, 39, First Time Ball Crafting The next morning Mikhail spent the time after breakfast until around 1pm in the living room with his mother. Well, it was more like she did her chores while he played around and did writing exercises. At least they were in the same room, right? Once the drying duration was up, he retreated to his room, where he once again asked Nato to be his lookout. Before he entered his space he gave Nato some berries to eat. After he entered his space he went to his working room and checked the apricorns to make sure they were ready to be used. The drying process seems to have gone without a hitch. No tears or cracks formed due to the drying and the texture of the apricorns is suitable as well. He used his telekinesis to levitate the tray towards the table with multiple brushes, while he went over to the cabinet that contained the mixtures. He brought the blood mixtures over to the table as well and sat down while glancing at everything at the table. I think I am going to call the blood mixture blooding from now on because it simply sounds better. Next comes the most important step, to use the blood ink to paint the patterns and symbols on the inner and outer side of the apricorn shell. Now that I am sitting here, I feel kind of dumb for not practicing the strokes on paper before. While it wouldn't have been the same, because doing it on flat paper and doing it on a curved surface is not the same, it still would have been helpful. The width of the lines has to be precise and the thickness of the lines is not uniform. Some parts have to be thin, some have to be thick, and so on. Not only that even the distances between lines, patterns, and symbols as well as their positions are important. In short, the error margin is small and the failure rate high. At least I can still remove the blood from the shell and retry it if the blood ink has not dried yet in case I notice something wrong. If the blood has dried removing it without leaving any stains becomes much harder but it is still possible. But once I apply the glaze to the outside of the shell any chance of reusing the apricorn flies out of the window because it becomes impossible to remove the blood ink. In that case, if it turns out I did something wrong then the whole apricorn becomes useless. Mikhail showed a resolute face, that would make whoever saw him acting like this think he was deciding the fate of the world instead of making some decisions regarding ball crafting. I will add some drawing sessions to my schedule, twice or thrice a week should be good enough. Now that I have already reached this step I won't back down. The worst that can happen is that I waste some materials. I just have to be more careful while applying the blood ink. Here slow and steady wins the race. If I notice a mistake somewhere along the line, the ink in some places would have probably already dried because of my slow pace, but I can still try to remove it to reuse the apricot. 
The same applies if I spot a mistake during my check after I finish applying the ink. I will naturally check the patterns and symbols every time I am done with drawing them not only to see if they were done correctly but also to check if their position and distance to each other are precise. Better repeatedly find mistakes and having to redo them, if the ink removal is successful then to apply the glaze and having to throw them away after the common ball does not work because of said mistakes. Mikhail put enough of the blood ink for one try into a small bowl, then he took the upper part of the shell into his left hand and one of the thin brushes into his right hand. He scrutinized the shell for a bit before he dipped the tip of the brush into the blood ink. After he got rid of the surplus of ink he started drawing the first symbol on the top of the inner wall of the upper shell. The symbol represented Dialga, and he was grateful that it looked like those shadows that only showed the form but no details. Thankfully, one only needed to be careful and precise to do this and no drawing talent was necessary. After drawing the symbol one had to write time with the unknown alphabet to the left of it in a light curve. Afterward came some symbols that were hard to describe and words like synchronize, attract, store, maintain, support, and recall as well the unknown characters for N, E, and U. Well, everything looks fine to me. He checked over everything once more before he put the upper shell down and took the lower part of the shell into his hand. He started drawing the symbols for the lower part. On the bottom came a symbol that represented Pakia and the word space was written to its left. After that came some more symbols and words like stable, bond, energy, blood, minimize, and release as well the unknown characters for T, R, A, and L. These characters had to be positioned so that they would seamlessly fit with the characters of the upper part. This was not only the case for them but also some of the other lines and symbols especially for the symbol opposite of the word neutral that represented Regigigas. Apparently, at least one legendary Pokemon of the type the ball used would be added as a symbol. Once he was done with the lower shell he carefully looked over both parts once more but couldn't find anything that seemed wrong. He waited for another 15 minutes to let the ink dry some more. He used that time to go over everything a few more times. Finding nothing wrong, he started drawing the necessary symbols, lines, and words on the outer surface. There were only two symbols on the outer surface, one on the right side near the cut and one on the left side near the cut. Every shell part had half of the symbol and combined they completed them. The words upper, lower, inner, outer, connect, shrink, enlarge, contact, and capture were the most important ones. The words were connected by lines and circled the two symbols. The symbol on the right was responsible for connecting and keeping the two shell parts together, while the left part was responsible for owner registration as well as Pokemon recall and release. Mikhail looked over everything twice more after he had drawn everything. He could not spot any obvious errors and decided to try his luck. Who knows maybe I will have some beginner's luck and succeed on my first try. Either way, I want to do the whole process of crafting a pokeball at least once before I start going all critical on the crafting process. There is no way to know when I will manage to do the whole process again because it could take me some time to be satisfied with the inking step. He left the two shell part in special holders to let them dry without touching anything that could smear the ink while he took the container with the pulp mixture to the heating station. There he slowly heated the mixture up until it became a viscous liquid. This took about 40 minutes because he had to keep stirring it and he couldn't increase the heat too much. Once he was done with the heating he went back to the drying shells. He examined if they had sufficiently dried or if he had to wait some more. The reason why he had not used the heater to dry the blood ink was that natural drying had a higher success rate than accelerated drying. It turned out the ink had completely dried so he could apply the glaze. Mikhail took the brush for this occasion and dipped it into his viscous liquid. Once he had done so he evenly applied the liquid on the outer surface of both shells. Afterward, he left them on two holders, which only came into touch with the inner wall, so that the glaze could dry. It took another hour for it to dry, which he used to check up on his cater pies. The last step was to align both parts correctly. There were three possible outcomes for this. The first outcome, the two parts did not stay connected, which meant that he had made a mistake at the outer surface. The second possible outcome was that the two parts stayed connected but the ball could not be used, which meant he had made a mistake at the inner surface. The third possible outcome was that he succeeded. Mikhail obviously hoped for the third outcome to happen. He took both shell halves and carefully aligned them to each other. He released one of his hands from the ball and turned the hand that was holding the ball to see if the two parts would stay connected. Unfortunately, that did not happen as the part he was not gripping fell off signaling his failure. Mikhail sighed for a bit but did not seem too surprised. Well, what can I say? If it was easy everyone would be doing it. It seems I will have to perfectly follow all the guidelines and steps regardless of how much they prolong the crafting process until I reach a certain familiarity with the process. Doing everything with the same brush may be possible but it seems to be too advanced for me. It looks like I will have to use various kinds of brushes during the drawing process. I think I will train my brushwork for a while before my next attempt. This whole thing took about 4 hours and I don't want to expend that much time before I think I made some progress. He cleaned up everything and threw away his failed product while having a slightly sad expression. He decided to shelf his ball crafting plans until he made some progress with his drawing and brushwork and focus back on his previous mock fighting plans. Before he had unlocked his ball crafting working space Mikhail had planned to focus his training on his female Caterpie. He planned to prepare and train her for about a week as he did with Natu before starting with the mock fights. He could follow the progress of his second experiment while doing that, so the two did not interfere with each other. 
Having come to a decision Mikhail left his space. He had been here for more than four hours and it was time to show his face to his mother. The training had to start tomorrow either way because it was too late to begin today. He spent the rest of the day by the side of his parents having some quality family time, which meant playing and watching TV together. When it was time for him to sleep, he decided to check up on the female caterpie's status to prepare for tomorrow. He wanted to see the progress she had made. Species, caterpie. Gender, female. Type, bug. Potential, blue, 18.6%. Parameters. Stage, iron stage, low. Vitality, H-G. Strength, H. Endurance, H. Agility, H-G. Energy capacity, I. Energy density, I. Resistance, grass, minor. Fighting, minor, ground, minor. Weaknesses, fire, minor, air, minor, rock, minor. Condition, healthy, content. Masteries, bug e-manipulation, novice. Techniques, tackle, novice, string shot, proficient, bug bite, novice, dash, beginner, electroabe, initial, dash, novice, confusion, dash, initial. She made some progress in her parameters, which is good. Especially the increase in agility. She also made progress with her moves. String shot and electroabe are going to be the pillars of our fighting style for now but the improvement in bug bite is good as well, this way she has something useful for close combat. I'll go over what she has to do with her tomorrow. Time for me to sleep. I have a full schedule and I need all the rest I can get. With that thought, Mikhail drifted off to sleep. Chapter 40, CH 17, 40, Choosing a Name and Battle Preparations The first thing Mikhail did after waking up the next day was to speak with his female Caterpie. He told her that he planned to go through a preparation week with her before they would start holding mock fights, just as he did with Nata before. He knew that Nata chatted with her because he had seen them talking quite often when Nata entered his space, which he still did semi-regularly. After all, the environment there was better than the one outside. Since he was intending to focus on her training for the next week he was not planning to do it inside his space, because that would mean that he would disappear for many hours every day and something like that was simply comparable to tickling Murphy. The probability of something going wrong was too high, because of this he was going to repeat with her what he did with Natu. Mikhail was going to go towards the northern area near their house and let her out somewhere near him. Since he had been approaching all the Pokemon he could, with Caterpie and Rattata being the frequent candidates, it would not look suspicious if he approached her as well. The rest was simple, at least he thought so. He was going to talk to her and then take her home. When his parents asked why he wanted her, he would say that they had met multiple times while he was exploring after which they started to like each other, so he asked if she wanted to go with him and she had agreed. That's the plan. Are you okay with it? Mikhail asked the female Caterpie after he was done with his explanation. Caterpie seemed pretty happy with what she had heard and rapidly nodded, which looked really cute especially her big glistening eyes that were shining because of her excitement. Great. Either my parents are going to ask their Butterfreeze to talk to you or they will do it themselves. In that case, you only have to tell them that we met a few times and that I fed you some berries. You will use that as the reason for your interest in coming with me, food, and liking my gentle behavior. That should convince them and prevent any further digging. Caterpie nodded once more and Mikhail satisfied with her response proceeded with his plan. After breakfast, he left their house towards the northern area. Once there, he released Caterpie as soon as he saw a good opportunity to do so. He then walked towards her and started a conversation. Caterpie after this bit is over you can finally live with me in my house in an open manner and I won't have to hide you. Caterpie nodded happily while she agreed with him. Pie I, Caterpie. He chuckled a bit, seeing her reaction and continued. Caterpie how do you feel about me giving you a name? I already talked with Nato about this topic but he refused my offer saying that he was not interested for now. A name would help distinguish you from all other Caterpie and show that you are special. How about it, do you agree or do you want to think about it? He asked her while pointing at Nato who was sitting on his head. Caterpie seemed to ponder about it for a bit before she agreed. Mikhail himself was thinking about Caterpie's startling intelligence, while she was not sapient yet she was much more intelligent than any Caterpie should be during her age or strength. There are three reasons I can think of that could explain her advanced intelligence. First is her Shinnik affinity. No matter how small it is it could explain why she progressed faster than others of her species. The second one is the bond between us. Either the bond itself or my psychic energy could be influencing her. The third one could be her high potential. This is the one I am the most uncertain of, but personally, I think that one of the reasons alone is not enough to justify such a huge difference. Bug types generally attain sapiens between the, high, silver and, mid, gold stage. Caterpie and Metapod normally reach that point when they are at the, high, silver stage, while Butterfree does so at the, low, silver stage, despite this she shows such intelligence already. From her behavior, I can guess that she will probably attain full sapience in a few months at the latest and her strength will most likely be either at the, high, iron stage or, low, bronze stage at that time. It is most likely all the above reasons that lead to such a drastic shift. Alright, since you agreed I will cite some names and you will tell me what you think. Ready. Pyene. Caterpie expressed her readiness. Okay, then I'll begin. How about Liberty? She shook her head. Jade. She shook her head once more. Bell, Lily, Mitsu. They all got rejected as well. What about Mothra? Pai 8th. 
The newly dubbed Mothra was rapidly nodding her head. Mothra it is. Well, now that we have chosen your name it's time to go home. He bent down and took Mothra into his arms, hugging her. Afterward, he walked back home. Mikhail saw how one of the two Butterfree that kept an eye on him this time around flew ahead most likely to warn his parents about Mothra while the other Butterfree simply kept following him from a distance. My lovely little boy, I was going to give you a surprise after you returned but it looks like you wanted to surprise me as well. Mikhail, honey, can you please tell me why you brought a Caterpie home? His mother was already waiting for him at the entrance when he reached their home and addressed him before he could speak. Hello, mommy. This is Mothra. I met her a few times when I was exploring. I kept feeding her and petting her. I met her today again and asked her to come with me. And she agreed. We even found a name for her before coming home. Isn't she awesome? Mikhail explained while holding up Mothra. Yes, she is beautiful but my sweet boy shouldn't you ask us for permission first before bringing anyone home. The last time we reprimand you, or say anything about it, but you shouldn't promise others that they can stay with us without asking for our permission first. What happens if we don't allow you to keep them at home but you already promised them that they could? That would turn you into a liar. Arya answered him with a stern tone while stroking Mothra a bit. Mikhail hearing his mother's reprimand and tone looked down before he replied to her. I understand and I am sorry. I should have asked you first. But mommy, sniff does that mean Mothra can't stay with us? Mikhail looked up with a disappointed face, his eyes enlarged and slightly wet. Caterpie cleverly cooperated with him and looked sadly towards his mother as well, when she heard his question. Arya could not withstand their double mental assault, and gave in, but she still issued another warning. Sigh. No, she can stay. But, from now on you have to ask for permission first before you go around promising others anything. Okay. Thank you, mommy. I promise I will ask first next time. Mikhail, who heard his mother's answer put Mothra down, rushed to his mother, and hugged her while repeatedly saying thank you. Caterpie joined their hug by climbing up Mikhail's legs. Arya chuckled when she heard him. You already seem to be sure that there is going to be a next time. Just don't forget your promise, okay? I won't. Mikhail assured her, before asking. Mommy you said you had a surprise for me. What is it? Arya who remembered that she had not told him anything yet answered him. Two friends, your father, and I met during our journey are going to visit us this weekend. They are Pokemon trainers as well and they are married just like us. They have a daughter that is only one year older than you, so you can play with her when they visit. Mikhail focused on the first part of his mother's sentence. They are trainers too. Will they bring their Pokemon? Can I see them when they come? Arya softly laughed at his enthusiasm. Yes, they will most likely bring some of their Pokemon with them. I don't know if they would be willing to show you their Pokemon. You will have to ask them yourself. I am sure their daughter would be willing to help you persuade her parents if you ask nice enough. Mikhail's eyes gleamed for a bit before he raised a question. What are their names? His mother chuckled a bit before she replied to his question. The father and mother are called Thorn and Lily respectively. The name of their daughter is Rose. Mikhail had to laugh a bit as well when he heard their names and said. That's funny. To which his mother replied. Yes, it is, my smart boy. She talked to him some more before she went back inside after telling him that his father was probably going to talk to him about Caterpie as well. After his mother left, Mikhail went to the same place he had trained Natu. Once there he focused on Mothra. Mothra we're going to have to stay a bit low-key today, so we won't do any active practice but I will tell you what I want you to do during a fight, okay? Mothra nodded to his question and Mikhail continued. I already said this to Nato and the same applies to you as well. Our strategies are limited by the moves you currently know however there are still things we can do with what you have. You are not the most mobile Pokemon and while I do have an idea how to solve that, this fact stays true so your battle plan is going to be quite different from Nato's. Until you manage a proper confusion your best damaging move is Bug Bite, but that does not mean that it is the focus of our strategy. The focuses of our strategy are String Shot and Electro Abe, because the plan is to immobilize the opponent, and once he is unable to resist taking him out. Electro Abe is to paralyze the foe as well as hinder his movements and inflict some damage. String Shot has multiple uses. It can be used to help you dodge attacks as well as increase your mobility by pulling yourself towards something your string is stuck to, like a tree or a boulder, and by swinging around. This is much faster than your regular speed but you still have to dodge the normal way if you have no other choice. Besides that, it can be used to trap your foe, hinder its movements, slow it down, and to tie it up. For that to happen we have to focus on four of the aspects of your string shot. It's durability, elasticity, stickiness, and capacity. The durability is to ensure the string does not tear while in use. The elasticity is necessary if you want to pull yourself towards something or to swing around. The stickiness will hinder the movements of the foe as well as trap it in place. The capacity is very important because it determines how often you can use your move. So, in short use String Shot to dodge and move around fast. Use String Shot and Electro Abe to immobilize the foe and lastly use Electro Abe and mostly Bug Bite to damage and beat the foe. Did you get all that? Do you need me to repeat it? Mothra, who had been seriously listening to everything Mikhail had said expressed her understanding. Pi I. Cater. Pi. Mikhail understood that she said something along the line of no problem, leave it to me. He was once more marveling at her high intelligence, having expected to have to explain it a few times before she understood it. That's amazing. 
We are naturally going to go over each maneuver and each scenario that I can imagine, and what you have to do in those cases, but those are going to be your main tools. We are going to polish those moves while going over their use. You're going to be awesome, Mothra. The strongest Caterpie ever. Caterpie looked fired up to the limit and enthusiastically nodded to his words. Meanwhile, Mikhail focused on Nato who had been quietly listening on the side. Don't think you get to slack off during that time. I want you to focus on your physical training exercises while I am training Mothra. Sigh. All right. Nato reluctantly agreed, a bit sad that he did not get to laze around while they were training. After that Mikhail stood up took Mothra and went inside their house. He spent the time until his father came home in the living room, doing his writing exercise and playing with his Pokemon and mother. Once his father came home and his mother told him about the situation with Caterpie, Mikhail had to endure another short lecture from his father about getting permission first. After he was done with his lecture he congratulated him for his new partner and they ate dinner. During the rest of the day, they watched a movie and his parents told him some of the things they experienced with their flower-themed friends that were going to visit in three days. Mikhail went to bed that night with Caterpie right next to him. Chapter 41, CH 18, 41, Some Training and Visitors During the next three days, Mikhail's main focus was on Caterpie's training. He made String Shot her primary focus and Electroave her second priority. The first part of the training for both moves was to shorten the time it took to execute them even further. They did this for 45 minutes at the beginning of every session, 30 minutes for String Shot, and 15 minutes for Electroave. This also doubled as a capacity-increasing exercise, since the repeated use allowed her to produce more string. He had already made her do this before, but he wanted to reduce the time it took her to perform the moves to one second. At least this was his requirement for string shot, as for Electroabe he would be satisfied if she managed to do it in less than two seconds. Naturally, he would be even happier if Mothra managed to perform Electroabe in one second as well. Mikhail gave her a 15-minute break before they began the second part. During the second part, he had her improve the elasticity of her strings first for about 25 minutes, then he made her focus on the hardness of her strings for 25 minutes, before she had to enhance their stickiness for another 25 minutes. They had 5-minute breaks during each change to give her time to rest for a bit. The third part was to increase the strength of Electroabe, which they did for 20 minutes. After a 10-minute rest, they began the fourth part, which was to use String Shot to move around. Mothra would use the move to pull herself towards trees. He told her she should use her strings to swing around and that she could change directions mid-swing by using another string shot to pull herself towards something different. This would allow her to be really mobile, especially if she managed to use her sticky strings to coat the ground as he planned her to, which would at least slow her opponents down if not outright trap them. They did the fourth part for about an hour and took a 15-minute break before beginning with the final part, which was a repeat of the first part. During the last part, they spent another 45 minutes reducing the execution time of the moves. All this took around 5 hours, which was more than enough since he did not want to overwork Mothra or make her lose her enthusiasm by overdoing it. Besides Caterpie's training, he did not forget his other projects and tasks. He kept feeding the Magi Carps their supplements and he had to produce a second batch of them today since the first batch was only sufficient for 5 days. Unfortunately, the poison type specimen did not manage to get accustomed to the dose till the end and Mikhail had to use a F-class purple lily for the second batch. The others did not show any obvious change yet, but Mikhail thought this was normal since the experiment started only six days ago. His own training had progressed as well, this time it was not his telekinesis that improved but his telepathy. He now could transfer words instead of emotions and sounds. Unfortunately, he could not properly listen to the thoughts of others yet. The best he could manage at the moment was hearing individual words if the target thinks really hard about something, but he believed that he would get better with training. His skill would allow him to enter the mind of others however he liked in the future just as it did for a certain bald man and Mikhail had more than enough time to reach that level even if it took a huge amount of training. For now, every step forward was progress towards that goal, which was the reason why he was happy about all improvements no matter how small. During these three days, Nato had kept up his physical training like he had asked him to and today towards the end of the training session Nato had finally reached, mid, iron stage. Species, Nato. Gender, male. Type, psychic, flying slash air. Potential, green, 26.5%. Parameters. Stage, iron stage, mid. Vitality, H-G. Strength, G-F. Endurance, G-F. Agility, F. Energy capacity, G-F. Energy density, H-G. Condition, healthy, tired, happy. Techniques, leer, novice, peck, beginner, nightshade, novice, dash, beginner, stored power, beginner, gust, proficient. He had used the Firo's beak as Nata's new supplement and kept up the massage, which had helped the percentage of his potential reach 26.5 but the effectiveness of the beak fell below 1% during this time and the effectiveness of the lotion got reduced as well. Besides that the physical training helped him increase most of his parameters to F, bringing his average to F as well which classified him as mid-grade. The boost of Nightshade is a pleasant surprise because Nato only trained in it for a bit but it still improved. Congratulations on reaching the, mid, iron stage Nato. All your training paid off. I am going to give you an all-you-can-eat berry buffet inside the space tonight. 
Nada chirped happily at his words before he focused on Caterpie who congratulated him as well. After a bit, he turned to Mikhail and said to him per telepathy, We are going to eat until we are on the verge of exploding. Mothra agreed from below and Mikhail simply agreed. Sure, no problem both of you worked hard and have earned a reward. Anyway, we need to go back inside and get cleaned up. My mother said that their friends are going to arrive shortly before dinner and she wants us all to be presentable by then. His Pokemon expressed their understanding and he continued. It seems they are going to stay overnight as well and the whole next day, that means no training tomorrow. Nato and Mothra started cheering when Mikhail said that. He simply shrugged and let them cheer while he bent down, took Mothra into his arms, and began to walk inside. Once he was inside his mother ushered him to the bath, where not only Mikhail but his Pokemon were washed as well. He spent the next hour relaxing with his parents in the living room until they heard the doorbell ring. His mother went to open the door and his father stood up as well to greet their guests. She returned with three people following her, two adults, and a child. His father went forward and they all hugged each other while exchanging greetings. Once they were done, his mother faced him and started the introductions. Mikhail, these are Lilyfield and Thornfield friends we met during our trainer journey. She waved her hands towards the person she was mentioning while introducing them. Lilyfield had a slim figure with pretty good curves. She looked like someone in her early 20s but here on Terra that did not clarify much. Nevertheless, since she was a friend of his parents he did not think that there was more than a 5 to 10 years difference between them. She had white skin, shoulder-length blonde hair, green eyes, and a pretty face. He estimated her height to be around 1.73 m, a bit larger than his mother. Overall he would give her a 9 tenths. Thornfield seemed to be the same height as Mikhail's father at 1.79 m. He had white skin, red hair, brown eyes, and a relatively handsome face. He looked the same age as his wife and had a good physique. He ignored their clothes because the only thing he could tell was that they were of good quality. The only noteworthy piece was what looked like a trainer belt for poke balls. Arya continued while he was checking out their guests. The little lady beside them is their daughter, Rose. Rose is a bit more than one year older than you, so I am sure you will become good friends. Rosefield was a petite little thing. He estimated her height to be around 105 cms. She looked really cute with her rosy cheeks. She had white skin, strawberry blonde hair, green eyes. Her posture seemed to radiate shyness. Lily, Thorn, Rose. This is our son, Mikhail. Arya introduced him while he was checking out Rose. Nice to meet you. Welcome to our home. Mikhail greeted them when he was introduced. Lily approached him and pinched his cheeks. What a cute little boy you are. I am sure you and our little princess are going to be great friends. She is a bit shy when meeting new people but I believe that will be no problem. Mikhail's cheeks reddened a bit, if that happened because she squeezed his cheeks or because she called him a little boy will be left to everyone's imagination. I am sure they will get along just fine. Mikhail, here, looks like a fine boy, came from Thorn who walked in front of him together with Rose and ruffled his hair. N.I., nice to meet you. I am Rose. I like Vulpix and I hope, hope we become friends. Rose started introducing herself under the silent encouragement of her parents. Mikhail, who felt the stare of his mother's eyes at the back of his head knew he had to answer. Nice to meet you too Rose. I am Mikhail and I like Growlithe and Caterpie and Natu. I hope we can be friends too. Satisfied with his intro Mikhail nodded to himself. That seemed to be the end of the introductions because his mother addressed everyone. Let's go over to the couch and you can all take a seat. I am going to set up the table and bring over the meal. Then we can have our dinner and talk. Lily's answer came instantly. Let the men and children go to the seating area. I will help you with the dinner preparations. So everyone except for the two women went to the couch and the men started to chat with each other while the woman busied themselves. They had dinner shortly after and Mikhail learned quite a bit about their guest while listening to the conversations happening. It turned out that Thorne and Lily both were senior trainers like his father and that they were about five years older than his parents. They had apparently met at the end of the first year of his parents' journey, where the fields helped them out of a dangerous situation. His parents had apparently been surrounded by a small-sized beedrill swarm and were getting worn down but Thorne and Lily saved them and from then on, their friendship only grew. The two of them seemed to have retired the same year his parents did. They settled down in Orchid City which is a tier 6 city near Saffron City. Now one would ask themselves did they really travel from there to Hope Town just to visit some friends and it would be a justified question because the distance between the two places is nearly 4.000 kilometers. Fortunately, they did not have to travel that distance the regular way. Apparently, tier 5 to tier 7 cities all had teleporting stations that could be used to travel between them. The family of three booked a teleportation chain to Honey City, a tier 5 city near Honeydew City, and took a bus to Hope Town from there. The funny thing was that the teleportation chain together with the waiting time between teleportation points took 40 minutes, while the 120 kilometers long bus drive took nearly two hours. After dinner, they all went to the living room where the adults resumed their conversation. Mikhail knew that he should invite Rose to his play corner to entertain his little guest but he was really curious what Pokemon Lily and Thorn had. So he decided to simply ask if they could show them to him. Sorry, Uncle Thorn, Aunt Lily. You are trainers like my parents, right? So you have Pokemon too. Can you show me, please? His parents started to laugh when they heard him. Our boy here absolutely loves Pokemon. We should have expected him to ask to see your Pokemon. 
came from his father, Lily answered Mikhail's question after Edward said his piece. Sorry, Mickey, except for one of them, I left the rest of my team at home to look after it while we are gone, but I can show you the one I brought along. Before Mikhail could answer her, Thorne started speaking. I on the other hand have my whole team with me and I see no problem with showing them to you. We will have to go out to the terrace because some of my Pokemon are too big for the living room. Mikhail kept nodding his head while saying, Great, great. His parents kept chuckling at the little play their friends and their son were performing. When Thorne talked about going out his mother was the one who answered. No problem we can sit at the terrace as well. The weather is currently good enough, so that's actually a good idea. Let me take some snacks and drinks there as well. Arya stood up and went to the kitchen and Lily followed her. They all went to the terrace and sat down except for Lily, who took a pokeball from her belt and released the Pokemon inside. Mikhail, who was excitedly watching her was surprised by the Pokemon that she released. Chapter 42, CH19, 42, Exhibition Match, 1. The Pokemon Lily released was a Ninetales. No wonder Rose's favorite Pokemon was a Vulpix, she probably was influenced by her mother's Ninetales. Mikhail had to admit that Ninetales was a gorgeous Pokemon, it looked elegant and refined. Once it was let out the Ninetales observed its surroundings and Mikhail could see it recognized his parents before it focused a bit on him. At that moment he remembered that despite not being a psychic type, Ninetales was pretty talented in that area, so he was momentarily worried if it noticed something off from his Shinnik energy. He felt relieved when it stopped focusing on him and his previous thoughts were confirmed when she sent an open telepathic message, showing her Shinnik prowess. Yes, it turned to her, because the voice Mikhail perceived from the telepathic message was decidedly female. So we came to visit Arya and Edward. It certainly has been some time since we have last seen them. You both look good and I can see that your kit is healthy as well. His parents greeted her back and thanked her for her compliment. Lily introduced Mikhail to Ninetales. This is Mikhail, as you have guessed he is Arya and Edward's son. In case you did not listen in before, I called you out because he wanted to see our partners. Mikhail this is my starter to Mamo. Do all trainers on Terra give their Pokemon names? Mikhail thought while addressing Ninetales after Lily said that. Hello, Miss Tamamo. You are very pretty. Can I hug you? Ninetales seemed amused by his compliment and after a short deliberation on her part, she permitted him to hug her. Thank you, little Mikhail. Yes, you may hug me for a bit if you wish to. Not when to let such a chance slip through his fingers, Mikhail approached and hugged her while simultaneously scanning her. When he saw her status he accidentally let something slip. Whoa. Species, Ninetales. Gender, female. Type, fire. Potential, light green. Stage, genetic variation, abilities, talents, affinities. She has light green potential, which is not bad. Seems like my parents are not the only ones with Pokemon that have good potential. Is it because Lily is a senior trainer? Ninetales should be at least, high, silver or, low, gold stage. So, did Ninetales have good potential from the beginning or did she break her limits a few times thus increasing her potential? Supplements could be another reason. Mikhail felt everyone focus on him when he made that sound so he had to explain himself somehow. Sorry. Miss Ninetales your coat is so soft. I got surprised. Ninetales accepted his compliment and he walked back to his seat, while Ninetales went to Rose's side. Thorn took one of his pokeballs off his belt and released the Pokemon inside. It seemed like he planned to let them out one by one instead of releasing them all at once. It was a wiggly tough. Lou here was my starter and during our journey, I decided to specialize in the normal type. Thorn said to him after which he addressed Wigglytuff, who was observing the surroundings just like Ninetales had done, before releasing his Pokemon one by one. Lou wait for a bit. I'll let the others out as well. Mikhail felt giddy seeing the lineup in front of him. Thorn released a Pidgeot, Tauros, Ambipom, Exploud, and an Honest to God Ursaring. Sorry because of his surprise he fell into old habits, he meant Honest to Mew Ursaring. While not one of the rarest Pokemon, Ursaring still was impressive and rather aggressive so seeing one was unexpected but not unwelcome. Once all his Pokemon were out, he addressed them and repeated what Lily had said to Ninetales. After hearing his request Wigglytuff was the first to agree and the rest eventually followed his lead even the Ursaring, who was the last one to agree. Once he had hugged and checked everyone Mikhail felt strangely relieved. It showed that the Pokemon of senior trainers while not bad, generally did not all have great potential like the ones of his father. While Thorne was only one trainer, Mikhail could tell from the conversations they had inside that he was one of the stronger senior trainers. So he should be able to represent the majority of them, in that case, his father was still the odd one out. Which in Mikhail's opinion was much better than everyone walking around with green and blue potential Pokemon. Anyway, their status showed the following. Species, Wigglytuff. Gender, Male. Type, Normal, Fairy. Potential, Deep Yellow. Dash. Species, Pidgeot. Gender, Male. Type, Normal, Flying. Potential, light yellow. Dash. Species, Tauros. Gender, male. Type, normal. Potential, orange. Dash. Species, ambipom. Gender, male. Type, normal. Potential, deep orange. Dash. Species, exploud. Gender, female. Type, normal. Potential, light green. Dash. Species, ursaring. Gender, female. Type, normal. 
potential, green. From the exchange that happened between his father and Thorn, once Ursaring was released, Mikhail learned how the potential of Pokemon was currently categorized by the Alliance. His father said that Thorn was lucky to have a 4-star Ursaring, to which Thorn countered that he did not want to be called lucky by someone with two 5-star Pokemon. From this Mikhail could determine that 5-star stood for blue potential and 4-star stood for green potential. Following that he could deduce that 3-star was yellow, 2-star was orange, and 1-star was equal to red potential. Similarly one could deduce that purple potential would be 6 stars and aurora potential would be 7 stars. Whether they knew the existence of purple and aurora potential he couldn't tell, but he doubted it, at least for those not at the top. Once he was done with checking them out he turned towards Thorn. Uncle Thorn, your Pokemon are awesome. They look strong. Edward seemed to somehow get triggered by Mikhail's admiring words and tone, which caused him to challenge Thorn. Thorn how about we show the kids some action. Nothing too big, two one-on-one -on -one battles without any instructions from us, and no wide area attacking moves. We can use the clearing that Arya and I normally use to train for the fight. Lily simply chuckled a bit, while Arya shook her head at the antics of her husband. She could see that he got slightly jealous and that he wanted to impress their son as a result of his jealousy. Sure, no problem. Let's do it. Thorne agreed to Edwards's suggestion and they all walked towards the clearing at the west of their house, where his parents trained. Once they reached the clearing, the two men stood on opposite sides, and his mother walked to a position that was somewhat between them. The rest sat down on the side, the women had brought along some chairs in their bags to sit on. Nine tails and the non-combatants were by their side to keep them safe. After everyone settled down his mother started talking. This is going to be a friendly 2 vs 2 single battle. Once a Pokemon is down, both trainers have to withdraw their Pokemon and send out their next candidate. The use of wide area attacking moves is forbidden. Both trainers are not allowed to give any instructions to their partners. Are both of you ready? The two men nodded simultaneously. Thorn sent out his Wigglytuff as his first Pokemon and Edward sent out his Magneton. Thorn softly cursed when he saw that Edward released his Magneton and Edward smirked when he saw the Wigglytuff. Both told their Pokemon the rules of the fight. After which Arya lifted her hand and brought it back down to start the fight. Begin. Wigglytuff immediately tried to send Magneton into slumber by using Sing, which Magneton stopped with a screech. The loud noise produced by Magneton made it impossible to hear Wigglytuff's voice and simultaneously forced him to stop singing. Magneton immediately performed a thunder wave following his screech. Wigglytuff couldn't dodge the move despite jumping upwards because it was still a little disoriented by the screech which delayed its action for a bit causing it to get hit. The paralyzed Wigglytuff decided to take revenge by using Copycat and sent a thunder wave back at Magneton. Magneton not having expected to be attacked with its own move couldn't react at all and got hit as well. Wigglytuff immediately afterward used a stockpile for later. Magneton used that time to rapid fire three thunder shocks at Wigglytuff, which forced him to dodge them. Unfortunately for Wigglytuff, his paralysis triggered while dodging the third thunder shock, which Magneton used to fire a flash cannon at him. The move threw Wigglytuff back and caused some damage to him. Magneton did not let up and began a gyro ball moving towards the Wigglytuff that had yet to stand up. Wigglytuff saw Magneton coming towards himself while spinning lost no time with trying to stand up and performed a sing while lying down, which forced Magneton to abort its gyro ball to use a screech instead to counter the sing. Wigglytuff seemed to have expected Magneton's move because it used Disable on it to keep it from using that move and quickly began another sing. Magneton who had no other direct way to stop Wigglytuff's sing tried to interrupt him by hitting him with a thunder shock. To its misfortune, Wigglytuff dodged its desperate attack while keeping up his sing, which caused Magneton to fall asleep. Surprisingly Wigglytuff did not directly begin to attack his sleeping opponent but instead started to perform consecutive stockpiles. He used three stockpiles before moving towards the sleeping Magneton. That together with the stockpile used at the beginning of the fight meant that Wigglytuff could stack four stockpiles instead of three, which was the limit in the games. As luck would have it Magneton woke up just as Wigglytuff was 4 meters away from it. Its awakening meant that it could attack Wigglytuff to keep it from approaching it any further. Unfortunately, it was still a bit too late. While it would have been better for Wigglytuff to get a bit closer for its next attack, 4 meters were still near enough to perform it anyway, which it did as soon as it noticed Magneton waking up. Wigglytuff used the 4 stockpiles it had to perform a spit up on steroids. The devastating attack caused a big explosion as soon as it hit Magneton. The shockwaves produced by the explosion could still be slightly felt at the place from where the others were watching the fight, prompting the Pokemon there to stop them. Once the dust settled one could see a badly damaged Magneton that was still standing, thanks to its steel typing, despite the terrifying attack it got hit by. Just as the battered Magneton was going to counterattack and Wigglytuff was trying to finish off his opponent, Edward interfered. He halted the fight. Both of you stop. We are forfeiting this round. Magneton you fought well but in your current condition, your chances of winning this fight are minimal and not worth risking further damage. You did a good job but you have to return now. With that, he withdrew Magneton. Edward has withdrawn Magneton and forfeited the round. This means that Wigglytuff has won. Arya declared Wigglytuff the winner, causing Thorn to withdraw him as well. Meanwhile, Mikhail was in awe at what he had just witnessed. The fight had been incredible in his opinion. It was a fast-paced fight and the strategies, as well as counter-strategies the Pokemon had used without any input from their trainer, were impressive. 
This gave him a glimpse at how refined and complex Pokemon battles at the higher stages could be. Mikhail had no idea how many battles and how much training it took for the Pokemon to reach this point and he was asking himself if the Pokemon of all senior trainers were as awesome as those two because that fight was way better than he had expected. He was currently intentionally ignoring the fact that a Pokemon with a lower potential and a type disadvantage went against a Pokemon with better potential and a type advantage. There could be multiple explanations for that but none of them mattered right now, because they would not change the fact that Wigglytuff had earned this victory. Just as Mikhail finished his musing, his mother told both trainers to call out their second Pokemon and both men simultaneously released their next Pokemon. Advertising plugin. Help me stay motivated. Patreo asterisk n slash Israel 93. Chapter 43, CH 20, 43, Exhibition Match, 2. Mikhail's father called over his Nidorino and Thorn used his Ursaring. Both Pokemon were informed of the rules and his mother gave the starting signal. Mikhail was wondering how the two Pokemon had been trained because both species were generally close-range fighters. If they had focused solely on that aspect this was going to turn into a close combat battle. I hope father has helped Nidorino learn some long-range moves. While watching two individuals in a slugfest is entertaining as well, I would rather see a diversity of fighting styles. During Mikhail's idle thoughts on the fight between Ursaring and Nidorino began. Ursaring began using scary face while moving towards Nidorino, who was ignoring Ursaring and using focus energy instead. While scary face made the target a bit more sluggish for some time, focus energy allowed the next move to gain a penetration property that made it easier to cause greater harm, which could be seen as equal to a critical hit. Critical hits did not really exist in reality, here they were simply attacks that caused higher than normal damage due to one reason or the other. Anyway, back to the fight. After using focus energy, Nidorino used toxic spikes to fill the surrounding area with poisonous spikes that Ursaring had to go through if she wanted to reach him. Due to focus energy, the spikes were more dangerous than normal and the probability of getting poisoned was higher. Ursaring showed a resolute face and continued her approach anyway, trying to dodge the spikes as much as she could but having accepted the possibility of getting poisoned. Nidorino seeing her still approaching used a shockwave to attack her before she reached him but Ursaring's reaction was lightning fast, as soon as she saw the sparks she crouched down and plunged her paws into the ground. Mikhail saw how her paws gained a metallic hue before they were plunged into the ground and was excited. She used what was most likely metal claw to ground the electricity and negate the shockwave. That's awesome and it seems my father did teach him some long-range moves. It seems like I can expect such tactics regularly at their level if she used it without any input from her trainer. Nidorino used the delay of Ursaring negating his shockwave to fire a few rounds of poison sting at her, which Ursaring blocked by using Protect. She used the time Protect was active to stand up again and continue to move forward. When the distance between the two was reduced to less than 4 meters she just blurred for a bit before appearing behind Nidorino ready to attack him. Mikhail, who saw that move thought to himself. That has to be faint attack. I think I saw some small black sparks when Ursaring got blurry and appeared behind Nidorino. I am not sure if it is short range teleportation, or a high speed movement but what I know is that it is really fast. I am surprised that Nidorino managed to react to it. Surprisingly, Nidorino managed to block the surprise attack with a protect of his own. He used it as soon as Ursaring's silhouette started to blur, not only that but he used the small paws his protection earned him to hit the Ursaring behind him with a double kick, hurling her a bit away. The move was executed rather smartly because Nidorino used enough strength to make Ursaring roll away instead of flying away. This was important because she was stabbed by the previously released toxic spikes while rolling away. While Ursaring was forced to roll by Nidorino, he did not stop there. Nidorino immediately started to use Earth Power to attack her, but Ursaring made use of her involuntary roll to dodge the attack by slightly changing her rolling path as soon as she felt the ground underneath her vibrate. While she was still hit by small pieces of the ground sent flying by the eruption of Earth Power, she did manage to escape most of the move. Only after dodging the attack, she managed to stand up but one could see that she had a slight purple hue. It seems at least the first part of Nidorino's plan had worked out and Ursaring got poisoned, which meant that she was on a timer now. Ursaring started running towards Nidorino once more this time completely disregarding the spikes on the ground. Nidorino wanted to deliver her a major blow, and tried to use Venoshock on her but that failed when she used Protect to block it. Ursaring managed to use the protection granted by Protect to reach Nidorino and crouched down slightly to deliver a low kick. Nidorino got hit and was unbalanced because of it, which Ursaring used to deliver a hammer arm. Fortunately for Nidorino, he used Protect once he got unbalanced which allowed him to block the strong attack from Ursaring, but the confrontation between Protect and Hammer Arm caused a small explosion, which stirred up some dust. Once the dust settled Nidorino was nowhere to be seen. He had apparently used the occasion to use Dig and went underground. It looked like he was planning to stay there for as long as he could because even 30 seconds later he did not surface or attack Ursaring. Nidorino seemed to plan to delay the fight until she got done in by the poison, but noticing the situation Ursaring smartly made use of it. She used rest to recover from the damage she had suffered until now. While this would not cure her poisoning, it would allow her to fight longer. If this had been a regular trainer battle, father could have warned Nidorino that Ursaring was making use of his plan and to directly attack her while she is resting but he can't, so Nidorino has to notice that something is off on his own. 
Mikhail thought while observing the situation on the field. Twenty seconds later Nidorino who noticed a lack of vibration coming from above, resurfaced and saw Ursaring sleeping. He instantly used Toxic to worsen her poisoning and instead of continuing his attack on her, he started stacking focus energy. Ursaring flinched after being doused by Toxic and instinctively used a snore that interrupted Nidorino's third focus energy as well as damaged him slightly. Ursaring did start to awaken after that but Nidorino seeing her waking up used a two times focus energy boosted Venoshock to attack her while she was defenseless. As soon as Ursaring got hit by the boosted Venoshock she woke up by the great pain the move as well as the erupting poison in her body caused and screamed. Had she not recovered greatly thanks to rest this move would have knocked her out but even then she was left in a worse state than before. Ursaring decided to make a last gamble because she knew that she would lose if she didn't. She used sweet scent, which caused Nidorino to relax and loosen up a bit, reducing its vigilance and focus. Then she used protect once more to protect herself in case he attacked her and closed the distance between the two. Her use of protect showed to be a smart choice because Nidorino instinctively used a shock wave after being affected by sweet scent. This shows that training counters for certain situations until they become instinct is a smart decision. I already planned to do that before this fight but now I am even sure of my decision. Ursaring was now before Nidorino and acted as if she was aiming a hammer arm at his head. Nidorino used protect to block the attack, but it turned out Ursaring was just faking it and used faint attack instead. She appeared behind Nidorino and used a combination of fury swipes and slash to break his protect as fast as she could and once she had succeeded she aimed a real hammer arm at his unguarded back while hoping that Nidorino wouldn't react fast enough. Unfortunately for her Nidorino did manage to respond somewhat. While he had no time to dodge and couldn't use another protect he briefly shone a bit before he was hit by hammer arm. It turned out he had used endure to weather the attack and while he did receive quite some damage it was not enough to beat him. Since he was hit on the back, he was not forcefully moved from his position and after enduring the hammer arm he turned around and delivered a headbutt and horn attack combo at Ursaring, which successfully made her flinch. Using this opportunity Nidorino used another Venoshock causing Ursaring to get knocked out. As soon as his mother declared the winner, both his father and Thorn rushed onto the field. His father took out an antidote and Thorn seeing this took out some pliers. While he used the pliers to remove the toxic spikes from Ursaring, Edward would spray the antidote onto those places once they were cleared. After they had removed all spikes and sprayed all affected areas, they fed Ursaring two Pecha berries before relaxing for a bit. Then they used a super potion on both Ursaring as well as Nidorino and started talking. I guess with this we can consider the overall fight a draw. Congratulations, Edward. Came from Thorn. Yes, it can be considered a draw. Thank you, Thorn. Answered his father. Edward, I can say that you have made some progress since our last battle, and I am happy that you have progressed even after retiring instead of only maintaining your strength or even regressing, said Thorne to his father, who responded. You're right. Arya and I have kept up our training. Well more like I kept training regularly and Arya did the same sometimes. Edward paused because Arya swatted his arm at his joke before he continued. That, my current job has to do with security helped as well. No matter how rare the probability of something happening is I have to be prepared either way, so our training had to be kept up. Thorne nodded at Edward's reply. Yes, you told me about your job before. It is great that you managed to find one that allows you to keep getting stronger despite pausing your career as an active trainer. Edward nodded his head at that. They talked some more and the women also participated in their talk. While the adults were talking Mikhail observed Rose. The little girl seemed quite excited by the fight they had just witnessed as she was visibly glowing. Her eyes were glistening due to how enthusiastic she was and he even saw an illusion of little stars shining in her eyes because of it. He decided to talk to her since he thought it would be good to talk to people his physical age. Rose. Wasn't the fight super exciting? Rose who had turned towards him, when she heard him addressing her, nodded repeatedly. Un, un, super exciting? It was awesome. Ursa was like hmm and Nido was like aan. Then Ursaring made pow and Nido went poof. Rose started to animatedly describe the fight from her perspective while moving her hands when making fighting noises and Mikhail found himself amused by her enthusiasm. Once she paused in her description, he asked her a question. Was that the first time you saw a fight too? Un. I have seen them train. But? This is the first fight I see was her answer. It was my first time too. I want to be like that when I grow up. Mikhail told her and she started to giggle. He 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 he. We can't become Pokemon when we grow up silly, said Rose while giggling. Mikhail whose cheeks turned slightly red answered her. I meant becoming a trainer. Rose laughed a bit more before she answered him with an obviously fake serious look. Yes, I believe you, before giggling once more. The parents who heard Rose laughing all had happy faces and started listening to them. Once she stopped giggling Rose admitted something. I really like Vulpix, but I think I like Teddy too just like Vulpix, while extending her arms to show how much she liked them. Yep, now I think Nidoran is great too. I am going to get one someday, Mikhail said, showing that he was just as impressed with the fight as her, just with the Pokemon of his own father. Since he couldn't sell out his father for her, the adults laughed a bit when they heard the children talk and they all decided to return back home. When Mikhail asked in his words if it was okay to just leave the poisonous spikes lying around, his father said that they had already lost their toxicity and that they would degrade with time, so it was okay to leave them alone. 
After they were back home, they watched some TV together, and once it was time for him to sleep he asked where Rose and her parents were going to sleep. His parents said that the sofa could be turned into a big bed and that their guests would sleep there. Once he had his answer, he went upstairs and was surprised when all of them followed him. When he asked what was going on, they said that his bed was big enough for two children and that Rose would sleep there until the parents decided to sleep. Mikhail, who had no choice but to agree since he could bring no logical counter-argument besides them being boy and girl, to which the parents said they were so young that it was okay. The women had a glint in their eyes while saying this, which Mikhail decided to ignore right away. Seeing no other option he agreed and both children lay down on his bed after changing into their pajamas. Once they were inside his bed Rose asked him a question that he had been expecting much earlier. Why are a NATO and Caterpie following you? To which Mikhail answered while feeling a teeny tiny bit smug. They are my Pokemon. Rose gained a shocked look at that. You already have Pokemon? But we are small. Mikhail nodded at her question. Yep, they are mine. They followed me. My parents agreed. Rose was impressed by this. Whoa, that is so cool. I wish I had Pokemon too. He promised that he would introduce them to her tomorrow and to let her play with them, to which she happily agreed. Both of them fell asleep shortly afterward. Advertising plugin. Help me stay motivated. Patreo asterisk n slash Israel 93. Chapter 44, CH 21, 44, Spending the morning with Rose. The next morning as soon as Mikhail woke up he checked his bed to see if Rose was still there since the adults had said that they would bring her downstairs when they decided to sleep. Well, it seems they didn't, because Rose is still sleeping on his bed instead of being gone. He thought he, now, knew why the eyes of his mother and Lily glinted yesterday, at least he hoped it was because of this. Mikhail looked at the clock to see what time it was. It turned out it was only 8 a.m., which meant that it was too early to wake up the others since it was an unspoken rule to not wake up others too early on weekends. Thinking about what to do until either Rose woke up or their parents came up to call them down, he decided to check up on his Magi Carp experiment. He first checked up on his MVP specimen Magidraco and saw no visible progress. This was not surprising since it had only been six days from the beginning of the experiment until now, so today was experiment day number seven. Of the other four specimens, three showed no visible change as well, the only exception being the one that was fed the poison type supplement. He had changed the purple lily that was used for the supplement from an E-class 1 to a F-class 1 because the E-class lily was too strong for his specimen. He started using the weaker supplement yesterday and he had not yet been forced to feed his specimen a pecha berry to keep it from being poisoned to death like he had to when it was fed the E-class 1. So at least that could be seen as progress. Besides the visible changes, he observed their behavior as well to see if any changes happened. Majidraco was livelier than she was at the beginning of the experiment and her reactions showed no negative influence on her mood. The specimen that was fed the other portion of the dragon-type supplement was another story. Not only was it slightly less active than before but it was more irritable as well. The specimen that fed the fire-type supplement was a bit more irritable as well and it behaved slightly tired. Mikhail decided to keep an eye on this one because fire was normally incompatible with water. He did not want his specimen to die just because he had not noticed that the fire-type energy from the supplement had started to boil his specimen's blood. That would be really unfortunate. The specimen that was fed the grass-type supplement did not show any behavioral changes for now. His poor specimen for the poison type was not only slightly lethargic but also had a constipated look. At least it was not fully poisoned yet. One would have to keep an eye on it to see if he would have to feed it a pecha berry sometime during the day. Mikhail decided to feed them all their supplement before focusing on something else and while he was already at it he fed everyone else as well. After he was done with that he thought about the fights he had witnessed yesterday. He thought they were really cool and once more wondered just how high their stage was. He knew that it was at or below stage 5 because he would not be able to see their potential otherwise but he wondered what their true stage was. The destructive potential they showed even while holding back and limiting themselves was impressive. While thinking about this Mikhail started wondering. Now that I think about it, my strength has improved quite a bit since the last time I checked the status of my parents' Pokemon. Since my theoretical battle prowess is roughly at, mid, iron stage right now, I should be able to see the stage of Pokemon up to the, high, bronze stage. I could try to see if I can see the stage of some of my mother's Pokemon right now since her Pokemon are weaker than those of my father. I don't think I will see anything different if I recheck his Pokemon but my mother's should be possible, at least I hope so. I could even do it right after breakfast. All I have to say is that I want to show them to Rose since her parents showed them theirs yesterday. That's what I am going to do. After having made his decision Mikhail checked the clock once more to see if he had spent enough time to wake up the others. The clock showed that it was only 9 am, so he decided to do some good old meditation until the others woke up. Roughly 40 minutes later Rose started to stir causing Mikhail to come out of his meditation. It took Rose a full 5 minutes to completely wake up and Mikhail occasionally observed her in a totally non-creepy way during this time. After she woke up, she stared at him for a bit slightly confused about what he was doing in her bed until he saw the recognition in her eyes as her memories of yesterday kicked in. They greeted each other and he fulfilled his promise to her by introducing Natu and Caterpie to her. When it was Mothra's turn to be introduced Rose started rambling about how cute she was, which honestly was true. As long as one did not have entomophobia, the fear of insects, Mothra with her big glistening eyes, and slightly chubby looking body could be considered as cute. 
Anyway hearing the noise they were making, his mother and Lily came upstairs and after changing out of their pajamas they went downstairs for breakfast. He changed in his room while Lily brought Rose to the bathroom to change so no one saw anything he was not supposed to see, even if it would have made no real difference because of their age. During breakfast, Mikhail brought up his idea to show Rose his parents' Pokemon to which Rose reacted quite enthusiastically. Both parents agreed and Mikhail led Rose outside after breakfast. He showed her around all the areas the Pokemon stayed at, starting with Growlithe's. This is Agni, he is a Growlithe. I like him a lot, he's great. I even rode on him. Mikhail introduced Growlithe to Rose, while discreetly bragging. Wow. Did you ride on him? Did you not fall? Came from Rose in an impressed tone. Mikhail puffed out his chest at her reaction before answering her. That's no problem. My parents gave me a saddle. Rose's reaction was immediate. Oh, can I ride on Growlithe too? Pwetty, please. She used his own super secret hidden weapon on him. Her head was slightly tilted, her lips were pouted and her eyes were enlarged and glistening. Mikhail, who for once experienced how it felt to receive a critical hit folded nearly instantly, the only thing he could do was to throw the responsibility to someone else. She's really cute like that. In the way all little kids are, I mean. No wonder my parents have a hard time refusing me when I do that. So he did the only logical thing and threw the parents under the bus. You can use my saddle, but we have to ask first. Our parents have to say yes. Let's ask them later. I will show you, everyone, first. Can't forget the reason why I offered the tour in the first place. Were his thoughts while deflecting the responsibility to the adults. He checked Growlithe's status using the occasion. Species, Growlithe. Gender, male. Type, fire. Potential, deep green. Nothing has changed since the last time I checked. They went to the flower field next. Oh, how pretty. Came from Rose when she saw all the flowers. He showed Gloom to her and check his status. Mikhail was surprised when something new turned up. Species, Gloom. Gender, male. Type, grass, poison. Potential, light yellow. Stage, bronze stage, mid. Nice, I managed to see the stage of Sunny. Hmm, mid, bronze stage is not bad. Well, at least it's not bad for a junior trainer. But it's a bit funny how, mid, bronze stage is considered one of the lower stages here but in the games, he is strong enough to be the Pokemon of an Elite Four member or post-game trainer. With, mid, bronze stage being in the LV40 to 49 range according to the scale given to me, Rose did not show as much of a reaction seeing Sunny as she did when she saw the flowers. I was sad in Sunny's stead. Pfft. Next, we went to the Butterfree Pear's place. I introduced Emerald and Cyan to Rose who reacted just like he had expected her to react. Butterfrees were cute after all. Squee. They are so cute. Can I hug them? Can I? Please. He used a technique he was starting to master. You have to ask them yourself. If they agree, you can hug them. But you have to be mindful of their wings. After deflecting her question like a pro, he gave her a slight warning. Rose simply agreed before asking the pair for their permission. HN. Miss Emerald, can I hug you, please? Emerald agreed to Rose's request and nearly got stuffing hugged out of her. Just kidding. He did check their status as well, but it turned out both were too strong since he couldn't see their stage yet. After she hugged Emerald for a bit Mikhail continued their little tour. He brought her to the Nido Pear's lair and introduced them to Rose. These two are my parents' starters. The blue one is Titania, a Nidorina. She is my mother's starter. The purple one is Titan, a Nidorino. He is my father's starter. Rose made impressed noises during his introduction. Oh, that's the one that fought yesterday. Before she ignored him and focused on Titania instead. She is beautiful. I like her. She wanted to hug them but I was not sure if that was dangerous because of their poison, but Titania indicated that it was okay. He knew they could control their poison but it seemed they were faster at it than he had expected. Mikhail checked their status as well but as he had thought there was no change. He already knew that both would be too strong but tried anyway. The pond was their last stop since only Rivers and Star were left of the Pokemon that stayed at their property. The others were either staying somewhere else or preferred their Pokeballs. He called out to the two Pokemon once they reached the pond. Rivers, Star come out. We have a guest. I want to introduce you. Both came out of the water. Rose looked at Poliwhirl for a bit before she zoomed in on Stryu. This is Rivers. He's a Poliwhirl and my mother's Pokemon. He introduced Rivers to Rose, who greeted him shortly before focusing back on Stryu. Chuckling a bit at the expression Rivers was making at being sidelined, he continued with Star's introduction. This is Star, a Stryu. It is one of my mother's Pokemon too. Rose nodded at his introduction. Hello, Star. Any, Star are you a real Star? Did you fall from the sky? She bombarded Star with questions and some of them made him chuckle. Surprisingly Star behaved completely different towards Rose than it did towards him. When it came to him Star preferred to keep its distance but it apparently had no problem with approaching Rose. He would have cried sexual discrimination if he had not seen that Star also had no problem with his father. Focusing back on the exchange between Stryu and Rose he saw that Star was shaking its head, upper body, at Rose's questions. He decided to include himself in their conversation. Star does not come from the sky. It comes from the ocean. My parents said so. Rose hearing him and seeing Star nodding at his words accepted what he said. Oh, so Star is from the ocean. That's great too. 
Despite what she was saying it was evident to Mikhail that Rose lost nearly half her enthusiasm after he said that Star was not from the sky. He rechecked their status as well. He checked Polyworld's status while patting his shoulders after he slumped a bit at being disregarded as for Star he used his telekinesis to come in contact with it, but this time he was gentle, so Star did not notice anything. He could not see anything new on Polyworld's status screen, which meant that he was stronger than, hi, bronze stage. Star's status on the other hand showed his stage. Species, Staryu. Gender, genderless. Type, water. Potential, deep yellow. Stage, bronze stage, mid. After star status was checked Mikhail had gone over all of his mother's Pokemon and the fact that that he could only see the status of two out of her five Pokemon was surprising. Mother has three Pokemon that are at the, low, silver stage or higher, despite this she is only a junior class trainer. With this lineup, she should have been able to qualify as a senior class trainer. Did they reach that level after they retired, or is there another reason that she is still a junior class trainer? They went back towards the house shortly after. While they were walking Mikhail told Rose that his father had some other Pokemon but that those were either staying somewhere else or stayed in their Pokeballs. Rose simply nodded at that. Once they were back inside she ran up to her parents and excitedly started telling them about their tour outside. She threw him a curveball before she finished her narration. Mikhail said I can ride on Groly. Can I, please? All adults turned towards Mikhail at that and he had to involuntarily gulp at the sudden attention. She threw me under the bus. That's not what we had agreed on. Out loud he said. Ahem, what I said was that she should ask our parents. Rose wants to ride on Agni. She wants to know if she can. Back to you little girl. Mikhail thought while passing the initiative back to Rose and the adults. Rose immediately pulled out her big guns once again. Her head was tilted upwards, her lips were pouted and her eyes were enlarged and glistening. She kept looking from one adult to another while focusing her stare more on the women. Can I, please? Pwetty, please. The adults did not manage to hold out for long under her persistent stare and gave in. His parents asked him if he was okay with Rose using his saddle and he generously agreed. After getting his permission they all went outside, where they saddled up Agni. Rose got to ride him and Mikhail also rode on him after her. Mikhail and Rose kept switching for the next hour before they stopped. Afterward, they went back inside. The children changed their clothes and the adults made their preparations for their trip to Hope Hill. Once everything was ready they drove off. Chapter 45, CH 22, 45, Field Trip and a Surprising Exchange. Mikhail used the 20 minutes drive to Hope Hill to decide what to do once they were there. Since they had guests, and one of them was his age, so he could not leave them to explore on his own. This meant he couldn't actively search for any resources but that was okay, he could still take those he noticed through luck. The last time he was at Hope Hill he could not check out the Vulpix and Sand Shrew that he saw there, so he could do that now. The fact that Rose's favorite Pokemon was Vulpix was a good excuse to search for them. Any other Pokemon they came across would naturally be checked as well. He told Rose as much before they arrived at their destination. Any, Rose. You know I saw Vulpix at Hope Hill. Rose immediately perked up at that focusing totally on Mikhail. Really? Can we go to them? Can we? Can we? I wanna see Vulpix. She said at first to him and then to the two women they were currently sitting on. For the duration of the ride, the mothers had taken their respective children on their lap, since there was not enough space for all of them otherwise. His mother, Arya, was the one that answered her. Yes, we can. We will stop at our picnic place for a bit and set up our things there. After that, we can leave one of our Pokemon there to keep an eye on our things while we stroll around. I am sure we will see the Vulpix during our stroll as well. If they will allow you to approach them is an altogether different story. Lily added to that to assure Rose. I will let Ninetales talk to them, I am sure that it will be okay. Rose nodded, hearing her mother. She gave her a peck on the cheek and thanked both women. Once they arrived at Hope Hill, his father parked the car, and they walked towards the same spot his family went to the last time they were here. The grown UPS set up everything at their picnic spot and they started their stroll after leaving Cell, the Magneton, Ursaring, and Exploud to look after the place. The group began to leisurely walk towards the top of the hill. The parents released some of their Pokemon to accompany them. Lily released her nine tails, while Arya called out Emerald and Rivers. Thorn called out Ambipom and Wigglytuff, while Edward released Cyan and Agni. Seeing them calling out so many Pokemon to accompany them Mikhail suddenly thought about his lone trips. It seems I should be happy that my parents send out only one or two Pokemon to follow me from a distance when I go out if this is what they do normally. This seems to be a habit from the time they were on their journey, and if it is important enough that they still do it reflexively then I should remember this and most likely adopt it as well. Mikhail was certainly not complaining, because the adults were talking about things that happened during their journeys, which he found interesting. Even if the presence of all the Pokemon was reducing the number of Pokemon they encountered, thus reducing the number of status checks he could perform, he was still happy. As far as Rose was concerned, she was in a world of her own. The little girl was ultra-focused on finding some Vulpix, and she kept looking around hoping to spot some of them as fast as possible. They kept walking like this for about 20 to 25 minutes when they heard some buzzing noises. Bzzzzzzzzzz. Bzzzzzzz. All adults tensed when they heard that sound, which surprised Mikhail a bit. Why are they getting so tense all of a sudden? It's just the noise of a beedrill. I am not looking down on beedrill or anything but a wild beedrill should be a piece of cake for them. 
Mikhail couldn't hold back from asking the question that came out of his mouth. Just a beadrill, right? While he was posing his question, the adults kept attentively listening to the buzzing of the beadrill. Only after the noise vanished after getting farther away did they relax and answer his question, causing him to wonder about their behavior. There's no need to overreact like that, right? The adults looked at each other for a bit before his father started speaking. Son, you should never underestimate the danger a beadrill can pose. It could turn into a major mistake on your part to do so. While it is true that most wild beadrill could not be considered dangerous to trainers on their own, the situation changes when a swarm of them turns up. That's exactly the problem when encountering a beadrill, they are seldom alone. Once you are surrounded by a swarm of beadrill, they could exhaust you with their sheer number. Mikhail nodded at his father's explanation. It made sense and he had even considered that point but he had thought that their Pokemon were strong enough even if they got surrounded by a swarm. His father seemed to have noticed that he was still a bit dubious about their reaction, so he expanded his previous explanation. The reason we were so tense before was more because of a forced habit than real danger. We know the strength and the vague sizes a swarm of beadrill could reach here on Hope Hill, which is not enough to threaten us as long as no major change has happened to the beadrill colony. But in places where you don't have this information or in most areas inside forests, especially the Viridian Forest, this is a vital habit to have. The swarms there could reach massive sizes and even alert the stronger ones so being careful is never wrong. It's better to be too careful than to get hurt, all right. Mikhail rapidly nodded, while thinking about beadrill. Hmm, even senior class trainers speak with some form of reverence slash respect when mentioning the beadrill swarms. How about I train myself a queen or even empress beadrill and let her form her own swarm? Better yet, I let her take over other swarms. I can already see it, legions of beadrill under my command waiting for marching orders and flying forward screaming for the swarm. Here Mikhail nearly chuckled for a bit, but he managed to stop himself since it would have been weird if he started to chuckle after a serious explanation. Anyway, training one or two weedle can not hurt. I am sure I can make them strong and I already know that they have a mega evolution. I am sure that together with some genetic traits, they will become really strong. Note to self, keep an eye open for any good weedle. Until now Mikhail had a good if he finds one but no problem if he didn't kind of attitude, but that just changed. After his father's explanation, Thorne began to tell them one of their adventures. Edward, you saying that has made me remember our close escape in Fuchsia Forest. We were surrounded by Beedrill as far as we could see and they kept exhausting our Pokemon by using swarm slash wave tactics. The strength of our Pokemon was superior but by the virtue of their number alone they were slowly grinding us down. The even bigger problem was that stronger Beedrill could have turned up if we were delayed for too long. Mikhail was attentively listening to Thorne's narration and even Rose was curiously listening to her father instead of looking for Vulpix. Fortunately one of our comrades returned with some reinforcements after teleporting away with one of his Pokemon to get some help. We focused on the same point, they from the outside of the encirclement and we from the inside. In the end, we managed to break out with their help and fled the scene. Ha ha ha, we got an earful about provoking the Beedrill so much that they formed a mega swarm like that. I will never forget the scene where all I could see was a sea of Beedrill. Mikhail saw that all adults were remembering that moment. After hearing Thorne's description and sensing the things he left out from his tone during his narration Mikhail affirmed his previous decision. Yep, I am definitely going to get myself a Weedle. Once Thorne was finished, they continued their stroll for another 30 minutes before they stopped for a bit at a small clearing with a few small boulders that could sit on. His mother took out a few bottles of juice for everyone to drink while they were resting. It was there that he managed to check out a few sand shrew that were there as well. Species, sand shrew. Gender, male. Type, ground. Potential, orange. Stage, mid, iron stage. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, sand veil. Talents, none. Affinities, ground slash earth. That was the strongest one among them and the one with the best potential as well. After everyone had finished their drinks and Mikhail had told a curious Rose Sandra's species name, apparently that was the first time she saw one so she was curious, they continued their stroll. They kept walking for another 40 minutes before the parents decided to return to their picnic spot. To Rose's disappointment, they had not met any Vulpix until that moment, but they had seen a group of three Machup that were walking up the hill. Mikhail naturally did not miss the chance to discreetly check their status. Unfortunately, their potential was pretty bad. The best one was light orange, so Mikhail decided to simply be happy that he had managed to check another new species for the first time. They chose to take a slightly different way back. Mikhail did not know if it was because the world pitted Rose or if they were simply lucky, but they met a skulk of six Vulpix around 30 minutes after they started making their way back. As soon as Rose noticed the Vulpix she released a high-pitched squeal, causing them to shift into an alert state. Lily kept Rose from rushing towards the Vulpix and sent her nine tails towards them instead. The Ninetales managed to calm them down and they were called over after a short discussion between the Vulpix and Ninetales. Rose bound over as fast as she could and started going on about how cute and great they were towards the Vulpix. In this case, the saying flattery will get you everywhere held true, because the Vulpix and Rose started to get along swimmingly. While Rose was going around hugging and petting the Vulpix, Ninetales was talking with one of the Vulpix and the adults were following their conversation, occasionally saying a sentence or two. The thing Mikhail managed to get from what he heard, was that these Vulpix were from the same litter and that they were part of a bigger group. 
There seemed to be three big groups of Vulpix on Hope Hill and a few smaller groups but there was not a single Ninetales amongst all of them. This was also the reason why the Vulpix were so enthusiastic towards Ninetales. The Vulpix was asking if they had any way to allow the leader of their group to evolve since there were no natural firestone deposits in the surroundings. It said that they were willing to give them other things in exchange. The adults exchanged glances between each other before Lily spoke up. I do have a way to allow your leader to evolve, but what can I get in exchange for it? I think it would be better if you called over your leader before we continue. The Vulpix agreed with her and went away to call over the leader, while the others stayed. Rose, who had until now ignored everything else in favor of surrounding herself in Vulpix paused for a moment, looking after the leaving Vulpix, before shrugging and returning to her focus on the other Vulpix. A bit less than 10 minutes later the Vulpix returned with another 5 Vulpix of which Mikhail assumed one was the previously mentioned leader. He was proven right when one of the bigger Vulpix started the negotiations with Lily and Ninetales. They talked for some time during which Lily kept refusing Vulpix's offer, stating that it was not enough to exchange for her material. Mikhail could see that Vulpix was getting increasingly frustrated with every refusal she received. Yes, the Vulpix leader was a she. He had checked her and she was at the mid, bronze stage and had deep yellow potential. Anyway, just as Mikhail was wondering if she would snap, Vulpix forcibly calmed down. She pondered for a bit, briefly looked at Rose before she focused on Ninetales and started a discussion with her. She asked how Ninetales had been treated until now and how the humans it stayed with generally were. It also asked how Rose was and how the situation of the family was. Once she had heard what she needed to she restarted the negotiations. Her offer to Lily was simple. She would exchange the evolutionary material for one of her own poke eggs, as long as Ninetales and Lily swore that they would take good care of the kit that came out of the egg and that they would help it get strong. She was okay with them giving the egg to Rose as long as they helped her take care of it. Mikhail was stunned when he heard Vulpix's offer. The fact that she was willing to exchange one of her own eggs surprised him, no matter how many stipulations she added it did not change the fact that she could not guarantee that her kit would be treated well. At least he thought so until he saw the seriousness of Lily and Ninetales when they agreed to her demands, especially Ninetales. He was not sure why but he just knew that Ninetales would do everything it could to make sure that the promises were kept. As for the egg truly being one of the leader's eggs, Mikhail did not doubt that the Vulpix would keep her word as well. It was probably because of Ninetales and the respect she had for one of their species that was willing to help her. Mikhail saw no problem with the requirements anyway because the kit would become Rose Starter if the exchange succeeded and almost no one treated their starter Pokemon badly, as long as they were not idiots or had a problematic character and the way was behaving around the Vulpix, the kit would be extremely adored. Rose who had joined his side, after she heard her name being mentioned a few times, was listening to the negotiation as well and it seemed like she was about to explode from happiness. Once Lily agreed to Vulpix's offer, the Vulpix left to bring over the egg. After she returned, Ninetales used her senses to make sure the egg was the leader Vulpix egg. Ninetales gave her okay and Lily checked the condition of the egg. The egg was declared acceptable and took out her evolutionary material. From what Mikhail could see it was not a firestone, it was a dark red marble instead and he heard Lily call it a D-class lava marble that could be used as a substitute for the firestone. It allowed the target to evolve, as long as it was not higher than the bronze stage, which the leader fulfilled being at the, mid, bronze stage. Apparently, it may have also helped the Vulpix increase her potential if she had been at the iron stage but it would only allow her to keep her current potential. When he heard that Mikhail made a simple conclusion, an E-class lava marble would have most lost likely reduced her potential after the evolution. One has to use evolutionary materials that fit the target's stage otherwise one risks a degradation in potential. The leader apparently decided to directly use the marble. She started to evolve as soon as she absorbed a bit of its energy after touching the lava marble. This was the second evolution he was witnessing and it was still an unbelievable experience for him. It was a thing of beauty and he was happy to witness this moment. Mikhail could see Rose vibrating on the spot because of her excitement at the happenings. After the evolution was done a Ninetales stood at the place where previously a Vulpix had been. The surrounding Vulpix congratulated their leader and the two Ninetales exchanged a few words before the newly evolved Ninetales left with its subordinates, leaving the egg behind as they had previously agreed upon. Lily took the egg and put it inside an incubator she pulled out of her Silphco bag, before safely stowing the incubator away. Then she explained to Rose that the Vulpix that was going to hatch from that egg was going to be her starter Pokemon and Rose was over the moon once she heard that. She jumped, she squealed, ran up to Ninetales and her parents to hug and kiss each one of them. Mikhail, who had checked the egg while Lily was putting it into the incubator, was currently not sure what to feel. Species, Vulpix. Gender, female. Type, fire. Potential, light green. Stage, none, poke egg. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, flash fire, drought. Talents, none. Affinities, fire. I know this is a bit petty but since I am the one with the second life, shouldn't something like this happen to me instead of Rose? Well, I like Grolide more than Vulpix anyway, so this is alright as well. I can catch a Vulpix on my own if I want one later on, but I do have to say Rose is one lucky girl. If they take good care of the egg then Rose can get a Vulpix with nearly green potential. That means it would be not that hard for her to get a light blue potential nine tails. Well, let's congratulate them.
Mikhail and his parents congratulated them and they resumed their walk back after Rose calmed down for a bit. They spent the rest of the day relaxing at the picnic spot. They had their dinner there as well, his father took out the grill and they ate what he grilled, which was mostly meat. About one hour after dinner they packed up their things and they drove towards the Hope bus station. Ha, huh? another Hope club member, was the first thing that came to Mikhail's mind when they arrived there. Anyway, they brought the field family there, because their bus was leaving at 7.30pm. They said their goodbyes and Mikhail had to promise Rose to call her at least once a week. He heard his mother saying to Lily that she would make sure that Mikhail kept his promise, so he knew that he was definitely going to keep his promise. After sending off their guests, they returned to their home and Mikhail went to bed after watching a movie with his parents. Chapter 46, CH 23, 46, Mothra's Mock Fights It had been more than a week since the Field family's visit and Mikhail had returned to his previous schedule spending the time since then to focus on Mothra's mock battle preparations. They had agreed on three commands and which behavior, as well as reaction, would be ideal during different scenarios. The commands were Spider, Hunter, and Ninja. The first command Spider meant Mothra had to use sticky string shots as well as electrowebs to surround herself and wait for her opponent to approach her. Ideally, she would use the time to boost herself but since she did not know any stat boosting moves yet this point was moot. Instead, she would try to distract her approaching foe with string shots and electrowebs. The second command Hunter meant that Mothra would use her string shot to move around and dodge her opponent as well as attack him whenever she could. The third command Ninja was more like the middle ground between the previous two commands. It would not be wrong to say that the strategy for this command resembled guerrilla warfare and kiting. Mothra was supposed to use string shot to move around here as well, but instead of directly attacking the opponent the focus was on dodging the foe and laying traps. She would then force slash lure her foe to walk into said traps, but she obviously could still deliver a hit if she saw a good opening. The first command was better against fast foes. The second command was better against close range fighters that were slower than her and the third command was better against long range as well as flying opponents. Her training bore fruit because aside from grasping her commands and combat behavior, she also made big progress with her string shot. Her standard string shot now possessed enough elasticity and resilience to let her swing around like Tarzan. She had reduced the time it took her to release her standard string shot to a little less than a second. He had also tried to use them to swing around for a bit because it looked fun and everyone that knew Tarzan wanted to do that at least once, he was no exception. The string had managed to withstand even his weight so there was no problem with Mothra using it however she liked. It took her a little bit more than a second to produce her extra sticky string shot but she could finish the first sticky layer for her perimeter in about 2 seconds. The strings were sticky and durable enough to keep even him glued to a spot despite him trying his best to get free so as long as the target was not much larger and stronger than him it would be hard to break free once one was caught. Even if that was the case nothing was preventing Mothra from wrapping around her opponent with even more string shots. Her extra durable string shot took her about as long as her sticky one. This one was used to tie up her opponent without him being stuck somewhere and hardened after some time. It was really durable so breaking out was extremely hard unless one was much stronger than Mothra and it was useful outside of fights too. As far as her electrowave was concerned she had simply focused on reducing its execution time. Currently, she could perform the move in less than 2 seconds as they had aimed for. As a result of all this, Mikhail was pretty sure she was going to dominate all her mock battles, as long as she did not fight against someone that was much stronger than her and he was not dumb enough to challenge someone like that just to keep her humble or something like that. He didn't have to do anything like that because Mothra had witnessed the 2 vs 2 between his father and Uncle Thorn as well, so she knew that she was still relatively weak. Nonetheless, she had become his strongest Pokemon despite Nata having a higher stage. At least she had won most of the practice matches between them, thanks to the sheer versatility of String Shot even if Nata was starting to catch up thanks to learning Teleport. Mikhail decided to look at her status one last time before they went out to initiate her first official mock battle. The matches with Nata did not count. Name, Mothra. Species, Caterpie. Gender, Female. Type, Bug. Potential, Blue, 23.8%. Parameters. Stage, Iron Stage, Low. Vitality, G. Strength, H. Endurance, H-G. Agility, G. Energy capacity, I-H. Energy density, I-H. Condition, healthy, excited. Masteries, neutral energy manipulation, initial, bug E manipulation, novice, dash, beginner. Techniques, tackle, novice, string shot, proficient, dash, advanced, bug bite, beginner, electroabe, novice, dash, beginner, confusion, initial. Hmm, her potential increase has slowed down lately, and both the E-class silver powder and the drills lance have lost their usefulness. I'll have to use the tiny mushroom and the amber next. Her endurance has increased thanks to the physical aspect of all that training and the two energy parameters have increased because of technique exercises. I am not surprised that string shots mastery has improved to advanced but the fact that bug e manipulation has improved to beginner is a pleasant surprise. It probably happened because she trained so much with string shot. This will make it easier for Mothra to learn other bug type moves in the future. Mikhail allowed Mothra to climb up to his left shoulder and told Nato to follow them, after which he started walking towards the northwestern area. There he found a, low, iron stage Ratata as Mothra's first opponent. 
Both Pokemon stood opposite of each other and waited for Mikhail's start signal. As soon as the rock that he threw touched the ground, the Rattata started running towards Mothra and Mikhail yelled out his command at the same time. Spider. It took him one second to deliver his command and Rattata managed to cover one-fifth of the distance between during that time. Immediately after hearing his yell, Mothra started covering her vicinity in her sticky strings. She finished the first layer even before Rattata managed to reach her 10 meters range. She directly started adding a second layer to the previous one, starting with the area in front of her. Once it was close enough, the poor Rattata noted that it had no other choice but to go over the sticky field. While it hesitated Mothra finished with the second layer, shrinking the gaps between the sticky strings leaving less clean areas for her opponent to step on. Rattata circled Mothra once to look for a clear strip it could use but it saw that there was no such strip, so it had no choice but to move forward while trying to avoid the sticky strings, which slowed it down quite a bit. Mothra used this to alternately spit electrowebs and standard string shots at Rattata, who was forced to dodge her attacks causing it to step on the sticky strings on the floor. It got slowed down by the strings it stepped on and was forced to step on more and more strings while trying to dodge Mothra's attacks. A few moments later it finally got stuck. As soon as she saw Rattata getting stuck she fired an electrowave at it. Once she saw that Rattata was more or less immobilized she aimed a string shot at a tree right behind it and pulled herself in its direction. While she was sailing through the air towards her opponent, she used tackle to deliver a momentum boosted flying tackle at her helpless foe. She landed her blow while laughing and Mikhail saw that she had knocked out the Rattata. He carried the beaten Rattata towards the stream, so that he could use the water to slowly dissolve Mothra's strings. While they would degrade on their own even if left alone, that would take a while, but he was not willing to wait that long. After he cleaned the Rattata, he healed it up and gave it its reward. He praised Mothra for her win and directly started searching for her next opponent. He wanted the next challenger to be a Pidgey and managed to find a suitable one that agreed after searching for a bit. Both Pokemon stood opposite of each other and waited for Mikhail's start signal. As soon as the rock that he threw touched the ground, they both sprang into action. This time there was no need for him to say anything because they had already decided that Mothra was always going to execute Command Ninja against any flying opponent as long as no other instruction came. During the time Pidgey took off, Mothra fired two string shots at two trees on both sides of it while sticking the other end at the floor, before she fired a third one at a boulder on the right side away from Pidgey and pulled herself towards the boulder. While she was sailing towards the boulder she looked around to choose her next targets. After she landed she shot three strings at trees near her foe's previous position. Pidgey had started flying towards her in the meantime forcing Mothra to aim a few string shots at it to keep it from flying in a straight line, lest it got hit. She fired another string shot this time to a tree on the left to change her position once more. From there she executed two more string shots one to the left and one to the right before she swung towards her starting position. Pidgey who had enough of Caterpie's dodging used a gust to attack her from the distance. The wind shook Mothra a bit but she managed to safely reach her goal. She started aiming her string shot towards the strings that were in the air thanks to her previous efforts, thus limiting the hindrance-free airspace available to Pidgey. Once she had done that she began firing string shots at it while crawling away from it. The pissed off Pidgey dodged her attacks and kept flying towards her as fast as it could while also dodging the strings in the air, which forced it to maneuver around quite a bit. Mothra kept cleverly aiming her attacks so that even if Pidgey dodged her string shots, they would be stuck to the strings in the air or the trees and boulder around them consequently limiting its airspace more and more. Pidgey used a gust to blow the newest round of attacks from Caterpie away but it had no way to get rid of the strings that were slowly but surely trapping her. If it had known air slash or wing attack then it could have escaped this situation but unfortunately, it didn't, so it was no surprise when Caterpie forced it into a metaphorical corner and finally landed an electrowave on it. This was what decided the fight because the web that entangled Pidgey also fused with the strings that were already in the air, which allowed Mothra to leisurely fire another electrowave at her caught opponent. Mikhail stopped Mothra from firing a third electrowave at Pidgey and declared her the winner. Her opponent had to unwillingly accept defeat since it was unable to free itself. Mothra started to wiggle in happiness after being declared the winner. Mikhail had to chuckle at Mothra's antics and congratulated her before calling her over, so that she could break Pidgey free from the strings in the air, by nibbling them through. He caught the wrapped up Pokemon before it could hit the ground and carried it to the stream to dissolve the strings. Afterward, he healed the Pidgey and gave it its promised reward as well, before he challenged an Akans for Mothra's third battle. They won that mock fight as well using the spider strategy. Mikhail decided to call it a day after that, so he took his little champion into his arms and started walking back home. He kept thinking about the fights during the trek home, mainly the one against Pidgey. That fight was much more laborious compared to the other two. I have to adjust our strategy against flying opponents, even if the changes I can make while Mothra is a Caterpie are limited. If it had been a flying type with a bit more experienced or one with better moves, we could have lost that fight. The ninja strategy works the best when there are many things that can be linked by string shots, like trees or big boulders, so forests would be the best environment for it and plains would be the worst environment for it. I think it's time we started focusing on confusion since string shot is already at advanced mastery and anything more than that is probably going to take quite a while. Today is also the day I have to call Rose. After a talk with mom, we agreed that I would call Rose every arc day, so I am sure that she is going to call them as soon as I reach home.
At least I can ask Rose if there have been any changes to the Vulpix egg so it's not all that bad. Chapter 47, CH 24, 47, Progress. It has been one month since Mothra's first mock battle and quite a few things have happened during this time. On Kyodai near the end of the first week, nearly eight weeks after meeting, cough abducting cough, the male caterpillar finally reached the, low, iron stage. But that was not all, the two of them also established their bond after Caterpie advanced, allowing me Kyle to finally see Caterpie's complete status screen. Eight weeks was much longer than it took me Kyle to form a bond with Mothra, which took only two weeks. Name, none. Species, Caterpie. Gender, male. Age, 18 months. Type, bug. Potential, green, 62.6%. Genetic variation, none. Abilities, shield dust, run away. Talents, none. Affinities, bug slash growth. Bond, me Kyle, weak. Quirks, careful. Parameters. Stage, iron stage, low. Vitality, H. Strength, H. Endurance, H. Agility, H. Energy capacity, I. Energy density, I. Resistance, grass, minor. Fighting, minor. Ground, minor. Weaknesses, fire, minor. Air, minor. Rock, minor. Condition, healthy, happy. Masteries, bug e manipulation, initial. Techniques, tackle, novice, string shot, beginner, bug bite, novice, electroabe, novice. Wow, there is quite a difference compared to Mothra's status screen. First of all, Caterpie seems to be 13 months older than Mothra. Now, normally, 18 months might not seem to be much but if we compare it to the lifespan a Caterpie at the iron stage possesses it turns into another story. The average lifespan of a Caterpie at the iron stage is 3 years. While this can be prolonged by evolution as well as advancing to a higher stage or through some special material, it does not change the fact that the average lifespan is 3 years. Now, back to my Caterpie. 18 months is a sixth of its full lifespan, so it cannot be considered insignificant. Nonetheless, I believe, I can help Caterpie break at least its first limit. As for the other two limits, I hope Caterpie can break them during that time as well but I am not sure. Let's move on. I can also say that he is more than halfway through the green potential. Caterpie has two abilities as well, but he possesses no special talent. The only affinity he has is for the bug type, which is probably the standard for their species. His quirk is careful, which explains why it took me so long to bond with him, despite spending time with him as well as feeding and training him to the best of my abilities. Let's see. All of his parameters are at the standard for the Caterpie line including resistances and weaknesses. His mastery and techniques categories are much worse than Mothra's. Caterpie only has bug e-manipulation under masteries. He may have managed to learn Electroave and Bug Bite thanks to Mothra's tutoring, but except for String Shot, which is at the beginner mastery, all his other moves are at the novice mastery. Also, despite Mothra trying her best to teach him confusion he has been unable to learn it. This was probably because he did not have the affinity for it. Mikhail fell deep into thought after looking through Caterpie's status. Training Caterpie is much slower than training Mothra. Despite feeding him ideal supplements for his stage and nutritious food as well as providing direct tutoring his progress is relatively slow. Either I have been pampered too much by Mothra's fast progress or I am expecting too much. If even after everything I have done Caterpie's progress is this slow despite having green potential, then how long does it take for ordinary trainers to strengthen their Pokemon with less than ideal potential? It is no wonder that most Caterpies cannot take advantage of the Limit Break's potential increasing benefit. Without the support of supplements and so on, they simply do not have enough time to train for long enough to break the limits. Since I am sure this difficulty also applies to other Pokemon species, I believe that training takes so much time I wouldn't be surprised if most trainers never reach the senior class or take years to do so. After that, the next semi-important thing happened at the beginning of the second week. Mikhail began his combing efforts once more, this time focusing on the western area. He naturally did not forget to keep up his own training. He did his exercises for a few hours each day. This included his physical and psychic exercises. As far as the physical exercise went he had increased the repetitions to 15 and for his psychic exercises, well, by the end of the second week he had made some progress in his telekinesis. Mikhail managed to move around 30 stones in a 30 meters radius for 20 minutes. He was only missing another 10 minutes before he would up the difficulty of the exercise by changing the stones to piles of sand instead. He would start with a single pile of sand because keeping a pile of loose sand together while doing the exercise is much harder than simply lifting a stone and doing it. As far as his telepathy was concerned, it was getting easier for him to read surface thoughts, at least they did not have to be screamed anymore for him to hear them, but as far as reading memories or any other advanced skill was concerned there were zero advancements. Nothing else of importance happened until the end of the third week, at least nothing that had to be mentioned separately. At the end of the third week, Mikhail finished combing through the western area and he managed to find three new materials during his search. Name, Seeking's Horn. Type, Water. Class, E. Uses, it's the horn of a Seeking, that has been thoroughly soaked in its energy. Contains water type energy and can be used as a supplement to help water type Pokemon. Name, Cedra's Breast Scale. Type, Water. Class, E. Uses, it's the scale of a Cedra, that has been saturated in its energy. Contains water type energy and can be used as a supplement to help water type Pokemon. 
Name, Metapod's Shed Skin. Type, Bug. Class, F. Uses, it's the shed skin of a Metapod, that has been completely steeped in its energy. Contains Bug-type energy and can be used as a supplement to help Bug-type Pokemon, especially useful for the Caterpillar. He found the horn and the scale inside the stream. The horn was still on top of the skull of a Seeking Skeleton when he found it and he had to separate it from there himself because the skull itself was useless. The scale on the other hand was found not far from the skeleton as well. Mikhail was pretty sure that the scale was originally from his father's Cedra. He did not think that there was another Cedra around this place, or if his father's Cedra would accept another Cedra in the area. Unless the wild Cedra was female, then it would be more plausible. Anyway, he assumed that Cedra fought against Seeking and finally killed it, then it probably left its skeleton behind after eating it. As for the scale, Cedra most likely lost that one during the fight against the Seeking. The one that found the Metapod's shell was actually Mothra, not him. The thing had been simply lying under one of the trees. Mikhail believed that one of the wild Metapod had dropped its old skin slash shell after growing too big, forcing it to shed. These three materials were the only new things he found in the western area. At the beginning of the fourth week, Mikhail started combing through the southwestern area and he was currently still combing through the area. The next important event happened during the middle of the fourth week. He officially finished learning how to write the alphabet. His joy, however, was short-lived after his parents told him that he should now start writing words to make sure he knew how to spell slash write them. Tomorrow it would be exactly one month and Mikhail decided to go over the progress of his Magi Carp experiment before turning in for the night. It had been more than six weeks since he started his second experiment and there had been some apparent changes during this last month. First of all let's focus on the main specimen, Magidraco. There was finally a visible change that was induced by the Dragon-type energy. One of her scales in the middle of Magidraco's forehead changed to a greenish-purple color instead of the normal brunt orange, but no other visible changes have been noted yet. Her energetic behavior had not stopped nor had any extra aggression surfaced. Compared to Magidraco the other specimen that was fed with the Dragon-type supplement was not doing good. It was getting more and more aggressive, irritable, and restless. It also seemed to experience a persistent itch. At least he assumed that to be the case because it kept rubbing against the bottom and sides of the pond. The eyes of the specimen became bloodshot but other than that no other negative consequences on its physical health could be observed. Nonetheless, he did not have to stop its participation yet, which was good. The specimen that was fed the grass-type supplement was the only one besides Magidraco that did not have any noticeable negative impact yet. The last two specimens were not so fortunate, they could not continue the experiment any longer without most likely dying as a consequence. The specimen that was fed a fire-type supplement could no longer hang on by the beginning of the third week. Its blood began to boil and it was starting to get cooked alive so Mikhail stopped the experiment, since continuing would have served no purpose besides torturing the poor thing, which was never his aim. The last specimen was the one that was fed the poison-type supplement. Despite him reducing the potency of the supplement as well as using Pecha Berries to counter the poison, the specimen was dying of poisoning and it wasn't the painless version of death either, so Mikhail had no other choice but to stop this part of the experiment as early as the middle of the second week. He could accept discomfort, some pain, and even their death as the price for the sake of advancement but that did not mean he was okay with causing unnecessary pain that served no purpose. It might seem a bit hypocritical, but he truly thought so. Causing pain or death for the sake of the greater good was okay but never for fun or serving any purpose. He was one of the good guys, after all. If the greater good happened to align with his interests even better, right? He would have to either use materials that were capable of helping the specimen absorb the supplement or produce some potions slash serums that fit the desired type, but both scenarios required materials that he currently did not possess. Another alternative was finding specimens that possessed the desired affinity but if that had been easy, then he would already have them. So this method was moot as well. Currently, he was left with three specimens that were still participating in his experiment. Of those three, Magidraco, and the plant-type specimen seemed to have no problems, but Mikhail did not know for how long the other dragon-type specimen could continue. He checked up on the other magi carp inside his pond and he could see that nearly all of them had become sexually mature, which meant that they could soon start to reproduce. He was planning to wait for all of them to reach their maturity before he actively started to help them reproduce, but until then he would not interfere. If some of them decided to create some poke eggs in advance he would be happy, but he wouldn't be disappointed if it did not happen either. What he was actually considering was if he should request his parents to visit Lake Hope again to invite some more magi carp into his space. This way he could gain new blood without having to wait for too long. Chapter 48, CH 25, 48, Little Genius. Just as he had planned to Mikhail had asked his parents if they could go to Lake Hope during the weekend and they had agreed to his request. It was because of this, that a few days later, on Q day, they drove to Lake Hope. During these few days, he had helped the Magi Carp, that had to drop out of his experiment, recover to their normal state. Well, at least he assumed so because all negative symptoms that surfaced during the experiment were gone. Anyway, he was here to increase both his Magi Carp populations. He, obviously, planned to take in all Magi Carp with deep yellow as well as yellow potential but this time he was planning to take in a few light yellow Magi Carp as well. Those that reached light green or better potential would be put inside the pond and the others were for his fish farm inside his marine subspace. 
In case of a lucky event where a good potential Magi carp hatched, it could be transferred to the pond, the others would provide good quality meat. The two Magi carp that had recovered were members of this category. He was planning to only turn those that were above two years old into food, so there was enough time to notice those that stood out because of one thing or another. He noticed that he had digressed once again and focused back on the present situation. He told his parents he was going swimming and entered the lake for his search. I am going to swim, mommy daddy. That was what Arya and Edward heard after their son changed into his swimming trunks before he ran towards the lake. Don't go too far out and don't forget to come back occasionally to drink something. Arya called after her son. They saw how Rivers followed Mikhail and how Star inconspicuously trailed behind them. Mikhail had been told by them that one of their partners was following him, but they made sure that there were always at least two. One that followed him openly and one that followed from a bit further away. The one in the open made sure there were no dangers in Mikhail's immediate surroundings and the other one made sure no dangers approached them from the further outside. He seemed to have accepted being followed by one Pokemon, but they did not tell him about the second one because their little boy seemed to treasure his freedom and as his parents, they did not want him to feel suffocated. After they were sure that both Pokemon were keeping an eye on him, they started talking to each other. There he goes again, leaving on his little adventure without considering how worried I, we, get when he leaves our side to walk around his own. Arya complained to Edward. She did not say this to Mikhail because she did not want him to be sad because of her and because she did not want to curb his enthusiasm. Okay, it was mostly because she did not want to ruin her image as his pretty, gentle, loving, and awesome mommy that she was sure Mikhail had of her. I know, honey, I know. Isn't this why we send our Pokemon after him? To make sure that he is safe. One of them even goes ahead of him and warns the stronger wild Pokemon to keep their distance while he is there. Came Edward's acknowledgement to which Arya answered. I know this, but he keeps doing more dangerous stuff than before. Edward had a helpless look on his face while listening to his wife's rant. He had seen this coming because he had noticed how she had kept bottling up her worry over Mikhail's adventures while smiling at him when Mikhail talked about the things he did. At first, he simply walked around while only occasionally picking up things from the ground. Then he started petting all the Pokemon he could get his hands on. After that, he brought back Pokemon with him and started training them. As if that was not enough, he started to do mock fights with the wild Pokemon around our house to train his Pokemon. No matter how smart he is for his age, he's going too fast. I am afraid that he is going to get hurt because he went out too far or challenged someone too strong because he got overconfident, or something like that. The two had noticed that their son was showing higher intelligence than the average because he was developing faster than described in the books they read about the growth of children. Not only that, a few months before Mikhail's second birthday they noticed that his development speed increased much more than before. Their butterfreeze telling them that they noticed an increase in shinnik energy around Mikhail and two Nato getting interested in their son along with his higher intelligence as well as learning and maturing speed led them to the conclusion that he had talent in shiniks. They were planning to speak to him about this after his fourth birthday. Emerald and Cyan said that his energy was still increasing, so he would need to learn how to control his powers. While psychics were not common there still were quite a few of them and the Pokemon Alliance had schools where budding psychics could be taught how to control their powers. Not just psychics, but there were also other schools where people with different powers were taught, so there was no need to be afraid that Mikhail would be seen as abnormal or anything. The minimum age for enrollment was 5, which was why they had decided to talk about it one year in advance. They were not sure if he had noticed something about his powers but they were sure that he had noticed his higher than normal intelligence. Arya took a deep breath after saying all that, which Edward used to calm her down for a bit. Honey, it's normal that you worry about Mikhail. I get worried about his safety as well, but that's normal because we are his parents. It is our job to worry about our son. I won't tell you to not worry about Mikhail, because quite frankly that's impossible, but what we can do is to make sure that he stays safe and that's exactly what we have already been doing. As long as we make sure that no wild Pokemon that is too strong gets near him, everything else is not a big problem. Getting hurt is normal, everyone gets hurt someday. We only have to make sure it isn't life-threatening. Arya, who had calmed down a bit playfully snapped back at Edward. I know that, dummy. It's just that I get worried anyway. You wouldn't understand. I am his mother, I can't help it. Edward acted as if he was deeply hurt by her words. And what am I, chopped liver? I am his father, am I not? Arya, who completely recovered thanks to Edward's bad acting asked him a question. You have seen one of their mock fights as well, right? I can only say, as expected of my son. He takes right after his mother. Edward shot right back after hearing her claim. Excuse me, you meant he takes right after his father, right? I am after all the higher ranking trainer between us. Arya unwilling to lose countered. Pfft, as if. If I didn't want to spare your feelings I would have surpassed you long ago. I just didn't want you to feel inferior, because I had a higher rank, all right? Like I said, he has his mother's talent. Edward was unwilling to accept defeat. Yeah, right. Keep telling yourself that. Have you seen the strategies and training Mikhail has been using? Those were obviously inspired by the training exercises he observed when I brought him along to my training. Arya directly retorted. No, he was obviously inspired by the training exercises he observed when I brought him along. They started laughing for a bit. No matter how much Mikhail's wanderlust worried them, his excellence made them feel proud and happy. 
Edward decided to compromise first. Okay, he takes after us and was inspired by our training and the stories he listened to. Better. Arya acted as if she reluctantly agreed. Yes, I am sure you somehow contributed as well. Anyway, while watching the mock battles and their training I noticed that his Pokemon are quite talented. Mikhail seems quite lucky, so we can at least say that he got that from you. Edward responded. Ha, 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 how funny. But you are right, I noticed that as well, especially his Caterpie. I am pretty sure that one has at least 4 star potential if not 5 star. If not for the fact that testing the potential is costly and can only be done for Pokemon registered to you, I would have tested it already. Unfortunately, that would mean I would have to register Caterpie under me, which I won't, because I don't want it to later look like I am the reason his Caterpie is strong. He can do it himself in the future, besides a 5 star Caterpie would arouse quite a bit of attention, which we don't want. Arya agreed with Edward. You're right, Mothra is indeed a precious little thing. She's special just like my little boy. Edward continued. Our son is a genius so our job as parents is quite important. We have to make sure he does not get overconfident or cocky, while simultaneously not restricting or smothering him too much, to prevent him from closing off or being unable to flourish. I think we have done a good job so far, so let's continue to keep an eye on him as well as making sure he stays safe while allowing him the little freedom he currently has. As long as he does not go out too far without our permission everything is alright. Until now, at least, he has not done anything too dangerous. Arya nodded at that. You're right. Let's see how it goes, if we see the need we can still interfere later on. Afterward, they simply relaxed and enjoyed their trip. A few hours later Mikhail was done with the lake and decided to stay by the side of his parents. He naturally had no idea of the conversation, his parents had a few hours ago and he was currently going over his gains. I have gotten a good haul. While I did not manage to find any magi carp with light green potential or better, I did help relocate quite a few deep to light yellow potential magi carp. 3 deep yellow, 5 yellow, and 8 light yellow potential magi carp to be exact. I could have taken in more light yellow ones but decided to only invite those that were already mature. This way I don't have to wait for them to mature and they can start reproducing right away. This is, naturally, purely voluntarily on their part, but I don't believe that they won't reproduce on their own. All living beings have the urge to reproduce once they mature, so I see no reason to force them to do something they will do on their own anyway. I have more than enough time, so pressuring them is unnecessary for now. Anyway, all magi carp were, obviously, boosted by my space after their relocation. This resulted in two green, four light green seven deep yellow, and three yellow potential magi carp. I put the 6 green potential magi carp into the pond and the 10 yellow ones landed inside the marine subspace. 2 or 3 more such trips and I should have enough magi carp to guarantee a constant supply of food after 2 years. Satisfied with his gains Mikhail spent the rest of the day relaxing and playing with his parents. After dinner, which consisted of grilled magi carp, they packed up and went back home. Once they were home, his parents told him a few stories of psychics and other energy users. They also watched a movie, after which he had to go to bed. A big thank you to Diabet0s for becoming a patron. A big thank you to Unruh then for becoming a patron. Chapter 49, CH 26, 49, Progress, 2. After their trip to Lake Hope Mikhail just continued with his routines for the next two months. During that time he kept training his Pokemon as thoroughly as possible, focusing on all their parameters and the mastery of their moves. He also kept up his own training as well as tracking the progress of his Magi Carp experiment. He obviously kept combing through the area around their property as well and he decided to do two more ball crafting sessions. During the first week, the only noteworthy events were Caterpie improving Bug Bite to Beginner Mastery, Mothra raising Tackle to Beginner Grade, and Nata boosting Teleportation to Novice Grade. The second week was more eventful compared to the first. Let's start with his Pokemon. Caterpie focused on Tackle during this week and raised it to Beginner Mastery. He decided to let Mothra focus on Confusion for now and she managed to reach Novice Grade with the move during this week. Nato on the other hand was tasked with improving Teleport because that was always going to be one of his main moves. While he did not increase his Mastery he was not far from it. Next up was his own training, specifically his telekinesis. By the end of the second week, Mikhail had managed to levitate 30 stones in a 30 meter radius for 30 minutes. After that, he decided to start the next exercise, which was levitating 1 kilogram heavy piles of sand instead of 1 kilogram stones. Compared to levitating stones, levitating sand took way more focus. He had to concentrate on keeping the pile together or he risked losing control of a part, which would then fall to the ground. Mikhail began the new exercise with one pile of sand. Aside from this, there was also his Magi Carp experiment. Mikhail was forced to stop the experiment for the Dragon Supplement side tester. Its aggression and irritability went through the roof and its health kept deteriorating. If he kept up the experiment the specimen would either suffer a psychotic breakdown or die because of its worsening physical state. The other two specimens were stable for now. The last event of the second week was him completely combing through the southwestern area. He managed to find three new materials during the process, which was a good harvest. Name, Useful Mud. Type, Ground. Class, F uses, its mud, which consists of thickened ground-type energy that has absorbed a bit of water-type energy from its surroundings. Contains ground-type energy and can be used as a supplement to help ground-type Pokemon. 
It can also slightly increase their resistance to water. Name, floating dandelion. Type, air slash plant. Class, F. Uses, it's a dandelion, that has absorbed energy from the atmosphere. Contains air type energy and can be used as a supplement to help flying type Pokemon. Name, ancient tree core. Type, ghost. Class, D. Uses, it's the core of a fallen tree, that has been absorbing the spectral slash nether energy in its surroundings for over 400 years. If left alone the tree could have become a phantom. Contains ghost type energy and can be used as a supplement to help ghost type Pokemon, especially useful for the phantom line. When he found the fallen tree he sensed a disturbance in the force, Ahem sensed a gloomy atmosphere around the tree so he decided to check it out. After reading that it could turn into a phantom in the future Mikhail debated if he should leave it alone so that he could catch it later but ultimately decided to harvest the core because he was not sure how long the formation slash transition to phantom would take. The tree was ancient, so it could take another 100 years or so for all he knew. What was also interesting to him, was that the tree had not decomposed even after 400 years and, obviously, that it had the potential to transform into a phantom even without the soul of a human slash Pokemon being available. He was happy that there were phantom that were not the transformed soul of a dead slash murdered child. This confirmed or at least showed to him that there were naturally formed ghost type Pokemon as well and that not every ghost was the result of a sapient being dying and turning into a ghost for one reason or another. Anyway, moving on. On the third day of the third week, Caterpie advanced to, mid, iron stage and he kept training his electro -abe, which was harder to train than his other moves. On the other hand, Nata managed to achieve beginner mastery for teleport, and once he had done that they decide to bring his leer up to beginner mastery and stored power up to proficient first before focusing on teleport once more. As far as his own training was concerned, he managed to increase the number of sand piles to two. Mikhail also tried another round of ball crafting during this week, because he wanted to test if his drawing and writing exercises with the different brushes had helped. While he failed once more, he noted that the process felt a bit easier. During the fourth week, a few important things happened as well. Mothra improved confusion to beginner mastery and Natu did the same for Lear. Mikhail himself managed to raise the number of piles to three. He decided to start changing their forms while levitating them, to increase the difficulty of the exercise. The form change for all sand piles was the same because simultaneously changing the three piles to different forms was much harder. He decided to reserve that exercise for the future. Mikhail also finished combing through the southern area during the fourth week but unfortunately, he did not find any new materials. On the other hand, his Magi Carp experiment showed some progress during the fourth week. Majidraco gained her second dragon scale at the beginning of the week and this time the scale that changed its color was located on her back. Other than that she showed no other obvious changes that could be observed. His plant specimen was stable at the beginning as well, but a few days before the end of the week that changed. The plant type energy inside the specimen seemed to have reached a critical amount because a major reaction in the form of a high fever suddenly happened. He assumed that it was either a rejection or adaptation phenomenon that triggered after a large amount of grass type energy had accumulated. He believed that the reason for this was that grass energy was much milder than the other energy types he used for his experiment, so until a certain volume was reached the Pokemon showed no adverse effects because the Pokemon could tolerate it. Mikhail was certain that if he had allowed the specimen to fully digest the grass-type energy instead of steadily introducing more, then nothing would have happened to his specimen. He fed his specimen a mix of Oron, Lepa, Rost, and Lomberries to help her against the fever she had and to keep her body from collapsing. It took three days for the fever to start to lessen and to his surprise, the potential of the specimen increased from deep yellow to light green at the end of the three days. Another day later his specimen became stable and he decided to continue feeding her the grass-type supplement. He noted that the specimen was more enthusiastic towards the supplement than before. During the fifth week, not much happened except for Caterpie finally improving Electrowave to beginner mastery, which meant that all his moves reached beginner mastery. Mikhail decided to have Caterpie focus solely on string shot from here on out at least until he reached the proficient grade in it. He did think that this would take quite some time because Caterpie was much slower than Mothra as far as training moves was concerned and even she took a bit to do so. Aside from Caterpie, Natu improved his stored power to proficient mastery as well, so he decided to focus on teleport once more. Besides these two events, nothing else happened during the fifth week. Compared to the fifth week, the sixth week was more eventful. At the beginning of the sixth week his plant specimen, from now on dubbed Magi Flora, gained its first different colored scale. The scale was lime green and unlike Magidraco whose scale appeared on her forehead, this one appeared in the center of Magiflora's chest. Three days later Magidraco gained her third dragon scale near her second one and her potential finally increased to light green as well. Another thing that happened was that Mothra managed to reach proficient mastery with her confusion. He was not bragging but Mikhail was sure that she was better with the move than some Butterfree were, which just showed how awesome she was. They decide that Mothra would pause training confusion and train up her Bug Bite and Electro Abe instead. Aside from these two events Mikhail also started another round of ball crafting. Well, the result was still the same, which meant he failed. But, he did at least manage to produce a common ball this time. It just turned out to be an F-class common ball, so it was categorized as a failure. Name, common ball. Type, none. Class, F. Faults, upper half, interior. 
The first part of the third line is too thick by 1 mm. The portrayal of Regigigas has to be positioned 1 mm to the left. 19 more mistakes. Uses, common balls can be used to catch wild Pokemon. The common ball has the same probability of catching any Pokemon as the standard poke ball, but if it is used against normal types the probability doubles. This common ball can be considered a failure because it will be unable to catch any Pokemon, except maybe for some newborn Pokemons. When he saw the status of the common ball Mikhail was simultaneously happy and unhappy. Ouch, the burn. The ball does not even work on all newborns. No wonder it is considered a failure and not only that, but the number of mistakes is much higher than I had thought. I made 21 mistakes during the crafting process and here I thought I did a decent job. The only positive thing is that I can finally see what I did wrong. Before this, I couldn't see the status of failures, probably because they were not even considered finished products, but with this one, I can. Now I can finally learn from my mistakes because until now the only thing I could do was try to be more precise, steady, and careful. This is the difference between having a teacher and having none. A teacher can point out your mistakes and tell you what to do better. Now that I can see the faults of my product, I can do the same, which means my ball crafting will finally start to improve for real. He wanted to see if his space could upgrade his ball, but then he remembered that he was already inside his space and that there had been no indication that it would improve it. Nonetheless, he went out of his space with the ball and put it inside his space again but nothing happened. Two days into the seventh week Mikhail managed to levitate four piles of sand and not only that but he also expanded his range from 30 to 40 meters. The next day he finished combing through the southeastern area. He, thankfully, managed to find two new materials during the process. Name, Wayperberry. Type, Plant. Class, F. Uses, contains nutrition and plant energy. Can be eaten as food and causes the consumer to relax greatly, which may cause drowsiness. Name, pink apricorn. Type, plant. Class, F. Uses, contains nutrition and a mix of energies. Can be eaten as food and helps slightly with physical training. Can be used to produce various poke balls. The berry was an okay find but he was happy over every new apricorn he found. He started combing through the eastern area the day after. Mothra managed to improve her bug bite to proficient by the end of the seventh week. Mikhail had to admit that it was something else to see a cute little thing like Mothra rip out parts out of boulders by using her bug bite. That more than anything proved to him once more how tenacious Pokemon were because he was sure even, low, iron stage Pokemon could resist this move one or two times while only gaining bruises before it started getting injured. During the eighth week, on Arc Day during their call, Rose told Mikhail that her Vulpix egg had moved once the day before. Other than that, Nata managed to improve his teleport to proficient mastery and Mothra did the same for Electroabe. Besides that, he finished combing through the eastern area but he, unfortunately, did not manage to find anything new and after this, only the northeastern area was left for him to comb through. The last few days of the two months were part of the ninth week. During these four days, quite a few things happened, when compared to the calmer eighth week. During this time Magidraco gained her fourth dragon scale, while Magiflora gained her second scale. Mikhail noted that the process of gaining scales took quite a bit longer for Magiflora than for Magidraco. He naturally attributed this to their affinities. He knew that Magidraco had a natural dragon-type affinity and even if Magiflora gained a grass-type affinity after her fever, which he still could not control, her new affinity could not compare to Magidraco's natural one. At least not yet. Besides this, his Caterpie improved his String Shot's mastery to proficient and Mothra tried to use her Bug Bite and Electroave as references to learn Thunder Fang. Despite being the one to propose the idea he was surprised when she actually managed to form an initial Thunder Fang. As expected of Mothra, she did not disappoint and even though neither Mothra nor Natu advanced to the, high, iron stage during these two months, Mikhail was sure that they were not far too from advancing either way. Chapter 50, CH 27, 50, Rescue Operation. Two days later while Mikhail was combing through the northeastern area he stumbled upon a death battle. It was a scene he had witnessed quite a few times during his explorations which he would have ignored normally because it was part of the cycle of life and he had already accepted that. Like he said that would have been what he normally did, but this time the participants of the death fight aroused his curiosity. Four Akans were attacking four Nidoran and the Nidoran were on the losing side. The reason for this was simple, two of the four Nidoran were relatively small and seemed quite young. The behavior of the bigger Nidoran led him to the assumption that the bigger pair was the smaller pair's parents or siblings because they kept protecting them even at the cost of harm to themselves. If the bigger pair did not have to protect the smaller one, they would have probably won that fight even 2 vs 4. Now the real reason this fight attracted his attention was that this was the first time he had seen wild Nidoran in the area surrounding their property, so he assumed that they had recently migrated over here. He really wanted to have some Nidoran, and had been disappointed when he found no Nidoran colonies in the area around their house, but here they were practically delivered into his hands. They were in a life or death situation, so if he saved them he believed that he would be able to persuade them to join his space voluntarily. Allowing themselves to be abducted by him is the least they could do after he saved their lives. Well, actually he would have to check their potential first to see if he even wanted to take them in. It would be a bit stupid if after he saved them it turned out that they had bad potential because he would not accept them in that case. Species, Nidoran. Gender, Male. Type, Poison. Potential, Light Yellow. Stage, Iron Stage, High, Dash. 
Species, Nidoran. Gender, Female. Type, Poison. Potential, Yellow. Stage, Iron Stage. High, Dash. Species, Nidoran. Gender, Female. Type, Poison. Potential, Light Green. Stage, Stageless. Genetic Variation, None. Abilities, Poison Point. Rivalry. Talents, Keen Hearing. Affinities, Poison. Dash. Species, Nidoran. Gender, Male. Type, Poison. Potential, Light Green. Stage, Stageless. Genetic Variation, None. Abilities, Poison Point. Rivalry. Talents, Keen Hearing. Affinities, Poison. When he saw the status of the smaller pair of Nidoran Mikhail came to an immediate decision. I am going to invite those two into my space no matter the cost. Not only do the two of them have light green potential but they also possess a talent and it's even the same one. They are probably twins, guess the mother laid two eggs instead of one. I did not know that was possible. As they say, we keep learning something new every day. Anyway, I believe I have enough candy to lure them into my van. Heck, forget the chibi Nidoran pair I think I have enough candy to lure in the bigger pair, not that I really want them. Their potential is suboptimal but I am willing to reluctantly take them in as well because I don't want to separate the chibi pair from their parents slash siblings. Now, let's see what we are dealing with. Mikhail proceeded to scan the attacking Akans. Hmm, all four are at the, mid, iron stage. If I send over Mothra and Natu to engage two of them, then the big Nidoran should have no problem dealing with the other two Akans. Once he made his decision Mikhail faced Mothra who was sitting on his left shoulder, before quietly addressing her and Natu who was currently sitting on his head. Sometimes he felt like he was being treated as a resting place by his Pokemon. Mothra, Natu I have a job for you too. I want each one of you to pick one of the fighting Akans, preferably one that is not engaging a Nidoran at that moment, and fight against them. Both of you should be more than strong enough to beat them. He saw Mothra nodding and felt Nata moving on his head, so he assumed that Nata was nodding as well. Seeing or in Nata's case feeling them agreeing he continued his explanation. I want you to do the following. I want Mothra to quietly approach the fight and get in position. Once she has reached a good position, I want her to aim at the head of one of the Akans and perform a surprise attack on it. The goal is to use String Shot to wrap up the Akans head. It would be better if you used a sticky string shot so that the victim also gets stuck to the ground unable to flee or thrash around. Once you have done that and see that your surprise attack hit, I want you to use Electrowave to give it a shock and to make sure it can't move. After that I want you to hit your immobilized fur with confusion until it goes limp slash is knocked out. Nata what you're going to do is wait until Mothra gets in position. As soon as you see her making a move, I want you to teleport above the head of one of the other Akans and use stored power aiming at its head. While it is distracted by stored power I want you to land on its neck and repeatedly attack its head with peck until it's knocked out. You can try to help each other if the other one is not done by the time you are finished, and it looks like he slash she could use some help, but this only applies to the two of you. You are not allowed to meddle in the fight of the bigger Nidoran. Protecting the chibi Nidoran in case of sudden danger on the other hand is allowed. Is everything clear? Both expressed their understanding after hearing his question. Great. Then let us start. It looks like the Nidoran are about to get overwhelmed by the Akans. Mikhail saw Mothra going down his body and stealthily approaching the fight. She made use of the tall grass to hide her approach and thanks to her green skin that made her harder to spot and the fact that her targets were distracted she managed to reach a suitable spot without being detected. He felt Nata standing up as soon as Mothra reached her spot. He was focusing intently on her, ready to make his move as soon as she did hers and she did not make them wait for long. After observing the situation from her position for a bit, Mothra chose her victim and waited for a chance. She got her chance a few seconds later when her target moved its head away from her direction to look at something. Mothra immediately fired the sticky string shot she had prepared while waiting. The moment the string shot started flying toward its target, Nata teleported above the other Akans that was currently not engaging a Nidoran. After Mothra's target got hit by her move, Nata's target got briefly distracted by the noise the victim made. Nata used that moment to perform a stored power aiming at its head. The attack hit, damaging the Akans slightly but more importantly distracted it some more allowing Nata to land on its neck unnoticed, even if he nearly missed the neck, due to Akans shaking its head. Nata immediately started executing Peck aiming at Akans head. While Nata succeeded in his ambush and was delivering strikes, Mothra followed her part of the plan as well. After she successfully hit her target with her sticky string she directly performed an electroabe. Seeing her victim now fully immobilized and getting shocked for a bit, she started using confusion repeatedly attacking her Akan's head with the move. She only stopped her attacks after her foe slumped but only after delivering a final blow to make sure it was not pretending to be knocked out. Satisfied she saw Nata's target collapsing a few moments after hers, meaning she finished first. When Nata looked over to her to see if she was done as well, she gave him a smug look, before looking at the fight that was still going on. Mikhail saw how his Pokemon perfectly executed their plan, successfully knocking out their targets. Thanks to the surprise attack it took them less than 10 seconds to knock out their foes, which was pretty fast. The two other Akans and the Nidoran naturally noticed the newcomers as well. When they saw their comrades getting trashed the two Akans started to attack the Nidoran much more aggressively because they could neither flee nor aid their comrades without beating slash killing their foes, or they risked getting attacked from the back. There was also the fact that they would be outnumbered if their partners got beaten before they got rid of their opponents. 
Unfortunately, for them what they had feared happened and their partners got beaten. The Akans expected the worst but noticed that the newcomers seemed to have no intention to join the ongoing battle. The pair of Nidoran also noticed that the newcomers did not plan to join their fight, but they were more than okay with that. They were sure that they could beat the two Akans without much difficulty now that they did not have to guard against the other two Akans. They naturally still kept an eye on the newcomers to make sure that their kits would not get attacked while they were fighting, but up until the end, the newcomers only kept observing. After the Nidoran killed their foes, they checked up their kits to make sure they were unharmed. Mikhail saw how the pair of Nidoran killed the Akans by breaking their neck with what looked like a double kick before they went over to their kits. He saw how they looked over to his Pokemon once they confirmed that their kits were unharmed. Apparently, they decided to approach his Pokemon because they started walking towards Mothra. Mikhail and his Pokemon tensed for a moment in case the Nidoran decided to be ungrateful and attack them after they saved them. Nada teleported to Mothra's side and waited with her for them to approach them but it seemed like they were not planning to attack because the Nidoran stopped a short distance away from Mothra. It looked like they started a conversation with Mothra but he had no idea what they were talking about because he could hear nearly nothing. At one time the Nidoran looked over to him and he waved at them. They nodded at him before they resumed their conversation. After whatever they talked about, his Pokemon stepped aside from the beaten Akans and the Nidoran approached the beaten Pokemon. They broke the neck of that one as well and repeated that for the Akans that Nato had beaten. Whoa, ice cold. No mercy at all. That was his thought when he saw them breaking the necks of the beaten Akans. Seemingly satisfied they talked to his Pokemon once again and Nato teleported to his side. Nato addressed him and told him that the Nidoran were calling him over to talk. With Nato as the intermediary, because his telepathy was not advanced enough to hold real conversations, they talked. They asked him why he helped them and what he wanted from them for his help. Mikhail answered their question honestly, telling them that he noticed that their kits had good potential and that he wanted them to be his Pokemon. When they tensed at that, he told them that he wouldn't force them and that his invitation was open to all of them because he did not want to separate them. His honesty and the fact that he did not want to separate them seemed to have earned him some plus points because they relaxed a bit again. They talked about where they would stay if they agreed and what they would eat. He told them he had a place they could stay and that he had enough food to feed hundreds of Nidoran if he wanted to so far were no problem for him. The Nidoran eyed him as if saying are you crazy and he told them that his Pokemon could confirm his claim. Once he said that the Pokemon started conversing with each other for a bit and he could see Mothra animatedly saying things while Nato was calm. A few minutes later they focused back on him and informed him that his Pokemon had persuaded them. They were willing to join him and he was really happy with their decision. The Nidoran informed him that they were a tad unwilling to leave behind the Akans corpses but Mikhail told them that he would compensate them with berries instead and that he had poison type materials that they could eat instead. After hearing his promise they happily agreed to leave the corpses behind. Phew. Thank you I won't have to come up with a way to cordially persuade them into joining. Now how to get them inside my space without my bodyguards seeing them suddenly disappear. I am sure they are currently focusing over here so I can't do it right now. How troublesome. He decided to tell them to wait by the tree on their right for about 15 minutes. The vegetation around that area was a bit denser, so they would be harder to notice. He would leave them a few berries to eat while they waited for him. He planned to walk a bit ahead for about 5 minutes before walking the same way back home. On the way back after passing them he planned to take them inside his space. Since his radius had reached 40 meters he could do this easier than he would have before. Mikhail explained his plan to everyone and they agreed, so he started walking away. Hopefully, they will still be here when I come back. If they flee instead of waiting for me there is nothing I can temporarily do, but if that happens I will have to track them down, and then there will be no more Mr. Nice Guy. However, I am sure that won't be necessary. During the walk, he congratulated his Pokemon for the victory in their first real fight. You two have done a great job and I am proud of you. That was a real fight, but you still managed to shut down your opponents without any problems. You also stuck to the plan, so I am really happy. Both of you were really great and I am really, really proud of you. His Pokemon happily accepted his praise and they kept walking while they chatted with each other. Mikhail started to walk back after a short while into his joy, he saw that the Nidoran were still waiting for him when he walked by the spot they were supposed to wait at. He walked by without showing a reaction and when he was more than 20 meters away he pulled them into his space. After he had done so he sighed in relief and became really happy. He started humming a happy melody while walking home and his Pokemon quietly listened to him hum. Big thanks for tuning into today's audiobook. Special shout out to our Patreon member whose request brought this novel to life. If you're interested in making your own personalized requests, consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll find the link to my Patreon account in the video description. Your support truly makes a difference, and I appreciate you being here for this audiobook adventure. Until next time, happy reading.